preface to the second edition, when Mormon Enigma, Emma Hale Smith appeared in the fall of 1984, research and publication flourished about the historical events contributing to the growth of the two major churches born of the early Mormon movement. For the first time in the 150 years since its founding in 1830 many factors essential to the successful historical interpretation of Mormonism converged. Of those, several assumed critical importance. First, a sufficient number of scholars interested in both the Western Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as, LDS, and the Midwestern Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as, RLDS, created a climate conducive to objective, carefully researched publications. Through the professionalism of the Mormon History Association, historians successfully breached the barriers of bitter calumny that had formerly divided these two churches. The cordial association and the mutual respect of previously suspicious scholars brought new cooperation to their combined search for the historical past. Second, previously untapped sources in public and private collections contributed new data to the general body of research materials, thus providing more complete interpretive manuscript sources. Archival holdings became more accessible to researchers who in turn shared information about documents in unusual locations. Some private papers found their way into public archives and public perusal, enriching the general body of knowledge. Third, publishers and editors realized the potential for the successful marketing of Mormon history to a public eager to read it. Major journals accepted articles about the Mormon historical past, and several new journals appeared whose publication policy addressed Mormon history. Perhaps the establishment of the David Woolley Evans and Beatrice Cannon Evans Award for Excellence in Western Biography, defined at its founding in 1983 as circumscribing Mormon country, signaled the maturity of the Mormon history field. The scholars, the research collections, the publishers, and public acceptance of objective, non-polemical histories combined to provide a healthy climate for Mormon history scholars. Mormon Enigma Emma Hale Smith appeared during this Camelot period of Mormon historical writing. It met with favorable reviews in major newspapers and journals across the United States. They praised its interpretation of Emma Smith's life and noted its careful documentation. The Chronicle of Higher Education listed it for university president's summer reading, and the Books for the Blind program selected it to be recorded. Six months after its first publication, the book won the Evans Award for Western Biography in the spring of 1985, followed by Best Book Awards from both the Mormon History Association and the John Whitmer Historical Association. The biography reached a wide readership. Six printings ran sales of the first edition to 30. 1,000 copies by 1992, when work on this second edition began. Since publication of Mormon Enigma, many new works have fleshed out the founding period of the Mormon movement. These include biographies of Emma Smith's associates, analytical narrative histories, essays, and articles. A number of these publications acknowledge Emma Smith's historical influence and cite Mormon Enigma as being helpful in interpretation and content. But the book offended the leadership of the LDS Church in Utah. In June 1985, a month after it received the Evans Award, newspaper headlines of the Los Angeles Times announced, Mormons forbid female biographers of Smith's wife to address church. We were prohibited from speaking about any aspect of religious or church history in any LDS church-related meeting or institution. Church leaders took this action without reading the book in its entirety or informing us of their decision, and it remained in effect over ten months. In the wake of the national publicity caused by the ban, the sales of the book tripled, but the church's speaking ban was detrimental to all concerned, it took its toll on us, our families and on the public perception of the church itself. After a ten-month stalemate, Linda Newell successfully petitioned church leaders to reconsider the prohibition. On April 24, 1986, she was informed that the restrictions the church had placed on us were no longer in effect. A little over a week later, the Mormon History Association named Val Avery its president-elect. While the story of the lifting of the ban appeared in newspapers throughout the United States through both the Associated Press and the United Press International Wire Services, it never appeared in the church-owned Deseret News. This omission gave the unmistakable message to faithful church members that both the book and its authors were still suspect. While LDS church leaders criticized our interpretation of Joseph Smith as being a non-traditional view, 
a marked increase in accounts of Emma Smith began to appear in church instructional materials and other church publications. Emma Smith has finally become a three-dimensional historical figure. Our depiction of Joseph Smith, Jr was an issue for some readers of the book. Accustomed to viewing Joseph Smith as the heroic figure in early Mormonism, these readers found difficulty with his being secondary in a biography of his wife. This habit of viewing Joseph as the primary figure left even some seasoned professionals puzzled. Why did you treat Joseph so marginally in your book? Asked a colleague himself a member of the LDS Church and active in writing Mormon history. Because the book is Emma's biography, not Joseph's. He was silent a few moments, then commented that he would have to recall his review of the book from an editor and rewrite it. The published review was balanced and excellent, but the incident highlighted a common perspective of many Mormon readers. The personality of Joseph Smith and the legendary descriptions of his life overshadow his associates, and especially his wife. Many accounts of Joseph's activities were peripheral to Emma and were not included in the manuscript. In a conscious decision to focus on her experiences, because we, too, shared an abiding interest in the activities of the Mormon prophet, we were sometimes tempted to allow Joseph's story to eclipse Emma's. That we did not succumb irritated some who wanted Joseph to have equal emphasis in his wife's biography. For succinct and varied interpretations of Joseph Smith's life we refer the reader to the many biographies of him presently available, particularly Donna Hill's Joseph Smith, the first Mormon. When we were preparing the original manuscript for publication, the editors asked us to reduce the 1,000-page manuscript by one-third. A note to that effect and a list of archives holding the longer manuscript appear on page 311. We accomplished this reduction through careful editing and tightening of sentence structure. Occasionally we eliminated an already well-known account that might have added information about the larger context of Emma Smith's times but that had no direct bearing on the particular events of her life. For example, Surely the 19th century movement of American women into the public arena of societal reform affected Emma, but the constraints of length precluded a chapter on that larger post-Civil War era. Soon after Mormon Enigma appeared, a tragedy began to unfold in the larger community of Mormon scholarship, with increasing regularity documents of unusual importance to Mormon history surfaced through the efforts of Salt Lake City document D. Lamarck Hoffman. Historians and buffs eagerly traded information contained in the most recent document in a sincere attempt to include current scholarship in their work. Then, in October 1985, Three bomb blasts and two murders brought the document resurgence to an abrupt and tragic end. Mark Hoffman, professing to be a buyer and seller of old manuscripts, had been forging documents and selling them to private collectors and to the LDS Church. Fearing exposure and seeking to deflect a tightening trail of irregular financial transactions, Hoffman set two homemade bombs that killed businessman Stephen F. Christensen and housewife Kathleen W. Sheets. A third bomb exploded prematurely nearly ending Hoffman's own life. While Hoffman subsequently pled guilty to murder and was sentenced to life in prison in early 1987, his incarceration did little to repair the damage to morale and professionalism in the Mormon scholarly community. His forgeries were so well done that seasoned document dealers authenticated them through paper and ink samples, and an accurate and complete list of all the forged documents will probably never be available. Also. His historical acumen was so exacting that most of his forgeries merely provided the smoking gun for conclusions to which authentic sources led us and many others. To further complicate the problem, Hoffman traded forgeries for genuine documents and then further traded or sold those legitimate records. Thus, every document that passed through Mark Hoffman's hands was not a forgery, but every document connected with him remains suspect. The LDS Church hierarchy reacted to the Hoffman episode by removing from circulation scores, perhaps hundreds, of manuscript collections they believed might further embarrass the church in some way. Many scholars who had worked for years on major projects were, and still are, denied access to their sources. If we were writing Mormon Enigma today, we would not have access to many of the documents that were so valuable in our portrayal of Emma, including the Joseph Smith, Jr., collection the Brigham Young Collection, the Norvu Relief Society Minutes, and many, many others. Fortunately for us, 
Most of the Hoffman tainted documents either had no bearing on our work because his interests lay in places other than Emma Smith's life or because they came to light after Mormon Enigma had gone to press. Several exceptions, however, warrant mention here. One is the forgery Hoffman titled A Blessing Given to Joseph Smith, third, by his father, Joseph Smith, Jr. On January 17, 1844, usually referred to as the Joseph Smith III Blessing. The existing historical evidence that such a blessing took place is so persuasive that Hoffman had only to put his imagination to work on the wording. His date of the 17th of January 1844 was also fiction. Emma placed it in the spring of 1844 note 19, page 341. We removed all references to this Hoffman document from the text and the notes of this edition. We then rearranged the events of chapter 12, with some minor changes and additional information to place the historical evidence for such a blessing in its chronological context. The second Hoffman document with particular impact on our interpretation of events in Emma's life appeared in Chapter 13. It was a forged letter purportedly from Joseph Smith to Maria and Sarah Lawrence dated 23 June 1844. We deleted all references to the forged letter in the text and notes, modified the narrative in Chapter 13 accordingly and added some new material about Joseph's last evening at home. In the years since this book was first published, we have been alert for newly found documents or any we might have missed in our initial research. Where possible we have made small additions to the narrative to include these. A few others are important enough to discuss here. When Emma's adopted daughter, Julia Murdoch Smith Dixon Middleton, was 27, she received a letter from one of her brothers, John Riggs Murdoch written in June 1858 from Florence, Nebraska. He was a teamster whom Brigham Young sent east each year to help new immigrant companies traverse the plains and mountains to Salt Lake City. Julia was ill at the time and did not answer the letter for five months. She dated her reply near Norvoo, November 2, 1858, and sent it to her brother. John Riggs Murdoch gave the letter to their father, John Murdoch who then wrote to his daughter and copied both Julia's letter and his response into his own journal. These entries add several poignant insights into Julia's sometimes tragic life and her relationship with Emma. After John Murdoch's wife Julia died giving birth to twins, Julia and Joseph, the Smiths took the infants to raise in Kirtland in 1831. Emma extracted a promise from John Murdoch that he would not tell them he was their biological father. She wanted to bring the children up as her own and never have them know anything to the contrary that they might be perfectly happy with her as a mother, he explained to Julia in his 1858 letter. This was a good thought yet selfish and I was sensible it could not always remain so. I have always held my peace upon the subject knowing there was no freedom of access between me or my family and you and Br. Joseph's family upon the subject, and I resolved to wait till time and providence should divulge the matter. Others were not so careful. When Julia was only five years old, a Mrs. Walker told her she was not a smith, and she done it through spite, Julia believed. From that hour I was changed, the letter continued revealing the sting she experienced from other children's taunts that she was adopted and from insinuations of adults who claimed that her birth mother had been Joseph's consort and that Emma had taken Julia and her twin brother to prevent a scandal. She revealed her own struggle with feelings of abandonment and separation from her heritage and, in turn, expressed her love and devotion to Emma. I was bitter even as a child. Why was it that I could not have been raised with my own blood and kin and not with strangers and bear a name I had not claimed to? I shunned you and my own further and why? Because I had dread of being taken from those I was raised with and loved with the same love that should have been yours. Julia pondered how her birth mother might view the situation. If she has seen the way her family have been divided and estranged she must feel unhappy I think. In his response, Murdoch invited her to join him in Utah, explaining, The only way I know for us to be properly acquainted and united in all things, having one faith, one baptism, one God and Father and so be prepared to dwell together in the celestial kingdom of God, will be for you to come here that we may all be taught together in the principles of salvation and attend to the ordinances of the house of God that we may be one in every deed. Beyond these two letters, no other correspondence is available between Julia and the Murdochs. With her adopted Smith family, she had already rejected what they called Brigham Young's brand of Mormonism. And moving even further from what her biological father proposed, 
Julia had embraced the faith of her husband by joining the Catholic Church. She never went to Utah and most likely never told Emma about this brief interlude with her estranged family. An interesting footnote can be added to Emma's struggle with plural marriage. In Chapter 4 we are given the background for a section of both the LDS and RLDS Church's doctrine and governance that first appeared in the 1835 edition. It said in part, We declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband, except in case of death, when neither is at liberty to marry again. The passage remained in subsequent editions, and is still in the RLDS volume, until 1874, when LDS church officials removed it and added what is now known as section 132. This revelation on celestial, or plural, marriage is discussed in detail in chapter 10. On July 7, 1878, Four years after the publication of section 132 and ten months before Emma's death, Mormon Apostle Joseph F. Smith delivered an unusual sermon in Salt Lake City in which he suggested that the revelation concerning polygamy should not have been published, at least not in its present form. When the revelation was written, in 1843, it was for a special purpose, by the request of the patriarch Hiram Smith and was not designed to go forth to the church or to the world. It is most probable that had it been then written with a view to its going out as a doctrine of the church, it would have been presented in a somewhat different form. Referring then to the last fifteen verses that both command and chastise Emma, he continued, There are personalities contained in a part of it which are not relevant to the principle itself but rather to the circumstances which necessitated it being written at the time. George D. Watt, Education, Journal of Discourses, 20, 29. The 1874 publication of section 132 came at a time when Emma's sons were traveling to Utah on missions for the RLDS Church and therefore should be viewed in the context of other statements of that period that were calculated to defame Emma and thereby undermine her son's effectiveness. We discussed these issues in Chapter 21. On another topic, we now know that Louis Biderman threatened to leave Emma. The incident took place in the heat of an argument between Biderman and Emma's adult son, Joseph Smith III. Joseph clearly understood that late Victorian attitudes about the double standard of sexuality and women's fear would have deemed divorce a castigation of Emma rather than of Louis Biderman. He told his stepfather he was absolutely against such a step and reminded him of an earlier incident where the honor of his mother and the good of the family had been concerned. The reference was to Biderman's affair with a local widow which resulted in an illegitimate son. Years later when Joseph wrote about the episode in his memoirs he concluded, I still believe that what I did was for the best, for its final result was that the difficulty between my mother and her husband was adjusted, even though it had some rather ill effects upon us boys. He did not elaborate on what those difficulties might have been, but when Emma took Louis's illegitimate son to raise, the gossip about town surely affected her children. A number of other minor errors inevitably occurred in the initial printing of Mormon Enigma. Thanks to the keen eyes of some of our readers, and their willingness to point these out to us, they have also been corrected in the text. Throughout our association with Mormon history, we have benefited from the friendship, assistance, and good offices of many people whose support has proven invaluable. For this second edition we add Associate Director Elizabeth G. Delaney's name to all the rest, for her specific help with this publication and for her far-sighted conviction years ago that steered the University of Illinois Press into an extensive publication program in Mormon history. Our work on the Emma Smith biography moved each of us into professional arenas unimagined before that research and writing experience. Val Avery is a member of the Department of History at Northern Arizona University and maintains her research and writing efforts. Linda Newell is an independent writer, editor, and researcher whose work centers in biography and family and community history. Both continue to publish historical articles and essays, and each has other books in progress. Over the ensuing years our children have grown and our families changed. The Avery's marriage did not survive, the Newells did. But it was our friendship with a remarkable 19th century woman named Emma Hale Smith that profoundly changed both our lives, for the better. Introduction Many women who have become influential in religious and women's history have been known initially because of their association with prominent men. Emma Hale Smith Biderman 1804-1879 is a case in point. Although she was not the leader of a religious movement herself, she was closely associated with three controversial men who were. She was the wife of Joseph Smith, 
who is claimed as founder by both the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints LDS or Mormon, headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah, and by the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or LDS, headquartered in Independence, Missouri. She was a one-time friend and long-time antagonist of Brigham Young who led the Mormons on their trek west from Illinois in 1846 and guided their colonization of the Great Basin. And she was the mother of Joseph Smith III, leader of the reorganization that brought together church members scattered in the Midwest. Emma's descendants have led that church from 1860 to the present. Yet Emma Smith was far more than an appendage and helpmeet to prominent men. She was also a capable, articulate, and influential individual in her own right who profoundly affected the development of the religious movements with which she was associated. From her initial elopement with the young would-be prophet Joseph Smith in 1827, through 17 years of marriage and repeated moves through five states, she became a force to be reckoned with, especially in financial and other practical matters affecting the Mormon church. Deeply in love with her husband. She quietly but vigorously opposed the polygamous beliefs and practices which he sought to introduce into Mormon practice in Illinois in the early 1840 following her husband's assassination in 1844 and the migration westward of the main body of Mormons under Brigham Young in 1846, Emma remained behind in the nearly deserted town of Norvoo. Illinois. There she continued to live 32 more years as the wife of Louis C. Biderman, who never embraced Mormon doctrines. When a group of individuals dissatisfied with Brigham Young, and polygamy founded a church which Emma's son Joseph Smith III would lead after 1860, she gained a new status. Because of the complexity of Emma's role in the Mormon movement, few dispassionate accounts of her life have appeared. On the one hand, members of the reorganized church have chiseled a careful image of her perpetually patient, always valiant, silently stoic, the mother of the reorganization. On the other hand, Utah Mormons, while celebrating her role as Joseph Smith's wife and the first president of the Relief Society, have generally been highly critical. Early leaders in Utah castigated Emma from their pulpits for opposing Brigham Young and the practice of polygamy, and for lending support to the reorganization. As these attitudes filtered down through the years, Emma was virtually written out of official Utah Mormon histories. In this biography, we have attempted to reconstruct the full story of this remarkable and much misunderstood woman's experiences. Emma left no diary or journal. Some family papers mention her only briefly. Joseph Smith's diary refers to Emma and their children, and 22 letters written between them are extant. A few letters written after 1844 and one page of blessings she desired to be hers represent her only personal statements. Thus, we reconstructed Emma's story from other original documents and other evidence collected over eight years. We found documentation illustrating her life to be extensive but widely scattered. These sources are listed in the notes and bibliography. We added minimal punctuation but retained the original spelling. Dialogue in the narrative is taken from accounts reporting it. Although we each have roots that penetrate deep into Mormon history and culture, we have written neither to support nor to dispute doctrine and have used accounts both favorable to and critical of the new religion that Joseph Smith established. We also recognize the difficulty of maintaining balance in describing historical events that many people hold sacred. The solution Brigham H. Roberts expressed in the preface to the comprehensive history of the church became ours, to frankly state events as they occurred, in full consideration of all related circumstances allowing the line of condemnation or justification to fall where it may, being confident that in the sum of things justice will follow truth. In the collaboration that has spanned nearly nine years and encompassed research in archives from coast to coast as well as visits to the location of each of Emma's homes and other historical sites in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Missouri, Illinois, and Iowa, it becomes difficult to assign credit in the various elements of the project to one author or the other. Suffice it to say, neither of us could have done it alone, it has been an all-absorbing labor for both of us. In the end a flip of a coin determined the order in which the author's names appear. We owe a debt of gratitude to the librarians and staff of the Bianek Rare Books and Manuscripts Library at Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut, the Henry E. Huntington Library and Art Gallery, San Marino. California, the Stanford University Libraries, Palo Alto, California, and the Bancroft Library at the University of California at Berkeley. We owe much to Dennis Rowley, 
Hiram L. Andrews, and LeGrand Baker for their help at the Harold B. Lee Library at Brigham Young University, Provo, Utah, and also to Melvin T. Smith at the Utah State Historical Society, and Everett L. Cooley and Della Dye at the University of Utah's Marriott Library, both located in Salt Lake City, Utah. Madeline Brunson and Patricia B. Struble of the RLDS Library Archives, Independence, Missouri gave us assistance and friendship at the Historical Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City, Utah, James L. Kimball, Jeffrey O. Johnson, Donald T. Schmidt, William W. Slaughter, and Ronald G. Watt gave us direction and help with manuscript materials and photographs. We are indebted to the members of the Joseph Fielding Smith Institute for Church History at Brigham Young University, Leonard Jarrington, Maury Nursen Buck Beecher, Jill Mulder, Ronald K. Splin, Dean C. Jesse, and Carol Cornwall Madsen. Many other scholars and collectors also shared their own research with us or have guided us to other documents. James B. Allen, Daniel W. Batchman, Irene M. Bates, Lyndon W. Cook, Dorothy Danhouse, Grace Denning, Andrew Effort, Robert B. Flanders, Donna Hill, Edith H. Hindley, Robert D. Hutchins, Scott G. Kenny, Edward Luce, D. Michael Quinn, Jean Sessions, Jan Ships, E. Gary Smith, Kenneth Stubbor, Richard S. Van Wagener, Marcia Vogel, and Buddy U. Green. We are indebted to Alma Blair, Richard L. Bushman, Peter L. Crawley, Paul M. Edwards, Ronald K. Splin, Max H. Parkin, Larry C. Porter, and William D. Russell, who read parts of the work. Patricia Aikens edited the early stages of the book. James L. Clayton, Lawrence Foster, Marvin S. Hill, L. Jackson Newell, and W. L. Russia read the entire manuscript and offered insights and suggestions. We especially appreciate the editing skills of Lavina Fielding Anderson and the indexing skills of Gary Gillum. We also thank Jean Ann Vincent, senior editor, and her assistants, Dorian De Florio and Susan Cass at Doubleday and Company, Inc., for their patience and assistance and Robert Brinholt and Del Jenks for their enthusiastic encouragement. To Maxine Wood Campbell and Marilyn Damron White we owe a debt of gratitude that only writers with fine, competent typists can appreciate. Their husbands, Ralph E. Campbell and Leland R. White, proofread the manuscript. Jean Robbins, William H. Kerr, Karen Post, Patricia Shimmins, and John and Rose Harmon have each been of great help. And, finally, our greatest appreciation goes to our husbands, L. Jackson Newell and Charles C. Avery, and our children. For both the Averys and the Newells, this has been a family effort. We are grateful to each one of them. Although all these people have made our task easier, we accept responsibility for statements and conclusions expressed herein. Emma and Joseph 1825-1827, when Emma Hale awoke on a Thursday morning, January 18, 1827. She did not plan to be married by evening. The day before she had left her home in Harmony, Pennsylvania, to be a guest of the Josiah Stowell family across the state line in southern New York, the handsome Joseph Smith was there also. Emma stood tall, about five feet, nine inches. Men had decorously described her as well turned, of excellent form with splendid physical development. Dark hazel eyes complemented her olive complexion. She usually brushed her long dark hair to a shine then parted it in the middle and fastened it snugly against the nape of her neck. Her speech was lively, spirited, and witty. Joseph, who had just turned twenty-one, had asked for Emma's hand twice and had been rebuffed, not by Emma, but by her father, who Emma said was bitterly opposed to him. Isaac Hale could see no good in a man who dug for buried treasure or had visions. Six months past her twenty-second birthday. Emma was old enough to know her own mind and was determined to see Joseph even without her father's knowledge. An acquaintance of Emma's family, W. L. Hines, remembered seeing the couple after they left Hales. Joe stole his wife while Isaac Hale was at church. My wife and I saw him on an old horse with Emma on behind as they passed our house on their way to be married. I had no intention of marrying when I left home, Emma recalled, but the next day, at the Stowell's, Joseph's arguments, accompanied by Mr. Stowell's support, were persuasive. Emma weighed the situation and made her decision. Preferring to marry him to any other man I knew, she said, Elle consented. One of her mother's friends, who described Emma as intelligent, 
said that her marriage to Joseph Smith can only be accounted for by supposing he had bewitched her. Before nightfall Emma and Joseph stood nervously in Esquire Zachariah Tarbell's parlour in South Bainbridge, New York, and repeated their marriage vows, not willing to face her father long enough to return home for her personal possessions. Emma escaped Isaac Hale's indignation by fleeing with Joseph 130 miles north to the groom's home at Manchester, New York. The decision to elope would not have been easy. She had grown up in the stable and well-ordered home that Isaac and Elizabeth Hale provided for their nine children, but her marriage to Joseph Smith, the man who would become the prophet of the Mormon Church, would lead her halfway across the United States and embroil her in controversy over the Mormon practice of plural marriage that would endure for more than a century after her death. Emma followed the man she loved, leaving the Hales, and Harmony, and the Susquehanna River behind her. The Susquehanna River dominates the physical landscape of Harmony now Oakland, Pennsylvania. Emma had grown up along its banks in comfort and security. In the late 18th century, the river's long valley in southern New York and northern Pennsylvania was heavily forested. Oquago Mountain sloped south and east to the river, but the famed Ichabod Swamp, near the Pennsylvania-New York border, held all the mystery. An early settler described it as a dreadful swamp, thick with hemlock and laurel, and full of paths of wild animals, bears, wolves and panthers. Captain Ichabod Buck once became lost in the thicket and fought his way through its tangles to the river with a jackknife as his single weapon. The swamp had claimed only his name. The land was fertile, though heavy stands of oak, pine, beech, hemlock, maple, and hickory stood as silent obstacles to the farmers' attempts to sow wheat and corn. Two men had arrived on the banks of the Susquehanna with their young wives in 1791, Emma's parents. Isaac and Elizabeth Lewis Hale, together with Elizabeth's brother Nathaniel and his bride Sarah Cole. In Vermont they had piled their belongings onto a cart hitched to a yoke of oxen and headed for the Susquehanna Valley. On their arrival, Isaac and Elizabeth Hale bought land and an improvement, perhaps a log cabin. Nathaniel and Sarah Lewis settled the adjacent property. The two couples became the first permanent settlers in the area. Isaac killed deer and elk in the higher elevations and rubbed the carcasses down with salt. He piled the meat into wooden troughs which he skidded over the snow like a sled. He traded his kill for help on his farm, but as often as not the meat appeared unannounced on the doorsteps of his needy neighbors. Isaac and Elizabeth were members of the first informal Methodist Episcopal class in Harmony, meeting in private homes until a church could be built. Elizabeth's brother, Nathaniel Lewis, became a well-known lay preacher. Uncle Nathaniel's popular style marked him as the family's resident religious authority. Elizabeth remained a faithful member of the Methodist Episcopal Church for fifty years but Isaac could see that dependence upon God alone did not fill the haymow or fell the trees or move the logs. Isaac became diastic in his religious philosophy, trusting his own judgment. His decisions resulted in a solid reputation among his neighbors, a full pantry, a sturdy barn, a good house and food on the table for his five sons and four daughters. Emma, the third girl and seventh child in this family, was born July 10, 1804. According to a family spokesman, Isaac owed his return to traditional religious fealty to this daughter. He was in his early fifties when he stopped at the edge of a small clearing in the woods where he saw Emma, seven or eight years old, praying that her father might return to the orthodox Christianity she understood. Moved by the simple faith and love of this child, Isaac soon found his way back to the fold and brought Emma's 17-year-old brother David with him. She attended church with her parents and sang the hymns in her lyric soprano voice. Emma had more interests than religion. Tall and gangly, with dark hair and strong arms, she mastered her canoe well enough to make the Susquehanna her personal thoroughfare. Her older brother David was a pilot on the river and undoubtedly an indulgent observer as she maneuvered the canoe on the water. Her brothers taught Emma to handle horses and she rode with self-confidence and skill. Jesse, David, Alva, and Isaac, and two sisters, Phoebe and Elizabeth was older than Emma. A sister named Trial was two years younger and Reuben trailed by four more years. The four elder brothers gave Emma an opportunity to deal with young men, for in her eyes they must have always seemed grown. Her quick wit, remarked upon by friends when she became an adult, was shaped by her family in these early years. Both Jesse and David were tax collectors. Still, Isaac complained of his own taxes and forwarded a document to the authorities protesting, 
Year after year thousands of dollars are wrung from the pockets of our citizens in the shape of taxes. Though Isaac worked hard and steadily, Elizabeth also contributed to the family income. She opened her home to boarders, operating an inn or tavern, to provide the family with extra cash to augment produce from the garden, farm crops, and meat from the wild. She taught her daughters to make candles from tallow, cure sausages for the winter, and dry fruit from the orchards. They learned to knit and sew, to patch and mend. Quite likely the results of their homemaking skills appeared as entries in the annual agricultural fair. Elizabeth Lewis Hale saw that her children could read and write, probably teaching them herself through the long winter months. When Emma was nine the townspeople built a log schoolhouse and furnished it with rough log benches. But they hired the best schoolmaster available. Caleb Bears, educated in Boston, taught his first year in Harmony when Emma was twelve. Perhaps it was with him that Emma developed a fluency in the written language that was evident throughout her life. All of the Hale children were considered bright, but Emma was exceptional. Undoubtedly with great pride her father was able to send her away to a girl's school for an additional year of study, a marked contrast to the experience of her mother, who had struggled for an education amidst the poverty of her growing up years. Elizabeth Lewis had married Isaac Hale when she was 23 and he was 27. Both the Hales and the Lewises were old New England families. John Hale, the first ancestor to come to the New World, arrived as an indentured worker from England in 1635. Six years later he became a freeman in Concord, Massachusetts, and twenty years after his arrival he realized the immigrant's dream of holding land of his own. A mark of respectability to the Hales. John's son Gershom moved to Springfield, Massachusetts, in 1700 and persuaded the town fathers to grant him 20 acres in an area known as the Feeding Hill or Common. Gershom Hale's grandson, Reuben Hale, settled first in New Hartford, Connecticut. With Diane Toward he entered into ye marriage covenant on August 29, 1759, in Oxford. Massachusetts. He was recommended and admitted to the church at Heartland Township in 1772. A few years later Reuben Hale enlisted in the Revolutionary Army, serving six years. He bought and sold land over there. Years and apparently had some mechanical ability which augmented his farming. Reuben's and Dianta's second son, Isaac, was Emma's father. He was born in 1763 at Waterbury, Connecticut, but his grandfather, a reward, took him to Wells. Vermont, while he was still a child, presumably at the death of his mother. When Isaac was seventeen, he also joined the Revolutionary Army and marched under Colonel Ebenezer Allen. At that same age he inherited his grandfather Ward's land in Wells, Vermont, with the provision that he takes into his care his grandmother Phoebe Ward's in her old age, to keep and provide for during her life. She probably lived four more years, for in 1784 Isaac deeded some of her land to his brother. For Isaac the frontier pulled stronger than the inherited acres in Vermont. After a summer in Connecticut, he traveled to southern New York, where he hunted wild game to fulfill a boarding agreement. Isaac furnished the meat and Ichabod Buck provided the breadstuff. He returned briefly to New England for the one vital commodity he was not able to hew out of the raw country, a wife. Isaac Hale met Elizabeth Lewis in his hometown of Wells. Vermont. One of her ancestors, John Howland, left England on the Mayflower at age 28. Twelve years later, in 1632, George and Sarah Lewis and their family arrived in Plymouth Colony with a group of pilgrims led by a reverend, Mr. Lathrop. After two years in Plymouth, George was among a number who were returned from girls' school to teach in Harmony, probably in the same log structure where she sat as a wiggly child. As a young woman, Emma was physically and emotionally strong, with a streak of independence. Her demeanor for the most part was quiet but sociable. She had a delightful sense of humor. Evidence suggests that she judged people's characters quite accurately and acted upon her own instincts. Regardless of other opinions, she moved with slow precision but was capable of doing an amazing amount of work in little time. Emma was nearly twenty in the spring of 1824. One evening in May a neighbor named Jason Treadwell came to the Hales' house. Treadwell who lived with his wife and child in part of his father's house, was a local ne'er-do-well with an appetite for liquor. According to the county history, his father worked his 75 acres with little help from the son, thereby supporting both families. Jason was a strong, powerfully built man, about thirty. Heavy eyebrows that met over his nose gave him a savage appearance. 
his practical jokes bordered on the sinister. On this night Isaac noticed that Jason seemed agitated. Either through concern or curiosity, Mr. Hale asked, Jason, what has been the matter with you today? Nothing that I know of, Dreadwell replied, then parried the rest of the conversation and gave Isaac no information. The following day horrifying news spread through town. Someone had found Oliver Harper, shot dead, up on a hill by the roadside. A man of about fifty, Harper owned and worked a large farm just north of Harmony. He also operated an extensive lumbering business and, the previous day, had been down the Susquehanna on a raft with a load of lumber. He had set out to walk back home with $800 in his pocket. When Isaac Hale reported the conversation with Treadwell, Jason became a likely suspect. But the authorities found no weapon or money and, therefore, no motive. Then a Mr. Welton came forward with a strange story that further implicated Treadwell. Welton had passed over the same road, near the place the body was found, only an hour or so before Harper's death. He spotted someone lying by a log and partially hidden by underbrush. The person looked up and frightened Welton. The stranger had blackened his face with coal dust and Welton feared for his life when he saw the obvious disguise. He quickly thought of a way to ensure his safety. Here, come with me, he invited. I have got something with me that will help you. The whiskey he produced tempted the man, who followed him, swigging from the bottle as he walked. At the edge of the woods Welton continued on his way. Much relieved that the man with the blackened face had turned back. But Mr. Welton remembered a scar under the chin of his new acquaintance. Confident of his memory, he later promised to pick the man out of any crowd. Already under arrest by virtue of Isaac Hale's testimony, Jason Treadwell was placed in the midst of the men at Munson's Tavern in Hickory Grove. A carefully guarded Treadwell stood at the bar drinking whiskey when Welton singled him out, exclaiming, This is the man. By that scar I know he is the man. A motive then became apparent. Another neighbor, John Comfort, had earlier called Treadwell down for drinking, laziness, and general dissolution. Treadwell, angered and insulted at Comfort's interference, repeatedly threatened him. Comfort had also made a trip down the river and planned to return home the same day as Oliver Harper. The two men resembled each other in size and appearance and were dressed much alike. A man with killing on his mind and alcohol in his blood, hiding nervously in the bushes, could easily mistake one for the other. If the suspicions of the townspeople were correct, Jason Treadwell killed the wrong man. He had lain in ambush to take revenge on John Comfort and murdered Oliver Harper instead. After his gun was found hidden in a log and a partial confession was taken, Treadwell was tried, convicted, and hanged. The constable in charge later submitted a bill for twelve and one half cents to the county board of supervisors to cover the price of whiskey and a small file for taking irons off of Dreadwell. Isaac Hale thus found himself testifying against his neighbor's son, who was near the age of his own boys, Jesse and David. Bizarre as the Treadwell case was both the murderer and his victim would figure in the future lives of the Hale family. Years later Emma's older brother, Alva, would see one of his daughters married to Jason Treadwell's son, but it was an easy money scheme of Oliver Harper's that profoundly changed Emma's life. Not long before Harper's death a distant relative of Emma's, William Hale had approached Isaac with a peculiar story. A woman claiming to have powers that enabled her to see underground had told William Hale that great treasures were concealed in a hill just northeast of Isaac's house. Persons with such powers were commonly called peepers and many people took them seriously. William Hale began digging in the specified area. The work was slow and difficult for a man who had an aversion to hard physical labor. Not wealthy enough himself to hire help yet sure there would be riches to share with a partner. He talked Oliver Harper into financing the dig. Harper's untimely death suspended the operation for a time. But exciting rumors about buried treasure still swept through harmony. Josiah Stowell lived across the river in South Bainbridge, New York. He was one of the many men of good reputation and adequate means who convinced himself that treasure did, indeed, lie hidden beneath the soil. Stowell became William Hale's new partner, certain that the early Spanish explorers had discovered a silver mine and covered it with earth to hide it. Josiah worked on the site with William Hale but realized that progress would be faster if they hired men to help. For some time Stowell had known a farmer by the name of Smith who lived farther north in New York, and he believed that one of Smith's sons had extraordinary powers. The men in that family were at least six feet tall, strong 
and with reputations as hard workers. The combination seemed ideal to William Hale and Josiah Stowell, because Elizabeth Hale's tavern was close to the work site. Josiah Stowell made arrangements with her to board some men and left for northern New York to hire them. Each previous fall he had traveled to the Smith home to buy their wheat. This year a letter preceded his visit outlining the digging operation and offering employment to the Smith men. When Stowell returned to Harmony after his buying trip to upstate New York a new group of boarders came with him and entered the Hale house in November 1825. One tall, fair blue-eyed man named Joseph Smith stood among them. These were the money diggers. Boarders at the Hale House meant income above the wages of Emma's brothers and revenue received from farm produce and wild game. By November heavy outdoor work was almost completed for the year, and the warm kitchen became the social and economic center of the farmstead. Men with hearty appetites filled the room with banter and conversation. Elizabeth Hale, aided by her daughters, efficiently presided over the kitchen. While Emma moved from hearth to table, helping her mother serve the men, she no doubt noticed the remarkable resemblance between the Smith father and son. The senior Smith stood two inches above his six-foot-tall son and they both had similar coloring and strong, well-proportioned bodies. The younger Joseph's hair was changing from the sandy color of his youth to light brown. Emma quite likely thought he was nice-looking perhaps even handsome if one observed him straight on. From the side the slope of his forehead gave his nose the appearance of being too large. He limped slightly as he walked. Later, when they were better acquainted, Joseph probably told her how he acquired the limp and related accounts of his childhood, his family, and his work. He also must have described to her an unusual experience of having a vision several years earlier in a grove of trees near his father's farm. Joseph's background of English ancestry was similar to Emma's and, by coincidence, his parents, too, had married in Vermont. Lucy Mack brought a diary of a thousand dollars cash to her marriage to Joseph Smith, Sr. In contrast to Elizabeth Lewis's poverty, the Smiths farmed the rocky soil of Vermont with high optimism until the drought and hard frosts forced them to sell the farm near Randolph and relocate on the rented acreage of Lucy's parents near Sharon, Vermont. They paid their debts with Lucy's money and began again but without capital. On December 23, 1805, Lucy gave birth to their fifth child a son whom they named Joseph after his father. Their first child died at birth, but Alvin, Hiram, and Sophronia were older than Joseph. Samuel Harrison, another son Ephraim who lived only eleven days, and William were all born to the Smiths before the family moved to Lebanon, New Hampshire, in 1811. This move seemed propitious until a typhoid epidemic swept the region in 1812. Seven-year-old Joseph was ill with the fever and developed complications that left him nearly crippled and caused the limp apparent to Emma years later. The bone had become infected until the only alternative seemed to be amputation, but Lucy would not hear of such a drastic measure and the child bravely suffered without anesthetic through an operation that enabled him to keep his leg. Lucy had given birth to two more children, Catherine and Don Carlos. By 1816 when the year without a summer forced a mass migration of ruined farmers who left Vermont in such numbers that the dearth was felt for decades. Joseph, Sr., went to western New York and settled in Palmyra. Lucy sold what belongings she could and followed with the children. Caleb Howard, the man her husband had hired to drive his family to Palmyra, New York, turned out to be irresponsible and was short-tempered with the children. When they reached Utica, New York. Howard had used up most of the money. Seeing no more profit in the venture, he began throwing Lucy's belongings out of the wagon. Joseph watched as his mother confronted Howard in front of a crowd. She forbade him to touch her team, dismissed the man, and took charge herself, financing the remainder of their journey by selling their household goods along the way. Lucy finally reached her husband with few belongings and two cents in cash. The senior Joseph had found a place to house his family temporarily near the center of Palmyra. Lucy painted designs on oilcloth and baked cakes, gingerbread, and other pastries to sell with beer and boiled eggs. The sign by the door, cake and beer shop, 
advertised the little business. Young Joseph and the smaller children sold the cakes from a small cart in the streets of Palmyra. Family members hired out for various kinds of farm work. Within a year they had made almost all the down payment on a hundred acres of land about two miles south of Palmyra. The Smiths agreed to pay $100 a year to a New York City land speculator. The last payment was due by the end of 1825 setting the total cost for the farm at around $900. The Smith family moved into a small log cabin on their own land. It took most settlers a year to clear the first 10 acres of land and have it ready for crops. Lucy remembered that her husband, aided by the three older boys, Alvin, Hiram, and Joseph, cleared something like 30 acres of land that first year. Over the next few years those acres increased to 60. The farm had an abundance of sugar maple trees. Their yearly production of sugar was about a thousand pounds. Joseph, Sr., saw a market for sap buckets and barrels and put his skill as a cooper to work in the winter when the farm work was not so demanding. On this farm Lucy gave birth to their ninth and last child, named Lucy in 1821. 1882 to 1968 when the Smiths arrived in Palmyra, the entire family was influenced by the religious excitement there. The whole area of western New York gained a reputation for periodic revivals throughout the first half of the 19th century, and historians labeled the area west of the Catskill and Adirondack Mountains the burned-over district. Longing to feel and shout like the rest. Joseph later remembered wanting to belong but even at his young age could not overcome his reservations. He watched as various ministers vied for different family members and said he could not understand how so many people professing the same God could create such division within the community. Two issues that plagued 14-year-old Joseph, according to his own writings, revolved around his desire to know which church was right and how one became saved. The family could not afford to pay a school teacher so they held school at home, using the Bible as their text. Joseph was not as studious as his brothers and sisters. His mother said he had never read the Bible through, but he was thoughtful and sometimes introspective. However, Joseph said it was while he read the Bible in the spring of 1820 that he found the answer to his theological dilemma in James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. Simple enough, Joseph felt, according to his own accounts. He walked across the road and knelt near a stump in the woods and tried to pray but could not. Joseph's accounts, written in 1831, 32 to 1834, and 1839, differ in the details of this first vision. When he could finally pray, Joseph recalled seeing a pillar of fire or light descending from heaven and encompassing him. The earliest account says that the Lord Jesus Christ then appeared to him and told him his sins were forgiven. In the 1838 version Joseph described two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description. One addressed him by name and gestured toward the other, saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Joseph said he asked them which sect was right and which one he should join. L was answered that I must join none of them, for they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. When the vision ended, he found himself lying on his back, looking up into heaven. Joseph did not tell his family immediately, but he did tell a Methodist preacher he had met at earlier revival meetings. To Joseph's astonishment. The minister reacted with shock and contempt. William Smith indicated that they had not been aware of animosity from the townspeople until after Joseph let it be known that he had seen a vision. Whether that incident was actually the catalyst or whether Lucy had unknowingly caused the bitter feelings herself is open to speculation. A sociable person, raised in a family with comfortable means, Lucy did without finery in her marriage although she seldom complained. When the ladies in the community invited her to their tea circles, she was obviously pleased. But when some of the merchants' wives expressed their sympathy because she lived in a small log cabin instead of the finer house she deserved, Lucy reacted strongly. Ella I'm the wealthiest woman that sits at this table, she said. I have never prayed for riches of the world, as perhaps you have but I have always desired that God would enable me to use enough wisdom and forbearance in my family to set good precepts and examples before my children. She went on, we owe no man, we never distressed any man which circumstance almost invariably attends the mercantile life, so I have no reason to envy those who are engaged.
Beside there is none present who have this kind of wealth that have not lately met with the loss of children or other friends. But unfortunately, she spoke personally. Now as for Mrs. the Minister's lady, I ask you how many nights of the week you are kept awake with anxiety about your sons who are in habitual attendance at the grog shop and gambling house. Lucy's report of the incident indicates that she did not intend her remarks to be unkind, only pointed, but they undoubtedly ruffled the feathers of the minister's wife. Whatever the initial cause, controversy developed around the Smith family. When the minister circulated the vision story, Joseph seemed unprepared for the furor that developed. Though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. I was led to say in my heart, why persecute me for telling the truth? Joseph remained adamant. I had seen a vision, I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it, neither dare I do it. Surprisingly, being rebuffed and ridiculed did not make Joseph withdraw nor aloof. Acquaintances described him as a good-natured lad with a jovial easy way who seemed to enjoy a host of friends. More than three years elapsed before he experienced another spiritual manifestation. Then one night he lay awake. He remembered the room suddenly getting lighter and lighter until he could see a personage standing in the air near his bed, dressed in a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness. The personage said he was a messenger from God. He told Joseph there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent, and the sources from whence they sprang the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it. Joseph said he saw the hiding place of the plates as though in a vision, while the messenger named Moroni gave him instructions. The visitor returned twice more that night and appeared in the fields the next day. He told the boy to tell no one but his family of his experience. According to Joseph's account, he went immediately to the place Moroni had shown him, a hilltop about two miles south of his home. He reported that he then pried up a large, rounded stone to find a box underneath made of stone slabs cemented together. Inside he recognized the gold record and interpreters called the Urim and Thummim. Joseph said he impulsively assessed the gold and realized financial security lay within his reach. But when he attempted to take the gold plates the messenger appeared and chastised him for wanting to obtain riches. He told Joseph to return annually for instructions, which Joseph said he did. Joseph and his older brothers hired out for wages. The extra income from these sons financed the construction of a larger family home which Alvin supervised, but before the house was finished, he became ill. A physician medicated him with an overdose of calomel which lodged in his upper bowel and caused gangrene. He died after a poignant farewell to his family. Joseph would remember this brother in fond and reverent terms, perhaps because Alvin had shown a keen interest in Joseph's visions. Joseph and Alvin had also worked together. While they were digging a well for a neighbor, Willard Chase, Joseph had found a smooth smoky colored stone the size of an egg, though not that shape, with light stripes running through it. Chase said he had found the stone, not Joseph and when he believed Joseph could see things in it he wanted it back. Dispute over the stone rankled Chase and he later re-entered Joseph's life to exact vengeance. Money digging, or treasure hunting, was widespread among the rural areas of New York and New England as well as the area of Pennsylvania near the Hales. The phenomena influenced Joseph, too. Those around him who believed in glass-looking and divining treasures were religious people who easily mixed folk magic and treasure-seeking with Christianity. For example, Willard Chase was a devout Methodist, his obituary said he was a minister, Josiah Stowell was a respected member of the Presbyterian Church and a reputable man in his community, the Smiths also were buffeted by the prevailing folklore. The discovery of the Seer Stone and the reported visit of Moroni came in fairly close succession, perhaps making it difficult for them to sort out the differences between the spiritual and the superstitious. Most of those who would accuse Joseph of money digging were participators themselves but claimed the Smiths were an indolent family and what little income they had came from hiring out as money diggers. Although the family worked in a variety of ways for economic support, their wheat crop provided their basic income. They contracted yearly with buyers like Josiah Stowell for its sale. He knew that Joseph also had a peep stone and wanted the young man to work for him because he possessed certain keys, by which he could discern things invisible to the natural eye. William Hale wrote to the Smiths about digging for him, then Stowell, followed the letter with a visit. Lucy remembered young Joseph trying to talk Stowell out of the enterprise, but the man insisted. Joseph, Sr 
seem more enthusiastic about the prospects of digging than his son. Another payment on the farm was due and Stowell offered high wages. So, father and son, along with several others, accompanied Josiah Stowell to the Hale Farm in Pennsylvania. And although Joseph would never locate a buried treasure in Harmony, Pennsylvania, he did find Emma Hale. Isaac Hale viewed the money digging activities with conflicting emotions. On the one hand, his farming experience taught him that the earth rarely harbored great riches. But when his neighbor, Josiah Stowell, believed peep stones could reveal hidden treasures and invested money in the enterprise, Isaac suspected Josiah knew something he did not. Both men were comfortably well off, but neither was wealthy. If Josiah Stowell found a fortune under Isaac's nose, the subtle social structure existing among the local farmers would be altered in Stowell's favor. It would humiliate Isaac if his lazy relative, William Hale found a treasure. Isaac Hale guarded both his options. He allowed the money digging to take place under his watchful eye but kept himself a respectable distance from the operation. On November 1, 1825, Isaac witnessed an agreement between the workers and Josiah Stowell which formed a digging company. The Smith's share amounted to two elevenths of the findings, whether it be in ore or coined money and bars or ingots of gold or silver. As the money digging progressed with no sign of treasure, Isaac seemed to place the responsibility for the whole operation on Joseph. Isaac said, Young Smith gave the money diggers great encouragement, at first, but when they had arrived in digging too near the place where he had stated an immense treasure would be found, he said the enchantment was so powerful that he could not see it. Several years later Isaac referred to his son-in-law as a careless young man, not very well educated, and very saucy and insolent to his father. There is no account of Joseph's father ever registering that complaint against his son. What Isaac interpreted as insolence may have been a disagreement over whether or not to continue with the digging operation. According to his mother's account, Joseph had not wanted to participate in the first place. Soon he succeeded in getting Stowell to end the project. Emma did not see Joseph from the same perspective as her father. She found him pleasant, thoughtful, and open without being rowdy. Josiah Stowell believed he was a fine likely young man and at that time did not profess religion he was not a profane man although I did once in a while hear him swear he never gambled to my knowledge. I well know he was no horse jockey for he was no judge of horses I sold him one that is old. I never knew him to get drunk I believe he would now and then take a sip. I state this for fact that anything from what I have said about Joseph Smith that is worse than I say is false and untrue. When Josiah Stowell abandoned the digging enterprise, Emma did not have to say goodbye to Joseph, for Stowell hired him as a farmhand and to cut timber. He crossed the Susquehanna River to visit her. Probably acutely conscious of the difference between his education and Emma's, Joseph found time to go to school while he lived at the Stowells. When Josiah did not have work for him he traveled three miles along the river to Colesville to work for Joseph Knight, who thought Joseph was the best hand he ever hired. Emma had attracted Joseph's interest from their first meeting. Fine-looking, smart, and a good singer, is how a visitor at the Hales described her, and she often got the power. What the power was the visitor did not elaborate upon, but Emma did have deep faith and knew the Bible well. When Joseph told her of his vision in the woods, she believed him. Once Emma and Joseph agreed to marry, they sought Isaac's approval. Apparently anticipating the young man's approach. Isaac gave a thundering refusal. His reason was that Joseph was a stranger. It may be that Emma's father had his eye on a neighbor's son for his daughter and that he disapproved of Joseph's money digging. Isaac Hale's no was absolute. Emma was pleading her case with her father. Joseph's arrest and subsequent trial at Bainbridge, New York, in March 1826 did not help. Mrs. Stowell's nephew had formally charged Joseph with being a disorderly person and an imposter. While the disorderly complaint was not addressed at the trial, Joseph's professed ability to peer through his stone and divine the location of buried treasure was. Joseph testified that he had a certain stone, which he occasionally used to locate hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth, and lost property but that he had given up the activity because it made his eyes sore. He said he did not solicit that business and would prefer to have nothing to do with it. When Josiah Stowell took the stand, he enthusiastically endorsed Joseph's ability to use the stone, stating he positively knew that the prisoner could tell, and professed the art of seeing those valuable treasures through the medium of the stone. Other witnesses testified that Joseph's actions were designed to deceive. One source said the court found the defendant guilty 
another indicated he was acquitted, still another stated, because he was a minor, they hoped he might reform, and he was allowed to escape. Joseph's involvement in money digging continued to plague his reputation. Of this period in his life he wrote, during this time, as is common to most, or all youths, I fell into many vices and follies, I have not been guilty of wronging or injuring any man or society of men, and those imperfections to which I allude, and for which I often had occasion to lament, were a light, and too often, vain mind, exhibiting a foolish and trifling conversation. After the trial ended Joseph turned his mind to Emma. If she hoped Joseph's employment with Josiah Stowell would change his standing in Isaac's eyes, it was in vain. Joseph was less welcome in the Hale home than he had ever been. Emma's brothers joined forces with her father and teased Joseph so incessantly while on a fishing trip that he threw off his coat and offered to fight them. The couple had their allies, however. One wintry day Emma saw a high-stepping horse pull a cutter to a stop in front of her house. The tall, well-dressed driver was Joseph. Joseph knighted outfitted him with a new suit of clothes and loaned him the horse and sleigh enabling him to visit Emma in more style than was his previous custom. Joseph asked again for Emma's hand in marriage and Isaac again refused. When Josiah Stowell and Joseph Knight went north to Palmyra for wheat in the fall, Joseph, still stinging from the rebuff, went home with them. He arrived in time to see his brother Hiram marry Jerusha or Barden, who was the same age as Emma, on November 2, 1826. The wedding undoubtedly stirred Joseph's emotions. He missed Emma and was determined to have her. Lucy recalled, he had felt so lonely ever since Alvin's death that he had come to the conclusion of getting married if we had no objections and he thought that no young woman that he ever was acquainted with was better calculated to render the man of her choice happy than Miss Emma Hale whom he had been extremely fond of since his first introduction to her. Joseph's father remembered Emma from his own brief stay at her house and was pleased with his son's choice. He not only gave his blessing but invited Joseph to bring her home to live with them. When Joseph went that fault to the hill named Cumra, the personage told him he could have the record the following September if he brought with him the right person and indicated that Joseph would know who that was. Joseph Knight, in whom Joseph later confided the story, said the young man looked into his glass and found it was Emma Hale daughter of old Mr. Hale of Pennsylvania. The last payment on the farm was soon due. Stowell and Knight had agreed to advance the Smiths the price of next year's wheat, but Joseph, Sr., had to go to Pennsylvania for the money. Lucy said about her husband and son, they then concluded to set off together, one for money, the other for a wife. Part way to Pennsylvania a letter containing disturbing news interrupted their travel. Calvin Stoddard, the carpenter the Smiths had hired to finish the house, had convinced the land agent that the two Josephs had run away to escape the debt. Stoddard had thereupon offered to pay the full price for the land in exchange for the deed and the agent accepted. Joseph and his further turned back to Palmyra immediately. Eventually the senior Smith persuaded the agent to sell the farm to a third party buyer who would allow them to live there as tenants. In an unusual twist the carpenter, Calvin Stoddard, soon fell in love with Sophronia Smith and married her on December 30, 1827. As soon as the situation settled at home, Joseph returned to Pennsylvania for some unfinished business of his own. Emma accepted his proposal at Stowell's on January 18, 1827. After their hasty marriage the couple traveled north to Palmyra and moved in with the Smith family. Hiram's wife, married almost three months had smoothed the way for Emma's entry into the family. Lucy said Jerushaw was one of the most excellent of women, with whom I had seen much enjoyment. When Emma arrived, Lucy remembered, I hoped for as much happiness with my second daughter-in-law, as I had received from the society of the first, and there was no reason why I should expect anything to the contrary. Emma's gave her father time to calm his anger before she wrote from New York and asked for her clothes, furniture, and cows. Isaac replied that they were safely cared for and at her disposal. In August she and Joseph hired Peter Ingersoll to drive them to Harmony to get her belongings. The reunion was not pleasant. Isaac's eyes brimmed with tears as he leveled his gaze at his new son-in-law, you have stolen my daughter and married her. I had much rather have followed her to her grave. Isaac never forgave Joseph for the affront to his family name. Although he managed to reconcile himself somewhat when he secured a promise from Joseph that the money digging was over. Emma and Joseph left Harmony with her property and an invitation from Isaac to return to the Hale farm. The offer, though appreciated, 
was not nearly so attractive then as it would be in December when they would need a refuge. While he and Emma rode in Peter Ingersoll's wagon as it bumped along the rutted roads toward Manchester, Joseph told Ingersoll that he intended to keep his promise to Isaac Hale. It will be hard for me, he said, for they will all oppose, as they want me to look in the stone for them to dig money. Not long after their return from Harmony, Joseph went to Manchester Village on business for his father but did not return at the appointed time. Lucy explained to Emma that several years earlier someone had shot at Joseph in front of the house, but the bullet missed its intended target. Who fired the shot or why was unknown, but the family was uneasy whenever Joseph was late. Now Emma and the others waited with apprehension. When Joseph finally arrived and sank into a chair exhausted, his father asked where he had been. Joseph answered soberly. I have taken the severest chastisement that I have ever had in my life. As I passed by the hill of Cumra, where the plates are, the angel met me, and said that I had not been engaged enough in the work of the Lord, that the time had come for the record to be brought forth. Nobody doubted his word. On September 20, 1827, Josiah Stowell and Joseph Knight arrived at the Smith's home to buy their usual load of wheat. Emma, eager for news from home inquired about her family and friends. When the guests retired that night, Emma and Joseph quietly retreated to their own room to prepare to go out. Joseph slipped downstairs to find his mother working in the kitchen. He asked her for a chest with a lock and key and Lucy was concerned when she did not have one. Never mind, he assured her, I can do very well for the present without it, be calm, all is right. A few minutes later Emma came out in her bonnet and riding dress. She joined Joseph outside and Mr. Knight's horse and wagon lurched forward down the road toward the hill Cumra. There Emma waited with the wagon while he climbed up the hill and disappeared in the darkness. Before long Joseph reappeared carrying a bundle wrapped in his coat, and Emma saw the outline of what he told her was a book of thin gold sheets inscribed with ancient characters. He climbed into the wagon beside her and turned the horse toward home stopping halfway there. Emma watched again, as he disappeared into the blackness of the forest with the bundle in his arms. He hid the treasure in a hollowed out log, then covered the hole with pieces of bark. The venture took several hours and by the time Emma and Joseph rode into the yard Lucy had tried to placate everyone. Joseph Knight was certain some thief had stolen his horse and wagon and Joseph, Sr., kept asking where Joseph was and why he did not join them for breakfast. The clatter of horse and wagon outside the kitchen door relieved everyone. Emma and Joseph said nothing about where they had been. Lucy worried that her son had broken some commandment and had been denied the plates. Her anxiety mounted until she left the room to avoid blurting out her questions. Joseph followed his mother to reassure her and show her what she described as the interpreter. It consisted of two smooth three-cornered diamonds set in glass, and the glasses were set in silver bows which were connected with each other in much the same way as old-fashioned spectacles. The breastplate which held the interpreter was concave in shape, with two metal straps fastening it to the hips and shoulders. It appeared to have been made to fit a very large man. Joseph said the messenger, Moroni, had charged him with the safety of the plates when he retrieved them from Cumara. When his father asked to see them, Joseph explained that Moroni forbade showing them until he translated the characters. But later Emma and the family would handle the plates through the wrappings and riffle the thin metallic pages. William Smith said they were heavier than wood or stone, estimating their weight at around 60 pounds. Soon the neighborhood heard that Joseph now had the gold plates. Some people would eventually sign affidavits that the plates were a hoax. Others believed Joseph. A neighbor stated, yes. I rather think he did have them. Tilda why not he finds something as well as anybody else. In Illinois and Ohio, in Moundsville. They have discovered copper plates since. Now, I never saw the Book of Mormon, don't know anything about it, nor care, and don't know as it was ever translated from the plates, but all this don't prove that Smith never got any plates. Willard Chase, who had argued earlier about the peep stone, heard about them and organized his friends to take them by force. Joseph, Sr., inadvertently overheard the plans. Joseph was digging a well for a widow in the nearby town of Macedon. In his absence Joseph, Sr., anxiously asked Emma if his son had moved the plates or if she knew their whereabouts and told her about Chase's plotting. Emma suggested that if the Lord meant Joseph to have the plates the manipulations of men would be unsuccessful, but she volunteered to warn Joseph. William Smith caught the only horse available, a stray, 
marked as the law required with a hickory branch bent around its neck. Emma, newly pregnant, mounted and rode to the work site. When Emma told Joseph about Willard Chase's plans, he borrowed a horse and rode back with her to retrieve the plates from their hiding place in the woods. He returned to the house battered, exhausted, and with a dislocated thumb, explaining that he had been attacked three different times on his way back. Joseph hurriedly secured the plates in a chest his brother Hiram supplied and hid them under the hearthstone. The immediate crisis passed after Chase and his looters searched the house in vain. During October and November bands of curious, skeptical people disrupted the Smith household with threats, rumors, and evening raids. Former partners of Joseph claimed a share in the mysterious bounty. Willard Chase's sister peered into her peepstone to locate the plates. Joseph moved them to a pile of flax in the loft of his father's cooper shop then put the empty chest under the floorboards. Directed by the peepstone, Willard Chase's group ransacked the shop and smashed the chest without finding the plates. Martin Harris, a well-to-do farmer who lived on the other side of Palmyra, has been a close and trusted friend of the family. He had shown a particular interest in the story of the plates, and when he heard that Joseph had them, he enthusiastically climbed cumerous slopes and dug holes looking for more treasure. Joseph's mother said Mrs. Harris was peculiar, hard of hearing, and somewhat suspicious. Dolly Harris made a nuisance of herself in the Smith house by badgering Joseph about the plates and burdening the family with her strange dreams. She gave $28 to Joseph, who accepted the money but made sure he signed a note for the amount. Clearly, Joseph could never translate under such chaotic conditions. Isaac Hale's offer to live at Harmony now seemed attractive. In December Emma's brother Alva came to help them move. When Alva accompanied Joseph to Palmyra on business, Martin Harris approached Joseph with a small bag of silver. Here, Mr. Smith, is fifty dollars. I give this to you to do the Lord's work with. He paused. No, I give it to the Lord for his own work. Joseph insisted on giving Harris a promissory note and asked Alva to sign with him, but Harris would not accept a note and called on bystanders to witness that he gave the money freely. When word spread that Joseph was leaving, Willard Chase and others united in a final effort to get the gold Bible before it was out of their reach. Their scheme broke down when the men squabbled over who should take charge. At Harris's suggestion, Emma and Joseph left two days earlier than planned for extra security. Alva Hale helped Joseph cut large clubs for each of them, with loaded wagon, Alva as their driver, and the plates hidden in a barrel of beans. Emma and Joseph began the trek to Harmony and Emma's girlhood home. The elect lady 1827-1830, returning to the tranquil scene of her childhood, Emma anticipated peace in the Hale home, which had not been searched by marauders or been invaded by the curious, as had the Smith home. Undoubtedly, she saw Alva's help with the move down from New York as an indication that her father had forgiven her. But her illusion of peace soon shattered. Alva told his father Joseph had found gold plates and brought them with him to translate. A skeptical eyes are cast to see them. I was shown a box in which it is said they were contained, which had to all appearances, been used as a glass box of the common window glass, he said. L was allowed to feel the weight of the box, but I was not allowed to look. After this, I became dissatisfied, and informed him that if there was anything in my house of that description, which I could not be allowed to see, he must take it away, if he did not, I was determined to see it. Emma could see that living in her parents' home would be difficult. She and Joseph moved nearby into the house her brother Jesse left when he moved to Illinois. The sturdy frame structure built by Isaac and his sons had ample room for two people awaiting the birth of a first child. Emma had modest comfort and a degree of privacy two things she would often live without. She and Joseph negotiated to buy the house and 13 acres of land from Isaac Hale for $200. Isaac did not expect immediate payment but the two men agreed to the terms. The confrontation with Isaac over the gold plates destroyed Joseph's hope of acceptance by Emma's family. In good faith, he had assured Isaac the summer before that he had given up money digging. But no matter how Emma and Joseph explained the plates, to Isaac the whole thing smacked of treasure hunting. No doubt hoping to convince Isaac of his acceptability, Joseph then made a move that further embarrassed himself and the Hales. Emma's uncle, Nathaniel Lewis, 
preached as a lay minister of the local Methodist Episcopal Church. His congregation met in the homes of the members for Sunday services. On Wednesdays a regular circuit preacher visited Harmony. In the spring or summer of 1828 Joseph asked the circuit rider if his name could be included on the class roll of the church. Joseph presented himself in a very serious and humble manner, and the minister obliged him. When Emma's cousin, Joseph Lewis, discovered Joseph's name on the roll. He thought it was a disgrace to the church to have a practicing necromancer as a member. He took the matter up with a friend, and the following Sunday, when Joseph and Emma arrived for church, the two men steered Joseph aside and into the family shop. They told him plainly that such character as he could not be a member of the church unless he broke off his sins by repentance, made public confession, renounced his fraudulent and hypocritical practices and gave some evidence that he intended to reform and conduct himself somewhat nearer like a Christian than he had done. They gave him his choice to go before the class, and publicly asked to have his name stricken from the class book or stand a disciplinary investigation. Joseph refused to comply with the humiliating demands and withdrew from the class. His name, however, stayed on the roll for about six more months, either from oversight or because Emma's brother-in-law, Michael Morse, who taught the class did not know of the confrontation. When Joseph did not seek full membership, Morse finally dropped his name. As winter settled in, Joseph turned his attention to translating the plates. Although Emma never saw the plates, she believed he had them. They lay in a box under our bed for months but I never felt at liberty to look at them, she reported in later years. She said they were sometimes on a table in her living room, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth, which I had given him to fold them in. I once felt of the plates as they thus lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. They seemed to be pliable like thick paper, and would rustle with a metallic sound when the edges were moved by the thumb, as one does sometimes thumb the edges of a book. Emma lifted and moved the plates as she dusted around them. If Emma's faith in Joseph was remarkable, so was Joseph's faith in Emma. He told her that no one would be allowed to see the plates until they were translated, yet he did not hide them from her. If the plates were a hoax, she could have easily exposed Joseph as an impostor. I believe he was everything he professed to be, she would say at the age of 74. When Joseph began the translation, he needed someone to write for him as he dictated. Emma began her role as scribe. The school teacher in Emma recognized Joseph's struggle with written English. He could not pronounce the word Sariah, she said. Although Joseph's own reading of the scriptures had been sporadic at best, Emma knew the Bible well and read it often. Once, as he translated. The narrative mentioned the walls of Jerusalem. Joseph stopped. Emma, he asked, did Jerusalem have walls surrounding it? Emma told him it did. Oh, I thought I was deceived, was his reply. Emma recalled that at first Joseph used the interpreters, called the Aram and Thummim, but later he placed a smooth dark stone in his hat, then put his face in the hat to block the light. When asked if Joseph could have written the story privately, then dictated it pretending he was translating from the plates, Emma retorted, Joseph Smith could neither write nor dictate a coherent and well-worded letter, let alone dictating a book like the Book of Mormon. It is marvelous to me as much as to anyone. I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writing of the manuscripts unless he was inspired, for, when I was acting as his scribe, he would dictate to me for hour after hour, and when returning after meals, or after interruptions, he would at once begin where he had left off, without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. Emma continued, it would have been improbable that a learned man could do this, and, for one so ignorant and unlearned as he was, it was simply impossible. When Emma's household duties required her attention, her brother Reuben occasionally acted as scribe. The rest of the Hale family apparently remained skeptical, if not outright hostile and Reuben's involvement was brief. The whole affair was more than Isaac could abide. The manner in which he pretended to read and interpret, Isaac stated, was the same as when he looked for the money diggers. By midwinter Emma's and Joseph's stores had dwindled. To ask Emma's family for assistance was out of the question, so they made the 28-mile trip up the Susquehanna to Colesville to see their friend Joseph Knight, Sr., who wrote. He could not translate but little being poor and nobody to write for him but his wife and she could not do much and take care of her house. His wife's father and family were all against him and would not help him. 
Ignoring resistance to Joseph from his own family, Knight gave them some little provisions and some few things out of the store a pair of shoes and three dollars in money to help him a little. Martin Harris visited Emma and Joseph in the winter. Willing to help financially, Harris looked to make money from the venture, but also said he expected it to resolve many controversial points of doctrine. He told Joseph that the Lord had directed him in a vision to take some of the characters to New York to the land so they could be verified. Joseph gave him a paper with several characters written on it and his translation of them. Harris said he then traveled to New York City and showed the copy to two men, a Dr. Mitchell, probably Samuel Latham Mitchell, who was both a classical scholar and a scientist, and Charles Anthon of Columbia College, a professor of ancient languages. According to Harris, Anthon pronounced the characters authentic and correctly translated and gave Harris a certificate. When Harris told him divine intervention was involved, he took the statement back and tore it up. Anthon said he remembered the visit from Harris, but he had not verified the translation. Nonetheless, Martin Harris reported his findings to Joseph and returned home to put his affairs in order so he could go to Harmony and assist in the translation. Harris's homecoming was less than joyous. His wife, Dolly, suspected that Martin would throw his money away in helping Joseph and insisted on going to Harmony too. They arrived at Emma's and Joseph's home in April. Dolly immediately commenced transacting every nook and corner of the house, chests, trunks, cupboards in search of the plates until Joseph hid them outside. She concluded that Joseph had buried them, so she searched outdoors. When she came back to Emma's kitchen empty-handed, she had an excuse. Are there any snakes around here in the winter? She asked. No, was Emma's reply. I've been walking around in the woods, Dolly reported, and a tremendous black snake stuck up his head before me, and commenced hissing at me. Emma, may have warned Dolly that she was intruding where she had no right, for Mrs. Harris took lodging with a neighbor for a while before returning home. But she told the neighbor Joseph was an imposter with designs upon her husband's property. Undoubtedly the word reached the Hales who were not accustomed to having their family objects of gossip and ridicule. By June, Joseph and Martin Harris brought the number of translated pages to 116. Perhaps, Harris reasoned, if his wife could see what they had accomplished she would believe the work was worthwhile. He begged Joseph to let him take the manuscript back to Palmyra with him. Finally, Joseph said he had asked the Lord three times and Harris could take the translated pages if he promised to show them to no one but his family. Harris agreed. On June 15, 1828, the day after Harris left, Emma went into labor that was long and extremely difficult. Her first child, a son, lived only three hours. The saddened parents named him Alvin, after Joseph's deceased brother, and buried him east of the house. The midwife who attended Emma, her sister-in-law Oda Skinner, indicated that this first child had birth defects. Sophia Lewis, probably a cousin of Emma's, also said that she was present at the birth of this child, and that it was still born and very much deformed. For over two weeks Emma hovered near death while Joseph kept vigil at her bedside. As Emma gained strength Joseph became anxious about the manuscript. He did not mention his concern to Emma for fear of agitating her mind too much for the health of her body but his despondency worried her. I shall not be at ease until I know something about what Mr. Harris is doing, she said, and urged him to go to Palmyra. At first, he protested but Emma insisted and Joseph, seeing her so cheerful and so willing to have him leave, finally decided to go. Joseph found Harris in distress. He had lost the manuscript. Lucy reported Joseph's reaction as he clenched his hands together. My God! He cried, all is lost all is lost. Must return to my wife with such a tale as this. I dare not do it lest I should kill her. Despite his promise to Joseph, Martin Harris had shown the prized manuscript to everyone who came by until he opened the drawer one day and found it gone. The prime suspect was his vindictive wife. Joseph returned to Emma empty-handed and told her that he had been severely chastised by the messenger, Maroney who explained that he was not to re-translate the same material but use a second account to avoid being trapped by inconsistencies. As autumn's red and gold faded from the hills around Harmony, Joseph's parents arrived, anxious over Emma's health and without news for more than two months. It was Lucy's first trip to Harmony. Emma writes for me, Joseph told his mother, but the angel said that the Lord would send me a scribe. Lucy satisfied herself that all was well with her son and his wife 
then found Emma's family pleasantly situated and living in good style, and deemed them intelligent and highly respectable. After three months the senior Smiths returned to Palmyra confident that their son had married well. In the spring Joseph's younger brother, Samuel, came to help with the tilling and planting and brought with him a young school teacher named Oliver Cowdery who had boarded with the Smith family. Cowdery was twenty-two, about five feet, five inches tall, he carried his slight frame with a loose, easy walk. His Roman nose gave balance to his clean-shaven face with its prominent lower jaw. He had dark brown eyes, a high forehead, and a quick smile. Two days after his arrival Oliver Cowdery was at work with quill in hand. At last Joseph had a full-time scribe. Early spring is a lean season for those who work the land, but Joseph was especially pressed in 1829. Supplies were now scarce, and he had yet to harvest a crop. Joseph and Oliver walked again to Colesville, New York, to see Joseph Knight, Sr., only to find him gone. After several discouraging days inquiring for work, they returned home to find the generous Mr. Knight ahead of them, unloading supplies. The tired men hefted the food into the large basement room and stacked it along the stone wall. Emma's gratefully surveyed ten bushels of grain, six bushels of potatoes, a barrel of mackerel, and a pound of tea. Knight had even remembered lined paper. Isaac Hale's face may have been grim if he watched free provisions arrive at the door of a son-in-law who, he felt, neglected his farm. With adequate supplies stored away and Samuel working the farm, Joseph and Oliver resumed work on the plates. They could do only a few pages each day, according to Emma, but as the story unfolded on the heavy fool's caper, she was intrigued with it. It was an account of an ancient people who migrated to America from Jerusalem about 600 BC, drifting with the prevailing ocean and wind currents. They divided into two major factions called the Amenities and the Nephites. Wars and contentions persisted throughout their history. They kept meticulous records of their conflicts, social structure, economic life, religious beliefs, and faith. At one time Jesus Christ visited and ought the Nephites and for two hundred years thereafter peace prevailed. After devastating wars almost annihilated the Nephites, but one man remained to write the final words of this ancient record. This was Moroni, last keeper of the record and son of Mormon, after whom the book would be named. Joseph explained that the Lamanites were ancestors of the American Indians and the book's purpose was to be a witness for Christ. Gossip spread about Joseph's translating. Neighbors in Harmony began subtle harassment prompted by rumors Dolly Harris had spread earlier. Emma's uncle, Nathaniel Lewis, listened intently to the young man's claims, then baited him. Joseph, he said, can anybody else translate strange languages by the help of them spectacles? Oh, yes, was the answer. Well, now, said Mr. Lewis, I've got Clark's commentary and it contains a great many strange languages, now if you will let me try the spectacles and if, by looking through them, I can translate these strange languages into English, then I'll be one of your disciples. Not willing to antagonize Emma's family any further, Joseph let the conversation drop. Work under these circumstances was difficult. Sometime in the latter part of May 1829, Olive wrote to a friend named David Whitmer in Fayette, New York, and asked if they could go there to finish the translation. To Emma's and Joseph's surprise, David Whitmer pulled up to their house in his wagon early in June to offer them a place to live and help with the translation. He initiated that his friends were eager to meet Joseph and hear of his work firsthand. The men drove 135 miles to fight, leaving Emma to care for affairs at home. The situation may well have fueled Isaac's wrath. Now he could claim that Joseph neglected the farm, and Emma as well. In fact, Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris asked Joseph to inquire of the Lord if they could see the plates. When the answer was affirmative, Joseph showed the three men the gold plates, commenting, I feel as if I was relieved of a burden which was almost too heavy for me to bear, and it rejoices my soul, that I am not any longer to be entirely alone in the world. Mrs. Whitmer also claimed she saw the plates in a vision a privilege afforded her for her hard work on behalf of the men. Ironically, 
Emma's untiring efforts to support Joseph did not receive the same reward. She soon came to fret and she and Joseph occupied the room to the right of the head of the stairs in the crowded Whitmer house. Emma and Oliver were scribes but the translating did not always go smoothly. One morning Emma did something that angered Joseph. When he went upstairs to work he could not translate a single syllable so long as he was irritated with his wife. He finally walked outside and into the orchard where he made supplication to the Lord. When he came back about an hour later he asked Emma to forgive him. The translation then proceeded, but Joseph had learned that the Lord watched out for Emma's interests too. On June 11, 1829, Joseph obtained a copyright for the Book of Mormon. Oliver had copied the manuscript by August and, with Emma and Joseph, took the transcript to E. B. Grandin, the publisher in Palmyra. Funding publication of the book became the next hurdle. Martin Harris applied for a $1,300 loan but was refused when the bank learned its purpose. Hiram Smith urged Joseph to sell the copyright for his book to raise the needed cash. According to David Whitmer, Joseph used the seer stone to learn that Hiram Page, the Whitmer's brother-in-law, and Oliver Cowdery were to travel to Toronto where someone would meet them ready to buy the copyright. The two men made the trip but returned empty-handed and disillusioned. When they confronted Joseph, he replied, Some revelations are of God, some are of man, and some are of the devil. Emma would one day conclude the same thing about a particular revelation concerning a new order of marriage. Finally, Martin Harris mortgaged his farm for $3,000 to guarantee 5,000 copies of the book and had to sell part of it to meet the bill. His wife left him, complaining. Martin Harris was once industrious, attentive to his domestic concerns and thought to be worth about $10,000. Whether the Mormon religion be true or false, I leave the world to judge, for its effects upon Martin Harris have been to make him more cross, turbulent, and abusive to me. Oliver Cowdery supervised the printing process, overseeing the punctuation of the text as the printer set the type. Sometimes he spotted errors as the pages rolled from the press and stopped to make corrections. This resulted in differences among the copies of the first edition. In his preface Joseph allowed for inconsistencies, and now, if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men, wherefore, condemn not the things of God. Emma and Joseph returned to harmony where Emma could now tell her family the book actually would be published. Through the winter Joseph left Emma twice while he went to Palmyra to deal with problems related to the book. When the last book of Mormon came off the press in March 1830, Emma and Joseph were elated. Joseph contemplated the next step, the establishment of a church organization that would enable him to teach the new gospel formally. His interest in organizing a church kept him away from her and the farm with increasing frequency and for longer periods of time. Joseph met with friends and neighbors in the home of David Whitmer's father, Peter, on Tuesday, April 6, 1830. The service consisted of prayers, blessings of some already baptized, and the Lord's Supper, which they termed the sacrament. During the business part of the meeting, Joseph organized the Church of Jesus Christ with six members as required by New York law. Apparently, Emma had remained in harmony on the farm, for accounts that name the other women present make no mention of her. A number of people were baptized into the church that same day, including a members of Joseph's family, but Emma's baptism took place two months later. Believing the church to be a restoration of all blessings, powers, and ecclesiastical authority given by Jesus Christ. They named themselves Latter-day Saints as opposed to the former-day saints of biblical times, often referring to themselves simply as saints. Outsiders, in derision, called the members Mormons or Mormonites, but acceptance of the nickname by church members soon took the sting out of the epithet. When the people questioned who would be their leader, some insisted Joseph ask the Lord. When the meeting ended, Joseph announced that the Lord had revealed that he himself should be called a seer, a translator, a prophet, an apostle of Jesus Christ. From this time Joseph was called the prophet, even by those outside the church, with varying degrees of respect. But to his followers he became the leader of Christ's church and the mouthpiece of God. These people believed they were establishing much more than a church. They were building the kingdom of God on earth. The procedures of the fledgling church originated with Joseph's statements, which he continued to attribute to the inspiration of God. He referred to their arrival as having a revelation. These instructions usually came in answer to specific problems or questions. They covered varied aspects of life, often called the recipient by name, 
exhorted him to do good, and gave explicit instructions. When talking of these revelations, Joseph used the word received, implying that they did not originate in his own mind but that God prompted him to speak or think a certain way about a subject at hand. When instructions changed as new commandments came or when policies were reversed, his followers believed the Lord gave these additional words through Joseph. They acted upon them and sometimes judged others' acts by the terms of the revelation. For those who witnessed Joseph's receiving of a revelation, the experience left a lasting impression. One witness wrote, at once his countenance changed and he stood mute. There was a searchlight within him, over every part of his body. I never saw anything like it on earth. He got so white that anyone who saw him would have thought he was transparent. Joseph viewed these revelations as light bursting upon the world. His position would become more powerful, extending into the temporal realm as well as the spiritual. David Whitmer wrote in subsequent years that he was uneasy about so much power being placed in one man, though he participated in the spiritual feast with great joy. In years to come. Those followers who saw Joseph as a man with a prophetic calling generally remained faithful, while those who saw him only as a prophet and deified him almost invariably found themselves disillusioned. After the organization of the church, Joseph returned to Harmony. Emma drove back to Colesville with him where a number of those who had been at the organizational meeting of the church were anticipating baptism. Emma, too, wanted to be baptized. On Saturday, June 26, the group piled rocks and logs across a nearby stream to dam water for a small pond to be used for baptisms the following morning. This ordinance represented the cleansing of sins, and assured the recipients that sins that burned their conscience with the exception of shedding innocent blood would be forgiven by a merciful God. The next step was for the elders of the church to lay hands on the head of every man and woman for confirmation as members of the church. Sometime Saturday night a group of townspeople crossed a field under cover of darkness and destroyed the dam. The next morning several of them slipped into the meeting. Afterward they cornered those heading toward the creek for baptism to talk them out of such nonsense. In this atmosphere of contention Emma and Joseph rose early on Monday morning, June 28, 1830, before their enemies knew of it. Joseph and his friends had repaired the dam. While enough water backed up behind the rough structure to start baptizing the thirteen converts who had planned to have the ordinance the day before, a mob gradually assembled. Oliver Cowdery and Emma stood waist deep in the pond. Raising his right hand until his arm formed a square, he said, Emma Hale Smith, having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The cool water rushed around Emma's head as Oliver submerged her, then lifted her out again. She had taken the official step that made her a part of her husband's work. The mob jeered, have you been washing sheep? When the rest were baptized, Emma and the others walked back to the knight's home with the crowd of nearly fifty milling around and harassing them. That evening, as friends began to gather for the confirmation ordinance, Emma was astounded to see a constable on the doorstep with a warrant for Joseph's arrest. He charged Joseph with being a disorderly person and setting the country in an uproar by preaching the Book of Mormon. She watched anxiously as the officer led her husband away. Emma made arrangements to stay with her sister Elizabeth, who had married Benjamin Wasson and was living between Colesville and Harmony. During the two days she waited in Elizabeth's home. The women in the area occasionally met at a church member's home to pray for Joseph's freedom. When Emma finally saw her husband again. He had eaten only crusts of bread and had been through two bizarre, impromptu trials at South Bainbridge and Colesville. Between Joseph's trials, his lawyer, John S. Reed, rode up to see Emma. He said Emma's face was wet with tears, and her very heartstrings were broken with grief. The local judicial systems were unable to convict him, but nevertheless Joseph had received rough and contemptuous treatment and been persecuted for what he believed and taught. Dismayed and shaken by the ordeal. Emma and Joseph went quietly back to Harmony. Emma, through Joseph, became the recipient of a revelation directed exclusively to her after their return from the Colesville arrest. Although Joseph occasionally mentioned women in his revelations, this one, which would be called the Elect Lady Revelation, is the only one addressed solely to a woman. Whether she heard it first as Joseph spoke the words, or whether he dictated the verses for Oliver Cowdery to write, Emma believed it to be a communication from God to her. The revelation addressed Emma warmly. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God while I speak unto you, Emma Smith, my daughter, it began. 
Then in recognition of her acceptance of the gospel it further explained, All who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. Thy sins are forgiven thee, the Lord assured her, Thou art an elect lady, whom I have called. She would learn God's will for her life and, if thou art faithful and walk in the paths of virtue before me, I will preserve thy life, and thou shalt receive an inheritance in Zion. Probably in reference to others viewing of the plates while Emma was not allowed to see them. The instructions continued, murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world. That single line urging Emma to murmur not would later give rise to speculation that Emma had complained of not seeing the record. Future writers would use that phrase to condemn Emma, but nothing in the elect lady revelation approaches the chastisements Joseph occasionally received. The revelation outlined Emma's responsibilities toward Joseph. Let thy soul delight in thy husband and the glory which shall come upon him go with him at the time of his going be for a comfort in his afflictions and offer consoling words in the spirit of meekness. Thou shalt be ordained under Joseph's hand to expound scriptures and to exhort the church, the words continued. Thy time shall be given to writing and to learning much. Lay aside the things of this world, and seek for the things of a better, the revelation said. Then it gave Emma two specific assignments. The first was to act as scribe for her husband. The second gave Emma responsibility to make a selection of sacred hymns, which is pleasing unto me to be held in my church. My soul delighteth in the song of the heart, yea, the song of righteousness is a prayer unto me. The revelation ended with a phrase of hope, lift up thy head and rejoice, and cleave unto the covenants which thou hast made. It urged Emma to beware of pride and to keep the commandments continually. A crown of righteousness thou shalt receive, and except thou do this, where I am you cannot come. The elect lady revelation singled Emma out and marked her as worthy of particular approbation from the Lord. It fitted her natural talents and abilities. Her intellect, combined with her education, qualified her to act as Joseph's scribe, now most likely penning letters, revelations, and blessings. Her compassionate nature would express itself in her care for Joseph and others. The instructions to expound the scriptures and to exhort the church hinted of her future development as a leader. Emma sang as she worked and sang when she worshipped, compiling a hymnal would be a pleasure. Meanwhile, Isaac Hale had grown increasingly impatient with Joseph. He obviously knew that much of Emma's and Joseph's sustenance came from the kindness of friends. To see his daughter living off charity would not have set well with the old hunter, particularly when her husband was chasing angels and gold books. Furthermore, two years earlier Joseph had contracted with Isaac to buy the 13-acre farm where they were living. He still had not paid the $200. Isaac may have finally asked if or when he intended to make good on the mortgage, and in August Joseph paid in full. Where he got the money is unclear. Perhaps income from the Book of Mormon sales materialized, or friends intervened. But Isaac no doubt suspected it was not from Joseph's labors in the fields. Isaac Hale's disapproval did not interfere with Emma's and Joseph's practice of their faith. When Joseph Knight's son Newell and his wife Sally visited in Harmony, the two couples held a small religious service at home. The unruly crowd in Colesville had interrupted the service after Emma's baptism and she had not been confirmed. After sharing sacramental wine and bread, the men laid their hands on Emma's and Sally's heads and confirmed them members of the church. Afterward Joseph said, The Spirit of the Lord was poured out upon us, we praised the Lord God, and rejoiced exceedingly. About this same time a disgruntled Methodist preacher agitated against Joseph and his church. Some explanation for his opposition may be seen in interviews given by two of the Smith's neighbors. Ezra Pierce said, I pulled sticks with Joe for a gallon of brandy once at a log rolling. He was about my age. In answer to the query, did young Joe drink? Pierce answered, everybody drank them times. They would have it at huskings, and in the harvest field, and places of gathering, the smiths did not drink more than others. While this neighbor looked upon the use of alcohol with some tolerance, the Hales were probably inclined to follow the Methodist church's position, which supported abstinence from alcoholic drinks as opposed to the temperance advocated by many societies of the decades between 1820 and 1850. In 1816 the Methodist General Conference had moved that no station or local preacher shall use spirituous or malt liquor without forfeiting his ministerial character among us. Another neighbor commented that it was common then for everybody to drink, and to have a drink in the field, one time Joe 
while working for someone after he was married, drank too much boiled cider. He came in with his shirt torn. His wife felt bad about it, and when they went home, she put her shawl on him. Joseph claimed that the Methodist minister paid Isaac a visit after hearing that Emma's father had promised to protect her and Joseph from violence or slander. He repeated falsehoods of the most shameful nature, which turned the old gentleman and his family so much against us, that they would no longer promise us protection nor believe our doctrines. With this final erosion of family support the minister had found fertile ground for his rumors and innuendos. Life for Emma and Joseph became increasingly difficult in harmony. Late in August 1830 Newell Knight's wagon rumbled into the yard again. He had come to help move Emma and Joseph to the Whitmer farm in Fayette, New York. They loaded a few belongings in the wagon locked the door behind them and left the rest of their furniture inside. Emma bade farewell to her parents. It was a difficult parting for her. She loved the peaceful Susquehanna, the law of Ichabod Swamp, and the hardwood forests. She had come back nearly two years earlier anticipating much. The baby who had stirred inside her then lay buried near the house. Hope for a reconciliation between her father and her husband had evaporated. Emma would never see harmony. Her mother, or her fur there again. General excitement and a warm welcome greeted Emma and Joseph in fact where Lucy and Joseph, senior, soon joined them. Strife in Manchester had caused them to leave. Emma was pregnant again, and ill. Her mother-in-law kept watch over her and noted that Emma's health at this time was quite delicate, yet she did not favour herself on this account. But whatever her hands found to do, she did with her might until she went so far beyond her strength that she brought upon herself a heavy fit of sickness, which lasted for weeks, and, although her strength was exhausted, still her spirits were the same, which, in fact, was always the case with her, even under the most trying circumstances. When the older Smiths arrived, Emma and Joseph needed the furniture left behind in harmony and sent a friend to get it. That fall Emma sewed clothing for four missionaries who were to preach through Ohio and Missouri. The success of that journey would draw Emma to Ohio. The first hint of the move came a few months later at a meeting in the Elder Smith's home. Two strangers entered the room and found seats. When Joseph finished his sermon one of them stood up. He was Edward Partridge, a hatter from Painesville, Ohio. His companion was Sidney Rigdon formerly Partridge's Campbellite minister, now a new convert to the Mormon church. Partridge said he and Rigdon had been to Manchester and Palmyra looking for Joseph and had inquired into the character of the man. The Smith's neighbors told him that the family had a good reputation in the community until their son deceived them about his discovery of the Book of Mormon plates. Partridge had walked around the farm in Manchester and noticed the obvious signs of thrift and industry. The only objections he found among the neighbors were related to the family's religious beliefs which he was now ready to embrace, if, he said, Joseph will baptize me. Joseph soon obliged. The two men explained that Parley Page Pratt, one of the missionaries Emma had sown for, had visited his friends Sidney and Phoebe Rigdon in Kirtland. Rigdon was thirty-seven and a handsome man, above average in height and a little portly. A compelling speaker and trained minister of the Disciples of Christ, he was a follower of Alexander Campbell who attempted to reform Baptist theology and return to the ancient order of things. When Parley Pratt announced that the Book of Mormon opened the door to divine authority, Sidney Rigdon allowed some Mormon missionaries to address his congregation. Within two weeks Pratt had baptized Rigdon, and in a month the nucleus of 130 church members lived in the county, many of whom came from Rigdon's former congregation. Sidney Rigdon approached Edward Partridge about his new faith. He and his wife Lydia were respected members of the community with relatively large property holdings. The couple had joined the Campbellite church through the influence of Rigdon, now he introduced them to the new restored church. Lydia was baptized, but Edward wanted to know more about Joseph Smith before he made his commitment. Determined to see the leader of this new religion for themselves, Sidney Rigdon and Edward Partridge traveled through unusually cold weather to Fat where they stayed through December and into January listening to Joseph's teachings. Their enthusiastic report about the new converts in Ohio beckoned Emma and Joseph Westwood. Gathering in Ohio 1830-1834, the winter of 1830-1831 was one of the most severe recorded in the eastern United States. The December snows were soft and deep 
What little melting occurred was soon covered over by storms that maintained a four-foot level through February. Freezing rains in January enabled the wolves to run on the crust while heavier game sank through helplessly. Deer and elk could not find browse of twigs and shrubs. That winter the elk disappeared from the plains of Illinois and Missouri, never to return. A storm covered the breadth of the United States, blizzards welled snow until familiar landmarks disappeared and streams could be recognized only by breaks in the forests. Newspapers suspended publication when the males could not go out. Human life maintained a precarious balance. On January 2nd of that winter, Joseph announced at a church conference that he had received new revelations commanding the entire group to sell or rent their farms and move 300 miles to Kirtland, Ohio. The revelations promised them power from on high great riches, a land of milk and honey and an inheritance for them and their children forever. The village of Kirtland, which lay northeast of Cleveland, boasted a gristmill, a sawmill, a hotel, and the Gilbert and Whitney Mercantile store. Most of the thousand or so settlers were of New England stock. Before long Emma sat with Joseph, Sidney Rigdon, and Edward Partridge in a crowded sleigh, gliding over the frozen roads toward Kirtland. She was now twenty-six years old, uncomfortable from her pregnancy and still weak from an extended illness in December. They rested briefly at the home of her sister-in-law, Sophronia Smith Stoddard, but for the remainder of the month-long journey the travelers sought public houses or relied on the hospitality of farmers. On February 1, 1831, the sleigh came to a stop in front of the Gilbert and Whitney store in Kirtland. Joseph jumped out, strode into the store, and thrust his hand out to the proprietor. Newell K. Whitney, thou art the man. He boomed. The astonished Whitney parried for time. You have the advantage of me, he replied. El could not call you by name as you have me. I am Joseph, the prophet, came the response. You have prayed me here, now what do you want of me? A few evenings earlier Newell and Elizabeth Whitney had prayed fervently for religious instructions. Elizabeth said a voice told them to prepare to receive the word of the Lord for it is coming. They accepted Joseph as the embodiment of the Lord's instruction. Whitney's partner, Algernon Sidney Gilbert, invited the Smiths to stay with his family and, while new friends helped transfer the travelers' belongings to a wagon, Joseph went ahead with him. Emma's driver started the horses down the hill toward the Gilbert's house. Suddenly the wagon slid sideways, lurched, and overturned, throwing Emma in the snow. Her scream brought Joseph bolting from Gilbert's home to help. She was not hurt and when the wagon was righted she and Joseph went to the house to choose a room. Emma could see that the family was already crowded. Henry Rollins, his mother, and his sister Mary Elizabeth also lived there. Emma declined the Gilbert's offer, and Elizabeth Whitney took the Smiths into her own home for several weeks. Disappointed that Emma and Joseph found other lodging, Henry Rollins reported that none of our rooms suited her. A generous warm-hearted woman, Elizabeth Ann Whitney became Emma's first friend in Kirtland. Six-year-old Sarah Ann Whitney and young Mary Elizabeth Rollins came to regard their prophet Joseph with awe and wonderment. Emma, not suspecting the role the two young girls would eventually play in her life, watched as Joseph gave eleven-year-old Mary Elizabeth Rollins his appreciative attention when he discovered she had eagerly read a book of Mormon and had begun to memorize part of it. Newell and Elizabeth Whitney felt pleased and honored to have Emma and Joseph in their home, but Elizabeth's elderly Aunt Sarah pursed her lips at the thought of a self-appointed preacher under her roof. After a month Joseph became increasingly conscious of Emma's impending confinement and he announced a revelation. It stated, it is meet that my servant Joseph Smith, June, should have a house built, in which to live and translate. In obedience to the commandment, Isaac Morley began building a cabin on his land about a mile north of Kirtland. Emma and Joseph moved into it in early spring. Though small, the single room was private, and it was Emma's. She began housekeeping with few provisions and little furniture, for they had abandoned almost everything in New York. On April 30th to 1831st, Emma's gave birth to twins in the cabin. The gentle Morley girls assisted with the delivery and helped with the housework. The infants, a boy and a girl, were probably premature and lived only three hours. Emma and Joseph named the twins Thodois and Louisa, then buried them. In a six-month period, Emma had made the difficult break with her parents, endured a strenuous trip, adjusted to a new town, and established her own home. After only four years of marriage, all three of her children lay in graves. The day after Emma's twins died, Julia Clapp Murdoch died in childbirth, 
leaving her newborn twins and three other young children motherless. John Murdoch considered the grim difficulties of caring for his five small children alone and concluded that he must divide his family among his friends. The survival of his newborn twins, named Joseph and Julia, depended on a woman who could nurse them. When they were nine days old Emma took them as her own. This adoption did not separate the natural further from his children, as John Murdoch boarded at Emma's home periodically over the years. Nevertheless, Emma and Joseph did not tell the children they were adopted and the community recognized and accepted the children as Smiths. The same evening that Emma received her new twins, she greeted her mother-in-law with surprise and relief for she had thought that Lucy was dead. Local newspapers had reported a boat loaded with immigrating members of the church from Waterloo, New York, had sunk in Lake Erie with all drowned. Lucy led this group in much the same way as she had led her family to New York when Joseph was still a child. He had often seen his mother in this role, and Emma would learn that he expected her to exercise similar responsibility, much to the chagrin of some of his associates who would bristle to see Emma make decisions on her own. Lucy's Waterloo immigrants arrived in Kirtland almost penniless. The influx of destitute saints taxed the resources of those with property. Economically, no room existed for a large group of displaced people. Pressure to find another place to settle mounted against the Mormons in Kirtland until Joseph finally found a solution. Zion. Emma had frequently heard Joseph discuss an unknown gathering place. He called Zion. Parley Page, Pratt and Oliver Cowdery described Missouri in glowing terms. Joseph mulled over the reports, decided to investigate the area himself, and told the Colesville Saints to leave immediately for the 800-mile trek to Missouri. They prepared to move again on faith and little else. Joseph, Sidney Rigdon, Martin Harris, Edward Partridge, and Sidney Gilbert and family also left. Gilbert expected to establish a new store for dry goods and groceries in Missouri while his partner Newell Whitney continued with the store in Kirtland. William W. Phelps, who would become Emma's associate in a publishing venture, also joined the group. In Missouri Joseph saw space for a Mormon community in the midst of the rough frontier settlements. By revelation he announced that this area was Zion and that the Mormons who came there should purchase property, build homes, and prepare to stay. He dedicated a site for a temple near the small town of Independence and laid the cornerstone for the future building. The designation of the area as Zion and the temple site induced Mormons to immigrate to Missouri. The Colesville Saints arrived in July, and for the next eight years the Mormon settlements and interests would be separated by the 800 miles between Ohio and Missouri. M remained in the cabin at the Morley settlement throughout the summer. Certainly, the twins demanded care. But this may have been her first opportunity to work on the hymn book mentioned as her responsibility in the elect lady revelation. When her husband returned from Missouri in September 1831, much of the social life in Kirtland again revolved around Emma and Joseph. A stream of visitors, the skeptics, the curious, the seekers, and the believers, came to see Joseph. He gradually developed a strong style of oratory that could hold audiences captive for hours. They sometimes laughed sometimes cried, and often accepted his message. Words spread that spiritual phenomena, including miraculous healings, were part of this new religion. Curiosity about this brought John and Elsa Johnson to Emma and Joseph. At a meeting someone drew attention to Elsa's withered arm, long rendered useless by rheumatism. Here is Mrs. Johnson with a lame arm, has God given any power to man now on the earth to cure her? Joseph rose and walked to her, taking her arm gently in his hands. He said, Woman, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command thee to be whole. Elsa raised her arm above her head and moved it around with no pain. The next day she washed clothes with full use of the arm. As a result, the Johnson family, as well as a Methodist minister, Ezra Booth, joined the church. By the time Emma and Joseph met the Johnsons, Joseph had begun compiling his revelations. He believed that some sections of the Bible had either been lost or misinterpreted over the centuries of translations. He labored over revisions in the biblical text while Sidney Rigdon wrote the corrections in the margins and between the lines. But people frequently interrupted Joseph's work in the crowded cabin at the Morley settlement. Dissatisfied with living the revealed law of consecration, a communal system designed to care for the destitute who straggled into Kirtland with no means of support, 
Church members came to Joseph to complain. Members of the church signed over their assets to a group represented by a lay bishop. Each had promised to labor faithfully and was promised in return the receipt of supplies according to need. With increasing frequency, Joseph was called on to arbitrate disputes. When house 36 miles south of Kirtland near a settlement called Hiram, the Smiths accepted. John Johnson had built the large New England colonial-style house five years earlier but instead of chimneys at either end he had built a central complex of fireplaces. Johnson's acreage and buildings showed evidence of hard work and good care from his four grown sons, John, Jr., Luke, Olmsted, and Lyman, and one daughter, Nancy Marinda, age 16. Only Olmsted had refused to join the church. Emma, Joseph, and the twins moved in with the Johnson family on September 2, 1831. They lived in two rooms, one on either side of the giant kitchen on the main floor. Emma and Joseph slept in the south room, and the twins occupied the room to the north. Emma soon cleaned, cooked, and mended alongside Elsa and Nancy Marinda. Emma baked in the brick bustle oven built in the fireplace wall. She shoveled hot coals into the oven, then stoked them to a flame. Once the fire was roaring, she shoved the door forward against the lintel, forcing the smoke and fumes up the flue. To test the temperature, she held her hand in the oven and counted slowly. If her hand felt uncomfortably hot in 12 seconds, the oven was hot, it was quick in 18 seconds, moderate at 24 seconds, and warm at 30 seconds. When the oven was hot Emma removed the coals and placed her bread dough on the bricks inside. Then she pushed the door in as far as possible, closing the oven and shutting off the flue. Although cooking required effort, one net well at the Johnsons. But the quiet peace of the Johnson farm was an illusion. In November Ezra Booth charged Joseph with a want of sobriety, prudence, and stability, a spirit of lightness and levity, and temper of mind easily irritated, and an habitual proneness to jesting and joking. To Booth, these actions were unbecoming in a prophet. He accused Joseph of having revelations too conveniently for them to originate from God. Booth's friend Simmons Ryder misunderstanding the law of consecration, claimed to have found papers outlining a plot to take people's property from them and place it under Joseph's control. When the Johnson boys saw farmers sell their holdings and consecrate their profits to the church, they feared that their expected inheritance would go the same way. John Johnson was respected in the community, but the neighbors grew bold and devised a way to circumvent Johnson and reach Joseph Smith in Johnson's own house. A barrel of whiskey fortified their courage one night as winter's hold began to break. In the big white farmhouse Emma and Joseph tended the eleven-month-old twins, who had been feverish for days with a hard case of measles. Neither parent had slept much and on the night of March 24, 1832, Emma insisted that Joseph take their son to the children's room and rest with him on the trundle bed. Emma stayed in her own bed with Julia beside her. Exhausted, she fell into a heavy sleep, undisturbed by a light tapping at the window. She did not hear the front door open nor did she hear the Johnson boys creep upstairs to bar the entrance to their father's room so he could not get out. Suddenly the door burst open. Emma awoke with a start then screamed when she saw a mob of men with blackened faces attempting to carry her husband out of the house. The group, led by Ezra Booth and Simmons Ryder, numbered about fifty or sixty. They overpowered the struggling, kicking Joseph and staggered into the yard with him. An undocumented account says the terrified Emma grabbed both babies and ran to the barn to hide, perhaps fearing rape by the violent, drunken men. Whether she remained in the house or hid in the barn, Emma could hear oaths and heavy grunts as Joseph fought to free himself in the yard. One man held a flickering lantern fashioned from a gallon can. The light bobbed and swung as it lit up portions of the men's faces. The delicate diamond, heart, and crescent-shaped perforations in the tin glowed softly in contrast to the ugly brutality silhouetted by the lantern. Joseph managed to get one leg free and kicked so hard he sent a strong man sprawling. The man picked himself up and shook a bloody fist in Joseph's face. God damn ye, I'll fix ye. He grabbed Joseph by the throat and choked him into unconsciousness. The mob moved out of the yard until the light flickered in a field and the curses were muffled by the distance. Joseph regained consciousness to see Sidney Rigdon on the ground where the men had dragged him by his heels over the frozen earth. Joseph assumed he was dead, fearing the same fate. He pleaded for his own life. God damn ye, call on your God for help, we'll show ye no mercy. Was the reply. The violent men carried him farther into the field 
never letting his feet touch the ground for fear he would have leverage to free himself. They tore his clothes from his body, leaving only his collar, then laid him out on the frozen ground and called for a Dr. Denison. Denison, a respected physician, had been induced to come along for the purpose of castrating Joseph, but when he saw the helpless man stretched out before him he refused to perform the mutilation. Joseph overheard snatches of the conversation and concluded they were deciding whether or not to kill him. One man dug at Joseph's flesh with his fingernails, muttering, God damn ye, that's the way the Holy Ghost falls on folks. Another cried, Simmons, Simmons, where's the tar bucket? L don't know where it is, Eli's left it, came the answer. They sent someone to fetch the crude bucket made from a hollowed out log with a rope handle. Let's tar up his mouth. Joseph wrenched his head away when they attempted to jam the tar paddle into his mouth. Someone tried to force a vial between his lips, but it shattered, breaking one of Joseph's teeth. They poured tar over his head, smeared it down his body, rolled him in an open feather tick and then left him lying on the frozen ground. Joseph later said that his spirit seemed to leave his body, and during the period of insensibility he consciously stood over his own body, feeling no pain, but seeing and hearing all that transpired. Joseph clawed the tar from his nose and mouth until he could breathe better, then lay motionless until the vertigo diminished. In the distance he discerned two lights and stumbled toward them. In the house Elsa and John Johnson freed themselves from the bedroom. John was too late to help Joseph, Elsa calmed Emma and helped with the feverish babies. When Joseph appeared at the dimly lit doorway the tar looked like blood to Emma. Thinking he had been torn to pieces, she fainted. Joseph called for a blanket, wrapped it around himself and went inside. Throughout the night friends softened the tar with lard and scraped it from Joseph's battered body. The next morning Emma watched as he calmly delivered his usual Sunday sermon from the front steps of the Johnson home, the broken tooth adding a sibilant lisp to his words. Among the crowd gathered in the yard were several men who had raided the house the night before, including one who had supplied the mob with a barrel of whiskey to raise their spirits. That afternoon Joseph baptized three people. Several of the mob would eventually be baptized. When Joseph visited Sidney Rigdon the next day he found him delirious and calling for his razor, threatening to kill his wife and Joseph. Rigdon did not regain his strength for some time, and there were those who believed that the blows he received on his head affected him for the rest of his life. The victim who suffered most, however, was not Joseph with his bruises and scratches, or the delirious Sidney Rigdon. It was the adopted baby, Joseph. Already weakened by a difficult case of measles and the accompanying high fever, the cold night air aggravated the child's condition. Through the next six days and nights Emma hovered over her baby with growing apprehension. On Friday, March 29, 1832, Emma realized her worst fears as she watched life ebb from his tiny body. She and Joseph buried the fourth of their first five children. Emma grieved alone for the dead child. Joseph had delayed his departure for church conference in Missouri and now, three days after the baby's death, he left with Newell K. Whitney and Sidney Rigdon. The Johnson home was still in turmoil over the violence of March 24. Joseph and Newell assured Emma that she should stay at the Whitney home while they were gone. Unfortunately, Newell neglected to tell his wife. When Emma arrived, Elizabeth Ann Whitney was ill in a bed at the back of the house. Her elderly aunt Sarah answered the door and turned Emma away. Elizabeth's aunt had always lived with them, and she assumed by right of years that she had a say in the family affairs. While the Whitneys regarded Emma's and Joseph's presence in their home as the fulfillment of a vision. Aunt Sarah looked with skepticism at all preachers and did not want Joseph to make her family the dupes of priestcraft. When Elizabeth Ann learned what her aunt had done she was chagrined. I would have shared the last morsel with either of them, she said. Humiliated, Emma found another place to stay and said nothing for fear it would injure feelings. She told Lucy thirteen years later and even then she was not able to conceal her mortification. Emma spent the summer of 1832 shuttling between the homes of Frederick G. Williams, Reynolds Cahoon, and the senior Smiths. Oblivious to Emma's circumstances, Joseph chided her in a letter, Sister Whitney wrote a letter to her husband which was very cheering and being unwell myself at that time and filled with much anxiety it would have been very consoling to me to have received a few lines from you but as you did not take the trouble. I will try to be contented with my lot knowing that God is my friend in him I shall find comfort, but Lucy commented, 
During Joseph's absence Emma was not idle for she labored faithfully for the interest of those with whom she stayed cheering them by her lively and spirited conversation her whole heart was in the work of the Lord, and she felt no interest except for the church and the cause of truth. Whatever her hands found to do she did with her might and did not ask the selfish question shall I be benefited any more than anyone else? Her countenance always wore a happy expression of zeal and let her own privations be what they might. What Emma may not have revealed until it became obvious was that she was pregnant again. When Martin Harris carried word to Missouri that the families in Kirtland were well, Joseph wrote to Emma that the news greatly cheered our hearts and revived our spirits we thank our heavenly Father for his goodness unto all of you. Hiram's family was not so fortunate. Jerushal had followed Hiram to Kirtland with the Colesville Saints. Late in May her daughter Mary, not yet three, became ill and her health steadily failed. She died in Hiram's arms on May 29, 1832. Joseph wrote to Emma, I was grieved to hear that Hiram had lost his little child. I think we can in some degree sympathize with him but we all must be reconciled to our lots and say the will of the son be done. Four years later, in January 1836, he would receive a comforting revelation for parents who lost children in death and I also beheld that all children who die before they arrive at the years of accountability, are saved in the celestial kingdom of heaven. While in Missouri, Joseph called a meeting to discuss publishing efforts of the church, his revelations would appear in a book of commandments, supplementary scripture to the Book of Mormon and the Bible. He assigned W. W. Phelps to correct and print hymns that Emma had selected. After the meeting Joseph started home to Kirtland with Newell Whitney and Sidney Rigdon. Part way through Ohio the stagecoach horses bolted and Whitney leapt from the door. His leg caught in the wheel spokes and broke in several places. Rigdon went on ahead while Joseph remained with Newell in an inn and cared for him until the leg mended. At some time during their four-week stay Joseph became very sick and vomited so hard he dislocated his jaw. He believed he had been poisoned and that Newell healed him by laying hands on his head in the name of the Lord. Joseph would suspect poisoning again in his life but this may have been food poisoning or the beginning of a chronic illness. On his return Joseph and Emma again lived briefly at the Johnson farm, but they needed a place of their own. Newell Whitney offered them three storage rooms above his store. This arrangement left Emma space enough to take in boarders and, except for infrequent intervals, she would earn money in this way for the remaining 47 years of her life. Emma also began a lifelong practice of taking in domestic helpers usually young women who needed a place to live. They washed clothes and did household chores in return for board and room. Emma's friendship with these women usually became landmarks in their lives. In the early fall Joseph and Newell went to New York City. Concerned over Emma as she entered the last few weeks of her pregnancy, Joseph asked Hiram to watch over her until he returned. In October Emma received a letter from the Pearl Street boarding house in New York City. This day I have been walking through the most splendid part of the city of New York, Joseph began, but he said he did not waste time contemplating the sights. The thought of 200,000 unconverted souls walking around in close proximity filled him with determination to preach. Joseph also found himself excited by the tall buildings and strange inventions and concluded that God was not displeased with luxury but rather that the Lord would rejoice in works calculated to make men comfortable and wise and happy. Joseph reasoned that the only iniquity involved in enjoying luxury would be to deny God the glory. This attitude would remain with him from that time, earth and its legitimate pleasures were to be enjoyed. Joseph also wrote of his homesickness. After beholding all that I had any desire to behold, I returned to my room to meditate and calm my mind and behold, the thoughts of home, of Emma and Julia, rushes upon my mind like a flood and I would wish for a moment to be with them. My breast is filled with all the feelings and tenderness of a parent and a husband. Sensing Emma's apprehension at the impending birth of their child, Joseph expressed his concern. I'll feel as if I wanted to say something to you to comfort you in your peculiar trial and present affliction. I hope God will give you strength that you may not faint. I pray God to soften the hearts of those around you to be kind to you and take the burden of your shoulders as much as possible and not afflict you. I feel for you for I know your state and that other do not, but you must comfort yourself knowing that God is your friend in heaven and that you have one true and living friend on earth your husband. Joseph and Newell Whitney traveled to Kirtland on the 1st of November, having had no recent news of home. On November 6, 1832, 
Emma lay exhausted in an upstairs room over the Gilbert and Whitney store. She had ended a painful labor and delivery at two o'clock that morning. The women who came in and out freshened the room and cared for the new baby. If Emma heard the baby cry and fret, the sound of life would be reassuring. A disturbance on the street and staircase signaled Newell's and Joseph's arrival from New York. You have a son, someone said to Joseph and this one would live. Emma and Joseph named their baby Joseph. Then the community began sorting out the names. Joseph, Sr., became Father Smith. Joseph, Jr., was already brother Joseph. This baby would become young Joseph, and late Joseph. From the first this child resembled his mother with his brown eyes, dark hair, and olive skin. Two days after young Joseph's birth three men arrived in Kirtland and inquired after Joseph at the Whitney store. They were directed through the neighborhood until the sound of chopping led them to Joseph, who was cutting trees. Two brothers, Brigham and Joseph Young, and their friend Hebesy Kimple had come in search of a prophet, that they found one cutting wood may have surprised them. Emma was resting with the two-day-old baby at her side when Joseph took Brigham and the others to meet her. Brigham Young was 31 when he arrived in Kirtland. Born in Whittingham, Vermont, in 1801, he was the ninth child of a stern moralistic father who fought the rocky soil of Vermont with no more success than the Smiths had. In 1904 he moved to central New York. Because the family lived close to poverty, young Brigham mastered many trades in order to earn a penny. His skilled hands built furniture, repaired clocks, and made windows. He was a compact, powerfully built man with gray eyes, deep set under a wide forehead. His hair was sandy brown and his face clean shaven. His wife had died earlier that year, leaving him two daughters. When preaching in the area Samuel Smith had left her Book of Mormon with another of Brigham's brothers, Brigham borrowed it and read it, then converted his brother. Brigham and Joseph struck up an immediate friendship. The evening the three men arrived a group came to Joseph's house and conversed freely on topics dealing with the doctrines of the kingdom. When Joseph asked Brigham Young to pray, Brigham spoke in tongues using strange sounds and unfamiliar words. The others looked at Joseph in some perplexity, for this type of spiritual phenomenon was not common to them. It was Joseph's first experience with the puzzling speech and he called it pure Adamic and stated that it was of God. Speaking in tongues spread through the Pennsylvania branches of the church first, then occurred in Menden, New York. Brigham Young brought it to Kirtland. The practice became a part of the saints' worship, particularly among women until well into the next century. After meeting Joseph, Brigham arranged his affairs and moved his two daughters to Kirtland along with Violet and Heber C. Kimball. As the church expanded the missionary efforts increased. Joseph established a school to train men in the new doctrines as well as English, Latin, and geography. This school of the elders met, according to Brigham Young, in a small room situated over Emma's kitchen. While the men's desire for more education could not be faulted, the more mundane aspects of human affairs invariably appeared. Young said that when they assembled together in this room after breakfast, the first thing they did was to light their pipes, and while smoking, talk about the great things of the kingdom, and spit all over the room, and as soon as the pipe was out of their mouths a large chew of tobacco would then be taken. Often when the prophet entered the room to give the school instructions he would find himself in a cloud of tobacco smoke. The situation in the room was probably an example of the conditions that the Kirtland Temperance Society opposed. Founded in 1830, it was not predominantly Mormon, but somewhat among its members. Temperance societies worked to abolish ardent spirits and also condemned the use of alcohol, tobacco, and the eating of too much meat. Without question this larger social movement affected the Mormons. Thus Emma, faced almost daily with having to clean so filthy a floor as was left by the men chewing tobacco, spoke to Joseph about the matter. David Whitmer's account supports Brigham Young's description. Some of the men were excessive chewers of the filthy weed, and their disgusting slobbering and spitting caused Mrs. Smith to make the ironical remark that it would be a good thing if a revelation could be had declaring the use of tobacco a sin, and commanding its suppression. Emma had support among the women. Whitmer further reports, the matter was taken up and joked about. One of the brethren suggested that the revelation should also provide for a total abstinence from tea and coffee drinking, intending this as a counter dig at the sisters. Joseph made the issue the subject of prayer, and the word of wisdom was the result. Joseph's revelation came, showing forth the order and will of God in the temporal salvation of all saints in the last days.
it advised against the use of strong drinks or tobacco and would someday mark the Mormons quite distinctively in their religious habits. The word of wisdom sometimes made Emma's role as the prophet's wife take an interesting turn, for new members expected her standards to meet their own expectations. On one occasion an old lady drove up to the prophet's house, wanting to look at God's mouthpiece before she had even washed the dust from her eyes. Emma offered her a cup of strong tea to revive her for she had traveled far over rutty roads. And to be sure she did smack her lips over the cup, but when she went about town she whispered that Emma did not keep the word of wisdom, and if Joseph couldn't control his own household, she left the church and left it in company. Other defections had more serious consequences for Emma. Dr. Philastus Hurlbut established himself as a physician, but his name, Dr came from his parents in the superstitious belief that as the seventh son he possessed supernatural powers. Hurlbut went on a mission but the church disfellowshipped him for using obscenity to a young girl. When Joseph allowed him a hearing, he confessed, was re-established, then boasted that he had outsmarted Joseph Smith's God. The council cut him off from the church. Hurlbut declared himself an enemy of the Mormons and went back to the Palmyra and Harmony areas where he located about a hundred residents willing to sign statements against the Smiths. Joseph read the publicized statements and denounced them as the efforts of Satan. In return, Hurlbut publicly threatened Joseph's life. Hurlbut sold his affidavits to Eba D. Howe, editor of the Painesville, Ohio, Telegraph, for five hundred dollars. Howe then corresponded with Emma's father, Isaac Hale, in an apparent attempt to rid his family of the stigma of Joseph's reputation. Isaac had already published his own denunciation in a local newspaper, the Susquehanna Register, on May 1, 1834. He gave Howe permission to use it. Hale reiterated his view that Joseph did not keep his promise to avoid peepstones and work on his farm. I conscientiously believe that the whole Book of Mormon so-called, is a silly fabrication of falsehood and wickedness, got up for speculation, and with design to dupe the credulous and unwary and in order that its fabricators may live upon the spoils of those who swallow deception, he stated. When Howe published his collection as Mormonism unveiled, he included Isaac's judgment. The book opened old wounds for Emma. Circulation of the denunciation from Joseph's father-in-law had great impact on those unfamiliar with the previous struggle between the two men. No doubt existed in Emma's mind that her father considered her duped. While Herbert stirred up animosities in Kirtland, Life became increasingly difficult for the saints in Missouri. Tensions had been building there for some time that would affect Emma and the church. As President Andrew Jackson's policies expelled Indians from their ancestral lands along the Ohio River, they moved through Missouri to the high arid plains beyond the Mississippi. To the original settlers, these Indians were savages crossing their land. The Mormons, on the other hand, saw part of the little gathering of Israel in the western migration of the Indians and felt free to befriend them. W. W. Phelps's enthusiastic editorials in the Mormon newspaper, The Evening and Morning Star, concerning the religious implications of the gathering Indians only fueled the settlers' growing anger. Some Missouri citizens had come from the south and brought slaves with them. They passed laws designed to keep free blacks out of the state. When free black members of the church tried to gather in Zion with the other saints, white authorities refused them entry across the border unless they could prove citizenship in another state. William W. Phelps attempted to explain the law in an editorial in his paper in July 1833. He printed an extract from the state law and exhorted, Great care should be taken to obey the law. The saints must shun every appearance of evil. But his next sentence infuriated the local populace. As to slaves, we have nothing to say, in connection with the wonderful events of this age much is doing towards abolishing slavery, and colonizing the blacks in Africa. Anti-Mormon sentiment exploded. Before the month was over a manifesto circulated through the countryside. Signers of the document agreed to rid themselves of the Mormons peaceably if we can, by force if we must, and declared the formation of a military unit. They labeled the Mormons fanatics, tampering with our slaves and endeavoring to sow dissensions and raise seditions among them. We agree to use such means as may be sufficient to remove them, and to that end we each pledge each other our bodily powers, our lives, fortunes and sacred honors. Over a hundred people signed the document, including many public officials. The group met on Saturday, July 20, 1833, 
at the Independence Courthouse. Men then swarmed up the street to the press office of the Evening and Morning Star. A mob shoved William Phelps and his family into the street and threw their household belongings after them. Phelps watched several men hoist his press through a second-story window and toss trays of type after it. They ransacked his office and destroyed his papers, including the pages for the Book of Commandments. The crowd moved on and pillaged the store. Men grabbed bolts of colorful cloth and flipped them into streamers through the town square. Nine-year-old Emily Partridge and her sister Eliza, 13, were at a spring drawing water when the mob arrived at their house. From a short distance the girls watched angry men surround their father and envelop him in their midst, then move back toward town. Emily watched from the window. Finally she saw two men walk down the road. One carried a hat, coat and vest. The other was a grotesque figure and Emily ran upstairs to hide. The second man was her father, covered with tar mixed with acid and rolled in feathers. A few days later the family watched their large haystack burn as roaming bands struck fear through the Mormon settlements. In November violence broke out again, the mob wrestled down and beat several Mormon men while women and children cowered in adjacent thickets. They tied some men to trees and whipped them until blood ran down their bodies. Thirty or forty night riders came late in the evening of November 1st to David Bennett's home. He and his wife were both critically ill. They dragged Bennett from his bed and beat him severely with his own gun while his wife and children fled. Another night men with painted faces surrounded the house of Nancy and Edward Larkey, fired guns at random and told them to leave or be killed. Their young daughter buried her face in her mother's skirts and cried, Oh, Ma, what shall we do, what shall we do? Nancy Larkey held her close and calmly told her, Do not fear, if they kill us we will go to God, where they cannot come. By November the Mormons took up arms. A force led by David Whitmer left two men dead in a cornfield. When Lieutenant Governor Lilburn Boggs requested that both sides give up their arms, the Mormons complied but the Missouri settlers did not. Through November Mormon refugees gathered along the banks of the Missouri. The ferries could not keep up with the influx of homeless people, who made shelters of poles and blankets. In desperation the church members appealed to the Kirtland settlement for help. Joseph Smith announced a revelation that the members in Kirtland should help redeem Mormon losses in Missouri, prompting the organization of a strange military campaign, Zion's Camp. On February 24, 1834, the newly organized High Council, a governing body within the church, met at Temer's and Joseph's home and selected Joseph as commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel. The purpose of the army was the redemption of Zion, they were going to Missouri to redeem Mormon lands, spiritual life, loyalty, political power, and church organization. Emma cared for her borders and prepared supplies for the campaign while Joseph left for a trip to New York to recruit for Zion's camp until March. She and the other women outfitted the army with food and clothing and gathered provisions for the homeless Missouri Mormons. Joseph's cousin, George A. Smith, joined the group. At 17, George A.'s clothes for the journey were a pair of pantaloons made of striped bed ticking, two cotton shirts, a straw hat, a cloth coat and vest a blanket and a pair of new boots, and a knapsack made of apron check. His father proudly gave him a Queen's Arm musket to complete the outfit. The advance camp left Kirtland May 1, 1834. 204 men, 11 women, and 7 children in some 24 wagons eventually joined the trek. Emma and probably every other woman, child, and old man saw them off. The first file marched out carrying a white bandana inscribed peace. Then came armed men bearing every sort of weapon, most of the guns and swords were inherited from their Revolutionary War grandfathers. Those without muskets brandished huge butcher knives. Their plan, however, was to travel as farmers so that the Missourians would not learn of their march. Along with their weapons, they carried rakes, pitchforks, axes, and other farm implements. Brigham Young captained one company of twelve armed, with a gun, a bayonet, a dirk, an axe and some farm tools. Joseph, accompanied by a big bulldog, was the best equipped. He carried a pair of brass-barreled horse pistols with silver mountings, a fine sword, and a rifle, and traveled under the alias of Squire Cook. After the first day's march George A.S. striped pantaloons hung in tatters and he had sat on his straw hat. A chronic eye infection made him squint and tilt his head back to see. He did not look like a soldier, and possibly for that gathering in Ohio. The reason Joseph appointed him to speak to outsiders. In spite of the image he portrayed, 
George possessed a very tenacious and powerfully retentive memory, any person, or thing, he ever saw, or heard, once committed to memory. He seemed never to forget news of the company and the form of a thousand rumors raced ahead of them. The Missouri Intelligencer and Boone's Lick Advertiser reported that 600 Mormons armed with every kind of instrument of destruction from scalping knives to double-barreled rifles marched toward Missouri. Citizens across western Missouri began arming themselves. Emma waited in Kirtland for news of the camp's progress and sent letters to Joseph with friends traveling to Missouri. She received a letter from Joseph in May. I sit down in my tent to write a few lines to you to let you know that you are on my mind and that I am sensible of the duty of a husband and father and that I am well and I pray God to let his blessings rest upon you and the children and all that are around you until I return to your society, he told her. The few times you wrote and sent by the hand of Brother Lyman gave me satisfaction and comfort and I hope you will continue to communicate to me by your own hand for this is a consolation to me to converse with you in this way in my lonely moments which is not easily described. I must close for I cannot write on my knees sitting on the ground. Oh may the blessings of God rest upon you is the prayer of your husband until death. The next time Emma heard from Joseph he sent her money and advised her, I want you to make use of the money I send you in wisdom, for such things as you need, and make yourselves as comfortable and contented as you can and continue to pray to the Lord to hasten the day when we shall be permitted to behold each other's face again and enjoy the blessing of the family circle in peace and in righteousness. Joseph dictated much of his letter and his style became more flowery and less personal, our thoughts linger with inexpressible anxiety for the wives and our children are kindred according to the flesh who are entwined around our hearts, and also, our brethren and friends, our whole journey would be as a dream, and this would be the happiest period of all our lives. We learn on this journey how to travel, and we look with pleasing anticipation for the time to come, when we shall retrace our steps and take this journey again in the enjoyment and embrace of that society we so much love. Inside the camp, all did not always go as smoothly as Joseph described to Emma. Forty days of muddy roads, poor food, sporadic military discipline, fatigue, and petty bickering eroded their morale and shortened tempers. A sham battle near Decatur, Illinois, perked up almost everybody's spirits but Heber C. Kimball's. He had grabbed somebody's unsheathed sword and cut his hand. As Zion's camp entered Missouri a series of anti-climaxes prevented an actual battle with the Missourians, who outnumbered the forces from Kirtland. Rain-soaked ammunition and storm of huge hailstones discouraged the men. The Missourians dispersed and the men of Zion's camp prepared to stay temporarily at Rush Creek, five miles from Liberty. But there, on June 20, cholera stalked the camp choosing its victims with capricious and terrifying abandon. Cholera scourged the world from 1832 to 1834. No one understood how the bacteria spread and travelers unwittingly carried it with them. Zion's camp passed through infested communities where death carts were common sights, and bought food, accepted provisions, and drank from the polluted streams. Sometimes the terrific toxins in cholera brought agonizing suffering crowded into the few hours between the crisis of the disease and death. Other times, victims seldom lost consciousness until the merciful end came. Joseph, like many others, regarded disease and deformity as punishments meted out by an angry god. Some two weeks earlier he had called the camp together and told them that, because of disobedience, God had decreed that sickness should come upon the camp and that if they did not humble themselves, they should die like sheep with the rot. Death by cholera was an unbelievably severe sentence for minor pseudo-military infractions. The sufferers' cries and moans filled the whole camp. Men on guard fell with their guns in their hands. Joseph said he tried to heal the victims by the laying on of hands, but the disease seized him like the talons of a hawk. Fourteen members of the camp fell victim to the plague. Joseph disbanded the camp. Each man received a dollar fourteen and was to make his own way home to Kirtland. As the men sought help, people closed doors in their faces in fear of the disease. In despair they buried their friends on the bank of a small creek, unknowingly polluting the stream. What little news reached Emma in Kirtland was erroneous and slow arriving. On July 12 the Chardon Spectator announced that a body of well-armed Mormons, lead on by their great prophet, Joe Smith, lately attempted to cross the river into Jackson County a battle ensued, in which, Joe Smith was wounded in the leg, and the Mormons obliged to retreat, Joe Smith's limb was amputated, 
but he died three days after the operation. Until word filtered back, or until Joseph arrived in Kirtland two weeks later, Emma may have believed him dead. Seas of Tribulation 1834-1838 Emma greeted Joseph with relief when he returned in good health on August 1, 1834. Zion's camp had not redeemed lands in Missouri for the Mormons, although it assured the members that the Kirtland Saints cared for their welfare. Some church members viewed the expedition as Joseph's personal quest for empire. These men nursed their grievances and waited for others. The experience created firm and lasting bonds. When Joseph organized a quorum of twelve apostles, nine were among his most faithful supporters in Zion's camp. Often referred to simply as the twelve, they were to take the gospel to all nations, kindreds, tongues and people. Among the first members of the quorum were Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Orson Hyde, William E. McClellan, Parley Page, Pratt, and William Smith. Each would have an effect on decisions Emma would make later. Emma and the saints anticipated the construction of an unusual building that would provide a physical sanctuary for their spiritual needs. On June 1, 1833, Joseph had revealed the dimensions of the Kirtland Temple. Many saw in its expressions of the beauty lacking in most of their own homes. When Joseph pointed out the site, Hiram Smith enthusiastically grabbed a scythe and cut the wheat growing on it. He and Reynolds Cahoon dug the foundation trench and George A. Smith hauled the first load of stone from nearby quarries. One woman drove two yoke of cattle and hailed rock, while others helped in more traditional ways. Some made and mended clothing for the men laboring on the temple, some sewed curtains and wove carpets. Well, sisters, observed Joseph, you are always on hand. Mary was the first at the resurrection, and the sisters now are the first to work on the inside of the temple. The she fell into a heavy sleep undisturbed by a light tapping at the window. She did not hear the front door open nor did she hear the Johnson boys creep upstairs to bar the entrance to their father's room so he could not get out. Suddenly the door burst open. Emma awoke with a start, then screamed when she saw a mob of men with blackened faces attempting to carry her husband out of the house. The group, led by Ezra Booth and Simmons Ryder, numbered about fifty or sixty. They overpowered the struggling kicking Joseph and staggered into the yard with him. An undocumented account says that terrified Emma grabbed both babies and ran to the barn to hide, perhaps fearing rape by the violent, drunken men. Whether she remained in the house or hid in the barn, Emma could hear oaths and heavy grunts as Joseph fought to free himself in the yard. One man held a flickering lantern fashioned from a gallon can. The light bobbed and swung as it lit up portions of the men's faces. The delicate diamond, heart and crescent-shaped perforations in the tin glowed softly in contrast to the ugly brutality silhouetted by the lantern. Joseph managed to get one leg free and kicked so hard he sent a strong man sprawling. The man picked himself up and shook a bloody fist in Joseph's face. God damn ye, I'll fix ye. He grabbed Joseph by the throat and choked him into unconsciousness. The mob moved out of the yard until the light flickered in a field and the curses were muffled by the distance. Joseph regained consciousness to see Sidney Rigdon on the ground where the men had dragged him by his heels over the frozen earth. Joseph assumed he was dead, fearing the same fate. He pleaded for his own life. God damn ye, call on your God for help, we'll show ye no mercy. Was the reply. The violent men carried him farther into the field never letting his feet touch the ground for fear he would have leverage to free himself. They tore his clothes from his body, leaving only his collar, then laid him out on the frozen ground and called for a Dr. Dennison. Dennison, a respected physician, had been induced to come along for the purpose of castrating Joseph, but when he saw the helpless man stretched out before him he refused to perform the mutilation. Joseph overheard snatches of the conversation and concluded they were deciding whether or not to kill him. One man dug at Joseph's flesh with his fingernails, muttering, God damn ye, that's the way the Holy Ghost falls on folks. Another cried, Simmons, Simmons, where's the tar bucket? I don't know where it is, Eli's left it came the answer. They sent someone to fetch the crude bucket made from a hollowed out log with a rope handle. Let's tar up his mouth. Joseph wrenched his head away when they attempted to jam the tar paddle into his mouth. Someone tried to force a vial between his lips, but it shattered, breaking one of Joseph's teeth. They poured tar over his head, smeared it down his body, rolled him in an open feather tick, and then left him lying on the frozen ground. Joseph later said that his spirit seemed to leave his body and during the period of insensibility he consciously stood over his own body, 
feeling no pain, but seeing and hearing all that transpired. Joseph clawed the tar from his nose and mouth until he could breathe better, then lay motionless until the vertigo diminished. In the distance he discerned two lights and stumbled toward them. In the house Elsa and John Johnson freed themselves from the bedroom. John was too late to help Joseph. Elsa calmed Emma and helped with the feverish babies. When Joseph appeared at the dimly lit doorway the tar looked like blood to Emma. Thinking he had been torn to pieces, she fainted. Joseph called for a blanket, wrapped it around himself, and went inside. Throughout the night friends softened the tar with lard and scraped it from Joseph's battered body. The next morning Emma watched as he calmly delivered his usual Sunday sermon from the front steps of the Johnson home the broken tooth adding a sibilant lisp to his words. Among the crowd gathered in the yard were several men who had raided the house the night before, including one who had supplied the mob with a barrel of whiskey to raise their spirits. That afternoon Joseph baptized three people. Several of the mob would eventually be baptized. When Joseph visited Sidney Rigdon the next day he found him delirious and calling for his razor, threatening to kill his wife and Joseph. Rigdon did not regain his strength for some time and there were those who believed that the blows he received on his head affected him for the rest of his life. The victim who suffered most, however, was not Joseph with his bruises and scratches, or the delirious Sidney Rigdon. It was the adopted baby, Joseph. Already weakened by a difficult case of measles and the accompanying high fever, the cold night air aggravated the child's condition. Through the next six days and nights Emma hovered over her baby with growing apprehension. On Friday, March 29, 1832, Emma realized her worst fears as she watched life ebb from his tiny body. She and Joseph buried the fourth of their first five children. Emma grieved alone for the dead child. Joseph had delayed his departure for church conference in Missouri and now, three days after the baby's death, he left with Newell K. Whitney and Sidney Rigdon. The Johnson home was still in turmoil over the violence of March 24. Joseph and Newell assured Emma that she should stay at the Whitney home while they were gone. Unfortunately, Newell neglected to tell his wife. When Emma arrived, Elizabeth Ann Whitney was ill in a bed at the back of the house. Her elderly aunt Sarah answered the door and turned Emma away. Elizabeth's aunt had always lived with them, and she assumed by right of years that she had a say in the family affairs. While the Whitneys regarded Emma's and Joseph's presence in their home as the fulfillment of a vision. Aunt Sarah looked with skepticism at all preachers and did not want Joseph to make her family the dupes of priestcraft. When Elizabeth Ann learned what her aunt had done she was chagrined. I would have shared the last morsel with either of them, she said. Humiliated, Emma found another place to stay and said nothing for fear it would injure feelings. She told Lucy thirteen years later, and even then she was not able to conceal her mortification. Emma spent the summer of 1832 shuttling between the homes of Frederick G. Williams, Reynolds Cahoon, and the senior Smiths. Oblivious to Emma's circumstances, Joseph chided her in a letter, Sister Whitney wrote a letter to her husband which was very cheering and being unwell myself at that time and filled with much anxiety it would have been very consoling to me to have received a few lines from you but as you did not take the trouble, I will try to be contented with my lot knowing that God is my friend in him I shall find comfort, but Lucy commented, during Joseph's absence Emma was not idle for she labored faithfully for the interest of those with whom she stayed cheering them by her lively and spirited conversation her whole heart was in the work of the Lord and she felt no interest except for the church and the cause of truth. Whatever her hands found to do she did with her might and did not ask the selfish question shall I be benefited any more than anyone else? Her countenance always wore a happy expression of zeal and let her own privations be what they might. What Emma may not have revealed until it became obvious was that she was pregnant again. When Martin Harris carried word to Missouri that the families in Kirtland were well, Joseph wrote to Emma that the news greatly cheered our hearts and revived our spirits. We thank our Heavenly Father for his goodness unto all of you. Hiram's family was not so fortunate. Jerushaw had followed Hiram to Kirtland with the Colesville Saints. Late in May her daughter Mary, not yet three became ill and her health steadily failed. She died in Hiram's arms on May 29, 1832. Joseph wrote to Emma, I was grieved to hear that Hiram had lost his little child. I think we can in some degree sympathize with him but we all must be reconciled to our lots and say the will of the son be done. Four years later, in January 1836, he would receive a comforting revelation for parents who lost children in death.
and I also beheld that all children who die before they arrive at the years of accountability, are saved in the celestial kingdom of heaven. While in Missouri, Joseph called a meeting to discuss publishing efforts of the church, his revelations would appear in a book of commandments, supplementary scripture to the Book of Mormon and the Bible. He assigned W. W. Phelps to correct and print hymns that Emma had selected. After the meeting Joseph started home to Kirtland with Newell Whitney and Sidney Rigdon. Part way through Ohio the stagecoach horses bolted and Whitney leapt from the door. His leg caught in the wheel spokes and broke in several places. Rigdon went on ahead while Joseph remained with Newell in an inn and cared for him until the leg mended. At some time during their four-week stay Joseph became very sick and vomited so hard he dislocated his jaw. He believed he had been poisoned and that Newell healed him by laying hands on his head in the name of the Lord. Joseph would suspect poisoning again in his life but this may have been food poisoning or the beginning of a chronic illness. On his return Joseph and Emma again lived briefly at the Johnson farm, but they needed a place of their own. Newell Whitney offered them three storage rooms above his store. This arrangement left Emma space enough to take in boarders and, except for infrequent intervals, she would earn money in this way for the remaining 47 years of her life. Emma also began a lifelong practice of taking in domestic helpers usually young women who needed a place to live. They washed clothes and did household chores in return for board and room. Emma's friendship with these women usually became landmarks in their lives. In the early fall Joseph and Newell went to New York City. Concerned over Emma as she entered the last few weeks of her pregnancy, Joseph asked Hiram to watch over her until he returned. In October Emma received a letter from the Pearl Street boarding house in New York City. This day I have been walking through the most splendid part of the city of New York, Joseph began, but he said he did not waste time contemplating the sights. The thought of 200,000 unconverted souls walking around in close proximity filled him with determination to preach. Joseph also found himself excited by the tall buildings and strange inventions and concluded that God was not displeased with luxury but rather that the Lord would rejoice in works calculated to make men comfortable and wise and happy. Joseph reasoned that the only iniquity involved in enjoying luxury would be to deny God the glory. This attitude would remain with him from that time, earth and its legitimate pleasures were to be enjoyed. Joseph also wrote of his homesickness. After beholding all that I had any desire to behold I returned to my room to meditate and calm my mind and behold, the thoughts of home, of Emma and Julia, rushes upon my mind like a flood and would wish for moment to be with them. My breast is filled with all the feelings and tenderness of a parent and a husband. Sensing Emma's apprehension at the impending birth of their child, Joseph expressed his concern. I feel as if I wanted to say something to you to comfort you in your peculiar trial and present affliction. I hope God will give you strength that you may not faint. I pray God to soften the hearts of those around you to be kind to you and take the burden of your shoulders as much as possible and not afflict you. I feel for you for I know your state and that other do not, but you must comfort yourself knowing that God is your friend in heaven and that you have one true and living friend on earth your husband. Joseph and Newell Whitney traveled to Kirtland on the 1st of November, having had no recent news of home. On November 6, 1832, Emma lay exhausted in an upstairs room over the Gilbert and Whitney store. She had ended a painful labor and delivery at 2 o'clock that morning. The women who came in and out freshened the room and cared for the new baby. If Emma heard the baby cry and fret, the sound of life would be reassuring. A disturbance on the street and staircase signaled Newell's and Joseph's arrival from New York. You have a son, someone said to Joseph, and this one would live. Emma and Joseph named their baby Joseph. Then the community began sorting out the names. Joseph, Sr., became Father Smith. Joseph, Jr., was already brother Joseph. This baby would become young Joseph and later Joseph III. From the first this child resembled his mother with his brown eyes, dark hair, and olive skin. Two days after young Joseph's birth three men arrived in Kirtland and inquired after Joseph at the Whitney store. They were directed through the neighborhood until the sound of chopping led them to Joseph, who was cutting trees. Two brothers, Brigham and Joseph Young, and their friend Hebesy Kimple had come in search of a prophet that they found one cutting wood may have surprised them. Emma was resting with the two-day-old baby at her side when Joseph took Brigham and the others to meet her. Brigham Young was 31 when he arrived in Kirtland. Born in Whittingham, Vermont, in 1801, 
He was the ninth child of a stern moralistic father who fought the rocky soil of Vermont with no more success than the Smiths had. In 1904 he moved to central New York. Because the family lived close to poverty, young Brigham mastered many trades in order to earn a penny. His skilled hands built furniture, repaired clocks, and made windows. He was a compact, powerfully built man with gray eyes, deep set under a wide forehead. His hair was sandy brown and his face clean shaven. His wife had died earlier that year, leaving him two daughters. When preaching in the area Samuel Smith had left her Book of Mormon with another of Brigham's brothers, Brigham borrowed it and read it, then converted his brother. Brigham and Joseph struck up an immediate friendship. The evening the three men arrived a group came to Joseph's house and conversed freely on topics dealing with the doctrines of the kingdom. When Joseph asked Brigham Young to pray, Brigham spoke in tongues using strange sounds and unfamiliar words. The others looked at Joseph in some perplexity, for this type of spiritual phenomenon was not common to them. It was Joseph's first experience with the puzzling speech, and he called it pure Adamic and stated that it was of God. Speaking in tongues spread through the Pennsylvania branches of the church first, then occurred in Menden, New York. Brigham Young brought it to Kirtland. The practice became a part of the saints' worship, particularly among women until well into the next century. After meeting Joseph, Brigham arranged his affairs and moved his two daughters to Kirtland along with Violet and Heber C. Kimball. As the church expanded the missionary efforts increased. Joseph established a school to train men in the new doctrines as well as English, Latin, and geography. This school of the elders met, according to Brigham Young, in a small room situated over Emma's kitchen. While the men's desire for more education could not be faulted, the more mundane aspects of human affairs invariably appeared. Young said that when they assembled together in this room after breakfast, the first thing they did was to light their pipes, and while smoking, talk about the great things of the kingdom, and spit all over the room, and as soon as the pipe was out of their mouths a large chew of tobacco would then be taken. Often when the prophet entered the room to give the school instructions he would find himself in a cloud of tobacco smoke. The situation in the room was probably an example of the conditions that the Kirtland Temperance Society opposed. Founded in 1830, it was not predominantly Mormon, but somewhat among its members. Temperance societies worked to abolish ardent spirits and also condemned the use of alcohol, tobacco, and the eating of too much meat. Without question this larger social movement affected the Mormons. Thus Emma, faced almost daily with having to clean so filthy a floor as was left by the men chewing tobacco, spoke to Joseph about the matter. David Whitmer's account supports Brigham Young's description. Some of the men were excessive chewers of the filthy weed, and their disgusting slobbering and spitting caused Mrs. Smith to make the ironical remark that it would be a good thing if a revelation could be had declaring the use of tobacco a sin and commanding its suppression. Emma had support among the women. Whitmer further reports, the matter was taken up and joked about. One of the brethren suggested that the revelation should also provide for a total abstinence from tea and coffee drinking, intending this as a counter dig at the sisters. Joseph made the issue the subject of prayer, and the word of wisdom was the result. Joseph's revelation came showing forth the order and will of God in the temporal salvation of all saints in the last days. It advised against the use of strong drinks or tobacco and would someday mark the Mormons quite distinctively in their religious habits. The word of wisdom sometimes made Emma's role as the prophet's wife take an interesting turn, for new members expected her standards to meet their own expectations. On one occasion an old lady drove up to the prophet's house, wanting to look at God's mouthpiece before she had even washed the dust from her eyes. Emma offered her a cup of strong tea to revive her for she had traveled far over rutty roads. And to be sure she did smack her lips over the cup, but when she went about town she whispered that Emma did not keep the word of wisdom, and if Joseph couldn't control his own household, she left the church and left it in company. Other defections had more serious consequences for Emma. Dr. Philastus Hurlbut established himself as a physician, but his name, Dr came from his parents in the superstitious belief that as the seventh son he possessed supernatural powers. Halbert went on a mission but the church disfellowshipped him for using obscenity to a young girl. When Joseph allowed him a hearing, he confessed, was re-established, then boasted that he had outsmarted Joseph Smith's God. The council cut him off from the church. Halbert declared himself an enemy of the Mormons and went back to the Palmyra and Harmony areas, 
where he located about a hundred residents willing to sign statements against the Smiths. Joseph read the publicized statements and denounced them as the efforts of Satan. In return, Herbert publicly threatened Joseph's life. Herbert sold his affidavits to Eber D. Howe, editor of the Painesville, Ohio, Telegraph, for $500. Howe then corresponded with Emma's father, Isaac Hale. In an apparent attempt to rid his family of the stigma of Joseph's reputation, Isaac had already published his own denunciation in a local newspaper, the Susquehanna Register, on May 1, 1834. He gave Howe permission to use it. Hale reiterated his view that Joseph did not keep his promise to avoid peepstones and work on his farm. I conscientiously believe that the whole Book of Mormon so called is a silly fabrication of falsehood and wickedness, got up for speculation, and with design to dupe the credulous and unwary, and in order that its fabricators may live upon the spoils of those who swallow deception, he stated. When Howe published his collection as Mormonism unveiled, he included Isaac's judgment. The book opened old wounds for Emma. Circulation of the denunciation from Joseph's father-in-law had great impact on those unfamiliar with the previous struggle between the two men. No doubt existed in Emma's mind that her father considered her duped. While Herbert stirred up animosities in Kirtland, life became increasingly difficult for the saints in Missouri. Tensions had been building there for some time that would affect Emma and the church. As President Andrew Jackson's policies expelled Indians from their ancestral lands along the Ohio River, they moved through Missouri to the high arid plains beyond the Mississippi. To the original settlers, these Indians were savages crossing their land. The Mormons, on the other hand, saw part of the little gathering of Israel in the western migration of the Indians and felt free to befriend them. W. W. Phelps's enthusiastic editorials in the Mormon newspaper, The Evening and Morning Star, concerning the religious implications of the gathering Indians only fueled the settlers' growing anger. Some Missouri citizens had come from the south and brought slaves with them. They passed laws designed to keep free blacks out of the state. When free black members of the church tried to gather in Zion with the other saints, white authorities refused them entry across the border unless they could prove citizenship in another state. William W. Phelps attempted to explain the law in an editorial in his paper in July 1833. He printed an extract from the state law and exhorted, Great care should be taken to obey the law. The saints must shun every appearance of evil. But his next sentence infuriated the local populace. As to slaves, we have nothing to say, in connection with the wonderful events of this age much is doing towards abolishing slavery, and colonizing the blacks in Africa. Anti-Mormon sentiment exploded. Before the month was over a manifesto circulated through the countryside. Signers of the document agreed to rid themselves of the Mormons peaceably if we can, by force if we must, and declared the formation of a military unit. They labeled the Mormons fanatics, tampering with our slaves and endeavoring to sow dissensions and raise seditions among them. We agree to use such means as may be sufficient to remove them, and to that end we each pledge each other our bodily powers, our lives, fortunes, and sacred honors. Over a hundred people signed the document, including many public officials. The group met on Saturday, July 20, 1833 at the Independence Courthouse. Men then swarmed up the street to the press office of the Evening and Morning Star. A mob shoved William Phelps and his family into the street and threw their household belongings after them. Phelps watched several men hoist his press through a second-story window and tossed trays of type after it. They ransacked his office and destroyed his papers, including the pages for the Book of Commandments. The crowd moved on and pillaged the store. Men grabbed bolts of colorful cloth and flipped them into streamers through the town square. Nine-year-old Emily Partridge and her sister Eliza, 13, were at a spring drawing water when the mob arrived at their house. From a short distance the girls watched angry men surround their father and envelop him in their midst, then move back toward town. Emily watched from the window. Finally she saw two men walk down the road. One carried a hat, coat and vest. The other was a grotesque figure and Emily ran upstairs to hide. The second man was her father, covered with tar mixed with acid and rolled in feathers. A few days later the family watched their large haystack burn as roaming bands struck fear through the Mormon settlements. In November violence broke out again, 
the mob wrestled down and beat several Mormon men while women and children cowered in adjacent thickets. They tied some men to trees and whipped them until blood ran down their bodies. Thirty or forty night riders came late in the evening of November 1st to David Bennett's home. He and his wife were both critically ill. They dragged Bennett from his bed and beat him severely with his own gun while his wife and children fled. Another night men with painted faces surrounded the house of Nancy and Edward Larkey, fired guns at random and told them to leave or be killed. Their young daughter buried her face in her mother's skirts and cried, Oh, Ma, what shall we do, what shall we do? Nancy Larkey held her close and calmly told her, Do not tear, if they kill us we will go to God, where they cannot come. By November the Mormons took up arms. A force led by David Whitmer left two men dead in a cornfield. When Lieutenant Governor Lilburn Boggs requested that both sides give up their arms, the Mormons complied but the Missouri settlers did not. Through November Mormon refugees gathered along the banks of the Missouri. The ferries could not keep up with the influx of homeless people, who made shelters of poles and blankets. In desperation the church members appealed to the Kirtland settlement for help. Joseph Smith announced a revelation that the members in Kirtland should help redeem Mormon losses in Missouri, prompting the organization of a strange military campaign, Zion's Camp. On February 24, 1834, the newly organized High Council, a governing body within the church, met at Temer's and Joseph's home and selected Joseph as commander-in-chief of the armies of Israel. The purpose of the army was the redemption of Zion, they were going to Missouri to redeem Mormon lands, spiritual life, loyalty, political power, and church organization. Emma cared for her borders and prepared supplies for the campaign while Joseph left for a trip to New York to recruit for Zion's camp until March. She and the other women outfitted the army with food and clothing and gathered provisions for the homeless Missouri Mormons. Joseph's cousin, George A. Smith, joined the group. At 17, George A.'s clothes for the journey were a pair of pantaloons made of striped bed ticking, two cotton shirts, a straw hat, a cloth coat and vest a blanket and a pair of new boots, and a knapsack made of apron check. His father proudly gave him a Queen's Arm musket to complete the outfit. The advance camp left Kirtland May 1, 1834. 204 men, 11 women, and 7 children in some 24 wagons eventually joined the trek. Emma and probably every other woman, child, and old man saw them off. The first file marched out carrying a white bandana inscribed peace. Then came armed men bearing every sort of weapon, most of the guns and swords were inherited from their Revolutionary War grandfathers. Those without muskets brandished huge butcher knives. Their plan, however, was to travel as farmers so that the Missourians would not learn of their march. Along with their weapons, they carried rakes, pitchforks, axes, and other farm implements. Brigham Young captained one company of twelve armed, with a gun, a bayonet, a dirk, an axe and some farm tools. Joseph, accompanied by a big bulldog, was the best equipped. He carried a pair of brass-barreled horse pistols with silver mountings, a fine sword, and a rifle, and traveled under the alias of Squire Cook. After the first day's march George A.S. striped pantaloons hung in tatters and he had sat on his straw hat. A chronic eye infection made him squint and tilt his head back to see. He did not look like a soldier and possibly for that reason Joseph appointed him to speak to outsiders. In spite of the image he portrayed, George possessed a very tenacious and powerfully retentive memory. Any person, or thing, he ever saw, or heard, once committed to memory, he seemed never to forget. News of the company in the form of a thousand rumors raced ahead of them. The Missouri Intelligencer and Boone's Lick Advertiser reported that 600 Mormons armed with every kind of instrument of destruction from scalping knives to double-barreled rifles marched toward Missouri. Citizens across western Missouri began arming themselves. Emma waited in Kirtland for news of the camp's progress and sent letters to Joseph with friends traveling to Missouri. She received a letter from Joseph in May. Sit down in my tent to write a few lines to you to let you know that you are on my mind and that I am sensible of the duty of a husband and father and that I am well, and I pray God to let his blessings rest upon you and the children and all that are around you until I return to your society, 
he told her. The few times you wrote and sent by the hand of Brother Lyman gave me satisfaction and comfort and I hope you will continue to communicate to me by your own hand for this is a consolation to me to converse with you in this way in my lonely moments which is not easily described. I must close for I cannot write on my knees sitting on the ground. Oh may the blessings of God rest upon you is the prayer of your husband until death. The next time Emma heard from Joseph he sent her money and advised her, I want you to make use of the money I send you in wisdom, for such things as you need, and make yourselves as comfortable and contented as you can and continue to pray to the Lord to hasten the day when we shall be permitted to behold each other's face again and enjoy the blessing of the family circle in peace and in righteousness. Joseph dictated much of his letter and his style became more flowery and less personal. Our thoughts linger with inexpressible anxiety for the wives and our children are kindred according to the flesh who are entwined around our hearts, and also, our brethren and friends, our whole journey would be as a dream, and this would be the happiest period of all our lives. We learn on this journey how to travel, and we look with pleasing anticipation for the time to come, when we shall retrace our steps, and take this journey again in the enjoyment and embrace of that society we so much love inside the camp. All did not always go as smoothly as Joseph described to Emma. Forty days of muddy roads, poor food, sporadic military discipline, fatigue, and petty bickering eroded their morale and shortened tempers. A sham battle near Decatur, Illinois, perked up almost everybody's spirits but Heber C. Kimball's. He had grabbed somebody's unsheathed sword and cut his hand. As Zion's camp entered Missouri a series of anti-climaxes prevented an actual battle with the Missourians, who outnumbered the forces from Kirtland. Rain-soaked ammunition and storm of huge hailstones discouraged the men. The Missourians dispersed and the men of Zion's camp prepared to stay temporarily at Rush Creek, five miles from Liberty. But there, on June 20, cholera stalked the camp choosing its victims with capricious and terrifying abandon. Cholera scourged the world from 1832 to 1834. No one understood how the bacteria spread and travelers unwittingly carried it with them. Zion's camp passed through infested communities where death carts were common sights, and bought food, accepted provisions, and drank from the polluted streams. Sometimes the terrific toxins in cholera brought agonizing suffering crowded into the few hours between the crisis of the disease and death. Other times, victims seldom lost consciousness until the merciful end came. Joseph, like many others, regarded disease and deformity as punishments meted out by an angry god. Some two weeks earlier he had called the camp together and told them that, because of disobedience, God had decreed that sickness should come upon the camp and that if they did not humble themselves, they should die like sheep with the rot. Death by cholera was an unbelievably severe sentence for minor pseudo-military infractions. The sufferers' cries and moans filled the whole camp. Men on guard fell with their guns in their hands. Joseph said he tried to heal the victims by the laying on of hands, but the disease seized him like the talons of a hawk. Fourteen members of the camp fell victim to the plague. Joseph disbanded the camp. Each man received a dollar fourteen and was to make his own way home to Kirtland. As the men sought help, people closed doors in their faces in fear of the disease. In despair they buried their friends on the bank of a small creek, unknowingly polluting the stream. What little news reached Emma in Kirtland was erroneous and slow arriving. On July 12 the Chardent Spectator announced that a body of well-armed Mormons, lead on by their great prophet, Joe Smith, lately attempted to cross the river into Jackson County. A battle ensued, in which, Joe Smith was wounded in the leg, and the Mormons obliged to retreat. Joe Smith's limb was amputated, but he died three days after the operation. Until word filtered back, or until Joseph arrived in Kirtland two weeks later, Emma may have believed him dead. Seas of Tribulation 1834-1838 Emma greeted Joseph with relief when he returned in good health on August 1, 1834. Zion's camp had not redeemed lands in Missouri for the Mormons, although it assured the members that the Kirtland Saints cared for their welfare. Some church members viewed the expedition as Joseph's personal quest for empire. These men nursed their grievances and waited for others. The experience created firm and lasting bonds. When Joseph organized a quorum of twelve apostles, nine were among his most faithful supporters in Zion's camp. Often referred to simply as the twelve, they were to take the gospel to all nations, kindreds, tongues and people. Among the first members of the quorum were Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Orson Hyde, 
William E. McClellan, Parley Page, Pratt, and William Smith, each would have an effect on decisions Emma would make later. Emma and the Saints anticipated the construction of an unusual building that would provide a physical sanctuary for their spiritual needs. On June 1, 1833, Joseph had revealed the dimensions of the Kirtland Temple. Many saw in it expressions of the beauty lacking in most of their own homes. When Joseph pointed out the site, Hiram Smith enthusiastically grabbed a scythe and cut the wheat growing on it. He and Reynolds Cahoon dug the foundation trench, and George A. Smith hauled the first load of stone from nearby quarries. One woman drove two yoke of cattle and hailed rock, while others helped in more traditional ways. Some made and mended clothing for the men laboring on the temple, some sewed curtains and wove carpets. Well, sisters, observed Joseph, you are always on hand. Mary was the first did the resurrection and the sisters now are the first to work on the inside of the temple. Emma supported the temple construction at some personal sacrifice by taking in the workers as boarders. Lucy described the crowded scene in her daughter-in-law's home. How often have I, with my daughters and daughter-in-law, parted every bed in the house for the accommodation of the brethren. And then Joseph would take his cloak and lay down on the hard floor with no other bed or bedding and Emma place herself by his side and share his comfort while my husband and myself, lodged in the same room with a single blanket for bed and bedding. She continued, this was our rest for two weeks together and we labored hard every day but those who were accommodated by our privations did not know how we fared for Emma nor I never either of us suffered them to know that we took such unwearied pains for them. To add to the confusion, a certain Michael Chandler arrived in July with a traveling exhibit of four Egyptian mummies together with some rolls of papyrus covered with hieroglyphic figures. He had heard that Joseph Smith could translate unknown languages. Church members at Kirtland purchased them, but the mummies ended up on display in Emma's home, drawing a steady stream of visitors. Emma conducted tours, explaining the characters on them as she had heard Joseph do. An unexpected minor disruption around Emma's premises was the lovesick Oliver Cowdery. Oliver's wife, David Whitmer's sister Elizabeth, had left for a visit to her parents in Missouri and the separation began to grind on him. I live at Bro. Joseph's and am treated with brotherly kindness, he wrote his wife, but that is not like living with a family of one's own when the Lord has given him one. Oliver Cowdery passed some of his lonely hours in the evening gatherings where Joseph Smith, Sr., pronounced promises and blessings upon the heads of the faithful. As patriarch, his duties required him to communicate to the saints the individual blessings to which they were each entitled as the children of God. When he blessed Emma, Oliver Cowdery was present and acted as scribe. This blessing offered her both approval and comfort for thy faithfulness and truth. Thou shalt be blessed with thy husband and rejoice in the glory which shall come upon him thy whole soul has been drawn out in prayer for his deliverance, rejoice, for the Lord has heard thy supplication. In reference to the Hale family, she was told, Thou hast grieved for the hardness of the hearts of thy father's house, and thou hast longed for their salvation. The Lord will have respect to thy cries, and by his judgments he will cause some of them to see their folly and repent of their sins, but it will be by affliction that they will be saved. One promise Emma would remember at the end of her life was, Thou shalt see many days, yea, the Lord will spare thee till thou art satisfied, for thou shalt see thy Redeemer. Thy heart shall rejoice in the great work of the Lord, and no one shall take thy rejoicing from thee. The blessing also recognized her grief at the deaths of her children. Thou hast seen much sorrow because the Lord has taken from thee three of thy children, in this thou art not to be blamed, for he knows thy pure desires to raise up a family that the name of my son might be blessed. And now, behold, I say unto thee, that thus says the Lord, If thou wilt believe, thou shalt yet be blessed in this thing and thou shalt bring forth other children, to the joy and satisfaction of thy soul, and to the rejoicing of thy friends. Thou shalt be blessed with understanding, and have power to instruct thy sex, teach thy family righteousness, and thy little ones the way of life, and the holy angels shall watch over thee and thou shalt be saved in the kingdom of God, even so, Amen. Social gatherings like those surrounding the giving of patriarchal blessings granted Emma an occasional reprieve from work, but some quiet evenings at home had their lighter moments. Shortly after a school opened for the men, Joseph spent all day in class. He came home one evening, decided to teach his family grammar, gathered them all around the fire, and proceeded to do so. Emma, the school teacher, 
must have smiled. Another family occasion began joyfully and ended on a somber note. A December sleigh ride with Emma, Julia, and young Joseph soured when a passerby bawled out to Joseph, Do you get any revelations lately? On Thursday night, October 29, 1835, Emma prepared dinner for the Whitneys, Partridges, and several others. The conversation turned to hopes for the future. Newell Whitney looked at his friends and said, I expect that in one year all the party present will be seated around a table in the land of Zion. Emma responded, I hope that will be the case, and that not only you but the rest of the company present might be seated around my table in that land of promise. After dinner Emma went to a high council meeting with Joseph. The matter of business was the trial of a couple charged with whipping their daughter unreasonably. Lucy Mac Smith began to testify about matters that Joseph believed had long since been settled by the church, and he objected to his mother's comments. William Smith rose and charged Joseph with invalidating her testimony. Joseph told William he was out of order and asked him to sit down. Enraged. William said he would not sit down until Joseph knocked him down. Joseph threatened to walk out of the meeting, but Father Smith intervened, and they returned to the issue at hand. The erring parents were finally reprimanded for raising a daughter who required the whip eight fifteen years. The Smith family fight did not diminish with the end of the meeting. Two days later Joseph, William, and Hiram met at Emma's house to settle their differences. William said Joseph always tried to carry out his own plans whether they were right or wrong a charge Joseph regarded as an insult. When Hiram attempted to make peace William rushed outdoors, bent vengeance. The argument upset Emma and the other Smiths two full months. Though the disagreement had begun over a relatively minor matter, the fury that sustained it came from a deeper source and would continue to disrupt the two brothers' relationship. A week after the argument with William, Joseph came home from Sunday services and scolded Emma for leaving the meeting before the sacrament was passed. His words brought Emma to tears. She made no reply, his history stated, but manifested contrition by weeping. But he apparently attempted to ease some strain for Emma. On October 17, 1835, he called his family together, arranged domestic concerns, and dismissed his boarders. While the crowded conditions in Emma's home were difficult, housing space and food available to the immigrants who steadily arrived in Kirtland were far worse. Elizabeth Ann Whitney and Emma solicited help from others in the community and held a feast for the newcomers. Special invitations went to the poor, the lame, the halt, the deaf, the blind, the aged, and the infirm. The feast was simple food since there was no other kind in Kirtland but the spirit of sharing compensated for the lack of abundance. Evidence suggests that Emma and Elizabeth Whitney shared not only a close friendship but also a common bond of compassion for those who suffered. Emma's keen sense of others' needs endeared her to church members. One example was the Crosby family. Caroline Barnes Crosby arrived in Kirtland with her husband Jonathan in January 1836. They moved about, living with other families until they finally found a place of their own. Jonathan called it a cold place to live in winter, a loose floor, and none overhead. There Caroline gave birth to a son. Being in a cold house my wife took cold and was sick with a sore breast nearly all winter. She could not nurse the boy, and we had to beg milk from the neighbors. Jonathan took a job working on brother Joseph's house as he was building tolerably large and worked on for several days alone when Joseph ran out of money and could not pay the workmen. After Jonathan and Caroline went to bed hungry one night, they decided to ask Sister Emma for help. He worked several hours. The following day, unable to bring himself to ask for charity even though money was due him for labor, Emma saw him and asked if he had enough provisions. He told her he was without and had no money. Emma's gave him a twenty-pound ham and sack of white flour from her own stores. Caroline wrote, he came home rejoicing, considering it a perfect godsend nothing ever tasted half as good. Not all of the new converts who filtered into Kirtland came in family units as did the Crosbys. Loyalty to conviction was often pitted against loyalty to family. Emma understood that challenge as she had faced it herself when she said farewell to a saddened mother and embittered father several years earlier. However, Emma corresponded with her parents while she lived in Kirtland. A former neighbor who ran the stone quarry recalled, When I first saw Emma on the streets in Kirtland, she threw her arms around me and I think kissed me, and inquired all about her father's family. I brought her letters and took some later to Mr. Hale from her. Meanwhile, 
Samuel Smith had visited Boston on a missionary journey and befriended two young girls, Mary Bailey and Agnes Coolbrith, who would both become Emma's sisters-in-law. Samuel baptized Mary before leaving Boston. When opposition to the Mormons grew, Mary and Agnes left their families and traveled a thousand miles alone, arriving in Kirtland in 1833. They boarded with Joseph and Lucy Smith on a farm outside of town and worked on clothing for the laborers on the temple. Mary undoubtedly kept her eye on the handsome Samuel, and he looked no farther for a wife than in his mother's kitchen. Samuel married Mary Bailey in August 1834. Don Carlos, 19 years old and a young giant at 6 feet, 4 inches, married Agnes Culbreth in July 1835. She was 24. Converts continued to stream into Kirtland wanting to see Joseph. They came with an idea of how he should look and act, and invariably Joseph surprised them. I thought he was a queer man for a prophet, at first, said Jonathan Crosby. He didn't appear exactly as I expected to see a prophet of God, however, I was not stumbled at all. I found him to be a friendly cheerful pleasant agreeable man. I could not help liking him. In 1835, with a press now operating in Kirtland, Joseph published the Book of Commandments under a new name, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the faithful accepted it as scripture. The High Council met on September 14 and decreed again that Emma Smith be appointed to make a selection of sacred hymns as she had been commanded in the elect lady revelation. Her first collection had most likely been destroyed with Phelps's printing press in Missouri three years earlier. Phelps was assigned to edit and arrange the songs for printing. Phelps was 43 in 1835 when he boarded at Emma's house. He was quite a singular man, spare of flesh already sufficiently aged to wear spectacles, was methodical and studious in his habits, and not very prepossessing in appearance though of good brain and judgment. A poet in his own right, he contributed 26 hymns to Emma's collection. She also included a number of hymns written by others such as Eliza R. Snow, Parley P. Pratt, and Edward E. Partridge. Emma may have been a contributor herself, for several hymns are of unknown authorship. She chose 42 songs from other denominations. Emma's hymnal came off the press early in 1836 although it bears an 1835 date. A small, pocket-sized book, about 3 by 4 inches, bound in leather, the front and back covers were unadorned, but gold lettering on the spine read simply, Hymns. The title page noted, A Collection of Sacred Hymns for the Church of the Latter-day Saints, selected by Emma Smith, Kirtland, Ohio, printed by F. G. Williams and Company. 1835. This volume contained 90 hymns. The first was Know Then That Every Soul Is Free, and the last one became the stirring anthem of Mormonism, The Spirit of God Like a Fire Is Burning, written by W. W. Phelps. The words were printed in stanzas without music. The chorister announced the name of the tune to which the hymn would be sung and the congregation was expected to know it. Some hymns fitted several tunes. As the temple neared completion Phelps and Williams worked diligently to have the hymnal completed in time for the dedication. The temple was a monument to the faith of both the men and the women, and they saw symbols of their own personal growth in its quality and perfection. Standing on the hill in defiance of rumor, division, prejudice, and disruption, it became a triumphant statement that they could accomplish something of beauty. The church councils planned the dedication carefully to express their reverence and to be as impressive as the building itself. By 7 a.m. on March 27, 1836, several hundred people waited at the doors, in groups, in pairs, and one by one. They climbed the wide front stairs and quietly filed through the two towering front doors. Joseph, Sidney Rigdon, and Oliver Cowdery ushered the orderly assemblage up the aisles and into the pews closing the small gate on the aisle as each bench filled. Between 900 and a thousand people crowded in. The overflow gathered in the schoolhouse for an auxiliary service. Sunlight filtered through the wavy glass and illuminated the people's faces. Their eyes traced the lines of the graceful ionic columns and the intricately carved woodwork of the stately pulpits. Men who had brought stone from the quarries sensed the strength built into the foundation. With pride they viewed the results of their pounding, carving, plastering and painting. Women who had sewn draperies and carpets saw that the interior was warm and inviting, while the outside walls glistened with bits and pieces of their china ground fine and mixed with the plaster. For these saints it was glorious day and their hearts echoed the silent prayer, Lord, accept our offering.
At nine o'clock the service began with some reading and a hymn. Emma's soprano voice joined with the others. All six hymns sung at the ceremonies were from her hymnal. Either the book itself had come off the press early enough to be used that day or they used typesets from the messenger and advocate. When Joseph gave the dedicatory prayer, he asked God to accept the building as fulfillment of the commandment to construct it. He prayed that the Lord would confound and bring shame and confusion upon those who had spread lying reports abroad, against thy servant, or servants, and asked the Lord's assistance in building up the church. When the prayer ended the assembled saints broke into joyous song, the Spirit of God like a fire is burning. The latter day glory begins to come forth. The visions and blessings of old are returning. The angels are coming to visit the earth. Will sing and will shout with the armies of heaven, Hosanna. Hosanna to God and the Lamb. Let glory to them in the highest be given, henceforth and forever. Amen and Amen. Don Carlos Smith blessed the bread and wine for the Lord's Supper. Frederick G. Williams rose and stated that an angel entered through the window and took a place between himself and Father Smith and remained there during the meeting. The congregation shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb, three times, sealing it each time with Amen, Amen, Amen. Brigham Young spoke in tongues, David W. Patton interpreted, and at four o'clock in the afternoon the dedication was over. The women found the services inspiring. Nancy Naomi Alexander Tracy sat through the seven-hour dedication holding her six-month-old son, Lacanois Moroni. They were two of the happiest days of my life, she said. It was verily true that the heavenly influence rested down upon that house. Heavenly beings appeared to many. Solemn assemblies were called. Endowments were given. The elders went from house to house, blessing the saints and administering the sacrament. Feasts were given. Three families joined together and held one at our house. We baked a lot of bread and had the best of wine. The evening of the dedication 416 male members of the church met in the temple and Joseph instructed them about the ordinance of washing of feet. As the meeting progressed, George A. Smith rose and began to prophesy, and Joseph reported hearing a noise like the sound of a rushing mighty wind, which held the temple. George A. later described the men's meeting and an unexpected result of it. The Lord poured out his spirit upon us and gave us some little idea of the law of anointing and conferred upon us some blessings. He told us to wash ourselves, and that almost made the women mad, and they said, as they were not admitted into the temple while this washing was being performed that some mischief was going on. And some of them were right huffy about it. According to another report, the sisters who had worked to weave the veils were not invited to share in all the joyful manifestations, and they were not pleased. Emma, although she may have felt slighted, tried to explain that there were many privileges not accorded women and they must not complain. I but press India Huntington described a meeting when the entire congregation knelt and prayed softly and both she and her sister Zena heard a choir of angels singing most beautifully overhead and toward one corner of the room. Neither of them saw the angels, but myriads of angelic voices seemed to be united in singing some song of Zion. On another day she was at home when a child came to the door and told her there was a meeting on top of the temple. Press India wrote, I went to the door, and there I saw on the temple angels clothed in white covering the roof from end to end. They seemed to be walking to and fro, they appeared and disappeared. The third time they appeared and disappeared before I realized that they were not mortal men. Each time in a moment they vanished, and their reappearance was the same. This was in broad daylight. In the afternoon, a number of children in Kirtland saw the same. Each church member responded differently to the spiritual gifts and extraordinary religious manifestations. Emma apparently did not speak in tongues or experience mystical phenomena, yet she did not seem to doubt those who did. Her letters to Joseph and later to her children clearly show that she relied on both faith and prayer. She was a practical woman, and her egregious commitment served her, as she in turn served others. In that light, Emma was pregnant through the winter and spring of 1835 to 1836 and on July 20, 1836, gave birth to another son whom they named Frederick Granger William Smith after the publisher of Emma's hymnal. Joseph soon left for the East. Accounts of the purpose of the trip conflict. Joseph's letters mention his renting a home in Salem, Massachusetts, teaching, preaching, and visiting. Ebenezer Robinson, who boarded at Emma's 
said that Joseph had read in the Painesville, Ohio Telegraph that a treasure lay buried beneath a house in Salem and a man had offered to guide him to it, pressed by debts and needing capital to build Kirtland, on the one hand, and, on the other, pained by the earlier problems about money digging and peep stoning. Joseph kept his intentions from all but a few. In a note to Emma, Joseph made a veiled reference to the secret project, with regard to the great object of our mission, you will be anxious to know. We have found the house, very luckily and providentially. It is occupied, and it will require much care and patience to rent or buy it. We think we shall be able to effect it. The search for the treasure was unsuccessful. Perhaps the revelation he dictated at the close of the expedition quieted some criticism. I. The Lord your God, am not displeased with your coming on this journey, notwithstanding your follies. I have much treasure in this city Salem for you, for the benefit of Zion. I will order all things for your good, as fast as ye are able to receive them. Joseph returned to Kirtland empty-handed. Ebenezer Robinson noted sadly, we speak these things with regret, but the episode brought to a close the money-digging chapter of Joseph's life. Meanwhile Emma, now thirty-two, had a new friend enter her life. Eliza R. Snow was the same age but had never married. She lived in Mantua, Ohio, about 30 miles from Kirtland. Slightly above medium height, Eliza was slender. With auburn hair, she was graceful and dignified, with a noble countenance, the forehead being unusually high and expansive, and the features of a slightly Hebrew cast, setting off her striking brown eyes. Eliza had published poetry and verse from the time she was 22. A member of the Campbellite Church, she had failed to receive a desired reassurance that this religion was correct. Sometime around 1831 Joseph Smith had visited her home. Eliza had scrutinized Joseph's face and decided it was honest, but almost five years passed before she joined the church on April 5th. 1835, she came to Kirtland for the temple dedication. Shortly afterward, at Emma's and Joseph's invitation, Eliza boarded with them and began to teach a select school for young ladies. Emma now had a friend who was an intellectual equal. Eliza was not fond of teaching school, but living in Emma's home offered a compensation. Eliza watched Joseph. I had ample opportunity to mark his daily walk and conversation, as a prophet of God and the more I became acquainted with him the more I appreciated him as such, she wrote. His lips ever flowed with instruction and kindness, and although very forgiving, indulgent, and affectionate in his temperament, when his godlike intuition suggested that the welfare of his brethren, or the interests of the kingdom of God demanded it, no fear of censure, no love of approbation could prevent his severe rebuke. Significantly, Eliza's life sketch made few references to Emma except as the family of the prophet. Nor did she comment on Emma's advanced pregnancy, nor on the birth of Frederick, events that would be of natural interest to most women. Eliza joined Emma's and Joseph's thrice daily devotions. These precious seasons of sacred household service truly seemed a foretaste of celestial happiness. To have a husband like Joseph Smith must have seemed heaven to the unmarried Eliza. Emma nursed Joseph through a serious illness during the summer of 1837. Mary Fielding, a convert who had arrived from Canada in 1834, wrote that our beloved brother Joseph Smith appeared to be so far gone that we doubted he would live till next morn. Joseph's illness was serious enough to scare even him, as he lay helpless. He asked Emma to pray for him. Afterward Mary said Joseph was blessed at times with such glorious visions as made him quite forget that his body was afflicted. 36-year-old Mary would soon be associated with the family in a new role. Hiram Smith went to Missouri that fall of 1837. His wife Jerusha was expecting their fifth child in October. When the baby Sarah was born, Jerusha's health failed, even under Lucy's and Emma's care. For eleven anxious days the family watched and worried. On October 13, 1837, Jerusha Barden Smith called her older four children to her side, kissed them goodbye, and said, Tell your father when he comes that the Lord has taken your mother home and left you for him to take care of. With Jerusha's death, Emma lost a sister-in-law and the friend. They had been new brides together and had shared much since 1827. At Joseph's insistence, Hiram Smith married Mary Fielding on December 24, 1837, two and a half months after Jerusha's death. His immediate remarriage probably prompted critics who believed that he had not allowed the proper lapse of time since his wife's death. He explained, It was not because I had less love or regard for Jerusha, 
that I married so soon, but it was for the sake of my children. Mary's marriage to Haram came at the most chaotic of times. Construction of the temple had temporarily boosted the economy of Kirtland. But after the dedication the economy declined as poor converts arrived in ever-increasing numbers. The old settlers attempted to keep them out of Kirtland by economic pressures, but the Mormon population increased twentyfold while the landholdings only quadrupled. In November 1836 Joseph and other church leaders drew up articles for a bank to provide capital for investments. It was a desperate gamble. Oliver Cowdery went to Philadelphia for plates to print bank notes and Orson Hyde went to the legislature in Columbus with a petition for a bank license. It was refused. Oliver returned with plates for the Kirtland Safety Society Bank, but Orson Hyde came back without a charter. The plates were so expensive that they printed some specie, anyway, writing in ante before the word bank, and ing after it. The notes read, Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Company and the paper passed as legal tender from a joint stock company. At first the money circulated wildly, when merchants and businessmen who were more sophisticated than the Mormons began to redeem their notes, Joseph could see that a run would ruin the bank. After one month he and Sidney Rigdon resigned as officers, but the bank failed. This affected Joseph's status. People who were convinced that Joseph had intended a swindle at the outset attacked him verbally and threatened him physically. This disruption forced Joseph to leave the city frequently. As a consequence, Emma again took in boarders. Whether they paid in cash or kind, the results benefited the family. In Joseph's absence Emma earned their income and decided how to spend it. She bought, sold, bartered, and traded. Her letters to Joseph reveal that she wrote as a business partner, clearly expecting that he would consider what she had to say. She negotiated with men in solving her financial difficulties, and though she did not always succeed, she became a person to be dealt with, not ignored. I in April 1837 Joseph went into hiding without seeing Emma before he left. When she wrote on April 25 her sense of humor had not failed. Your letter was welcomed both by friends and foes. She told him, We are glad enough to hear that you were well, and our enemies think they have almost found you, by seeing, where the letters were mailed. On a more serious note she wrote, I cannot tell you my feelings when I found I could not see you before you left, yet I expect you can realize them. The children feel very anxious about you because they don't know where you have gone. She continued, I have got all the money that I have had any chance to and as many goods as I could. I verily feel that if I had no more confidence in God than some I could name, I should be in a sad case indeed, but I still believe that if we humble ourselves, and are as faithful as we can be we shall be delivered from every snare that may be laid for our feet, and our lives and property will be saved and we redeemed from all unrenderable encumbrances. Eight days later Emma wrote again. While she believed that unrenderable encumbrances would soon cease, she still struggled with financial problems. I do not know what to tell you, she began in frustration, not having but a few minutes to write, the situation of your business is such as is very difficult for me to do anything of any consequence, partnership matters give everybody such an unaccountable right to every particle of property or money that they can lay their hands on, that there is no prospect of my getting one dollar of current money or even give the grain you left for our bread as I sent to the French place for that wheat and brother strong says that he shall let us only have ten bushels, he has sold the hay and keeps the money. She continued, Dr. Cowdery tells me he can't get money to pay the postage of the office. Brother Parrish has been very anxious for some time past to get the little mare, and I do not know but it would be your will to have him have her, but I have been so treated that I have come to the determination not to let any man or woman have anything whatever without being well assured, that it goes to your own advantage. Emma probably would have bested Josiah Stowell, who gloated at having sold Joseph an old horse in harmony. It is impossible for me to do anything, she wrote, as long as everybody has so much better right to all that is called yours than I have. If you should write after you get this, want you to let me know as much as possible about the situation of your business, that if possible, I can benefit by the information. Business and church affairs demanded resolution. She advised him with cool aplomb. If you should give anyone a power of attorney, you had better give it to Brother Knight, as he is the only man that has not manifested a spirit of indifference to your temporal interest. I mean the only one I have had occasion to say much to about business. You may be astonished because I have not accepted some but when I see you, I will tell you the reason, 
be assured I shall do the best I can in all things, and I hope that we shall be so humble and pure before God that he will set us at liberty to be our own masters in the few things at least, yours forever. M also cared for an unnamed boarder, remembering that measles had already taken one of her children, she confided to Joseph, the young man is here yet and is very sick with the measles which makes much confusion and trouble for me, and is also a subject of much fear and anxiety unto me, as you know that neither of your little boys have ever had them, I wish it could be possible for you to be at home when they are sick, you must remember them for they all remember you and I could hardly pacify Julia and Joseph when they found out you was not coming home soon. In the same letter Emma mentioned Oliver Cowdery's nephew. In November 1836 Warren Cowdery had indentured his son Hervey to Emma and Joseph for five years. According to the terms of the contract, the boy would work for his board, room, and education. Emma spoke of the boy with warmth and asked Joseph to write some words of encouragement to Hervey, for he is very faithful not only in business but in taking up his cross in the family. Emma and Joseph had moved into their new home on the west side of the street that ran from the temple down to the Chagrin River. While watching the big boys catch a few small fish, five-year-old Joseph asked to try his luck. Emma outfitted the little pole with a piece of thread and a bent pin. The boy trusted in without bait and, by some miracle that follows children, hooked a six-inch horn chub. He dropped the pole, gathered up the fish and ran to the house to show Emma. I've got one. I've got one. He shouted. The pleasant aspects of Emma's life, however, were being overshadowed by rumors that Joseph had an unconventional view of marriage. His and Emma's abrupt departure from Harmony in 1830 may have been because her cousin, Heal Lewis, accused Joseph of improper conduct with women. Fifty years later he repeated third-hand stories that Joseph attempted to seduce C.W. Eliza Winters and that Joseph and Martin Harris had said adultery was no crime. However, Josiah Stowell's daughters insisted, in the 1830 Bainbridge court trial, that Joseph had always behaved properly toward them. Joseph's ideas about changes in marital practices came during a season of unprecedented religious activity. By the time he left the Johnson home in 1832 he had received more than half of the revelations that would eventually appear in print. The Book of Mormon provided only vague references to the Lord's acceptance of plural wives but hinted of acceptance by stating, For if I will, saith the Lord of hosts, raise up seed unto me, I will command my people, otherwise they shall hearken unto these things. The Bible contained more explicit examples, and Joseph had revised it extensively, completing Genesis, chapters 7-19. to in February or early March of 1831, Mormons believe that Joseph asked the Lord why plural wives were acceptable in the day of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob but not in his day. Thirty to fifty years later several of Joseph's contemporaries would state that he had received a revelation approving plural marriage in 1831. In 1869 Orson Bratt said, Joseph had inquired of the Lord if the principle of taking more wives than one is a true principle but the time had not yet come for it to be practiced. In 1882 Hiram Smith's son, Joseph F. Smith, dated a revelation approving plural marriage in 1831 and added, The Lord showed him Joseph those women and at that time some of these women were named and given to him, to become his wives when the time should come that this principle would be established. Apparently, Joseph introduced the subject through a revelation received near Jackson County, Missouri on July 17, 1831, stating, For it is my will, that in time, ye should take unto you wives of the Lamanites and Nephites Indians that their posterity may become white, delightsome and just, for even now their females are more virtuous than the Gentiles. The copy of the revelation is in the handwriting of William W. Phelps, who adds, I asked Brother Joseph, privately, how we, that were mentioned in the revelation could take wives of the natives as we were all married men. He replied instantly, in the same manner that Abraham took Hagar and Keturah, that Jacob took Rachel, Blow and Zilf, by revelation, the saints of the Lord are always directed by revelation. Evidence suggests that although Joseph believed he was commanded by God through revelation to establish plural marriage as part of the restoration of all things, questions undoubtedly arose. For example, who would perform the marriages? Could Joseph officiate in his own behalf? 
who should be told of the doctrine. How would Emma and others react to such an unorthodox practice? There is no record that Joseph received immediate instructions in these matters, making his early attempts to instigate plural marriage most difficult for Emma when she encountered them. Mary Elizabeth Rollins claimed that Joseph had a private conversation with her in 1831. She was then 12 years old. She said Joseph told me about his great vision concerning me. He said I was the first woman God commanded him to take as a plural wife, although she did not become a plural wife of Joseph's until a number of years later. That early conversation planted a seed that Mary Elizabeth long remembered. Within six months of Joseph's conversation with Mary Elizabeth Rollins, he and Emma had moved into the John Johnson home. Orson Pratt later quoted Lyman Johnson as saying that Joseph had made known to him as early as 1831 that plural marriage was a correct principle, but also remarked that the time had not yet come to teach and practice it. Perhaps Joseph was not discreet in his discussions about plural marriage because rumor and insinuation fed the fury of the mob that tarred and feathered him. When the Johnson boys joined the mob that entered their own home, they clearly suspected an improper association between Joseph and their 16-year-old sister, Nancy Marinda. Undoubtedly members of the Johnson family retold the tar and feathering story with all its ramifications. William E. McClellan a member of the Twelve wrote in an 1872 letter about an incident related to him by Frederick G. Williams in 1838. McClellan wrote that Joseph committed an act with a Miss Hill, a hired girl, near the time of Joseph III's birth. Emma saw him and spoke to him he desisted, but Mrs. Smith refused to be satisfied. Joseph called in Dr. Williams, O. Cowdery, and S. Rigdon to reconcile Emma, but she told them just as the circumstances took place. He found he was caught. He confessed humbly, and begged forgiveness. Emma and all forgave him. She told me this story was true. McClellan's second-hand account, written 40 years after it allegedly happened and 25 years after he discussed it with Emma, has similarities to another incident that occurred around the time of the birth of Emma's second son. Frederick. Emma took 19-year-old Fanny Alger into her home early in 1835. Fanny's parents and brother were members of the church. Benjamin F. Johnson said she was a very nice and comely young woman about my own age, towards whom not only myself but everyone seemed partial for the amiability of her character and it was whispered even then that Joseph loved her. But Joseph loved her indiscreetly. For Warren Parrish told Benjamin Johnson that he himself and Oliver Cowdery did know that Joseph had Fanny Alger as a wife for they were spied upon and found together. William McClellan told his account of Joseph and Fanny Alger to a newspaper reporter in 1875. McClellan informed me of the spot where the first well-authenticated case of polygamy took place, in which Joseph Smith was sealed to the hired girl. The sealing took place in a barn on the haymow and was witnessed by Mrs. Smith through a crack in the door. Long afterwards when he visited Mrs. Emma Smith she then and there declared on her honor that it was a fact, saw it with her own eyes. In an 1872 letter McClellan gave other details of the story. He said that Emma missed both Fanny and Joseph one night and went to look for them. She saw him and Fanny in the barn together alone. She looked through the crack and saw the transaction. She told me this story too was verily true. Joseph's theology may have allowed him to marry Fanny, but Emma was not ready to share her marriage with another woman. When Fanny's pregnancy became obvious, Emma forced her to leave. Perhaps, in his old age, William McClellan confused the hired girl, Fanny Alger, with the Fanny Hill of John Cleland's 1749 novel and came up with the hired girl. Miss Hill the incident drove a serious wedge between Oliver Cowdery and Joseph. Olive wrote to his brother Warren from Missouri on January 21, 1838, When Joseph was here, we had some conversation in which in every instance I did not fail to affirm that what I had said was strictly true. A dirty, nasty, filthy affair of his and Fanny Alger's was talked over in which I strictly declared that I had never deviated from the truth in the matter. Just before leaving, he wanted to drop every past thing in which had been a difficulty or difference. He called witnesses to the fact, gave me his hand in their presence. But handshakes and gentlemen's agreements are pitiful dams in the face of flooding gossip. In an 1886 statement to Mrs. Alexander repeated rumors she had heard in Kirtland. While there is little corroborating evidence for much of what she said, one of her more colorful stories illustrates the type of rumor with which Emma contended. She said Emma hired a jovial, talkative, 
to a hundred pound lady to work for her. Everyone liked Polly Biswick because she was very agreeable in conversation, a colourful gossip. Polly told her friends that Joe Smith said he had a revelation to lie with Vienna Jack, who lived in his family, and that Emma told her Joseph would get up in the night and go to Vienna's bed. According to Polly, Emma would get out of humour, fret and scold and flounce in the harness, then Joseph would shut himself up in a room and pray for a revelation stated to her, and bring her around all right. Polly said Emma was a very fine woman. Emma's front against her tail-bearing neighbours was a quiet reserve, but her anxiety showed through. She wrote to Joseph and closed her letter with a quiet plea. I pray that God will keep you in purity and safety till we all meet again. And in another letter, I hope that we shall be so humble and pure before God that he will set us at liberty to be our own masters. Emma was not the only one upset by the prevailing rumours. Attempting to make the Mormon's position on marriage very clear, W. W. Phelps had introduced an article on marriage at a General Assembly of the Church on August 17, 1835, while Joseph was in Michigan. In his absence the Assembly voted unanimously to print it in the Doctrine and Covenants where it remained in all editions until 1876, when LDS church officials removed it. The statement read in part, Inasmuch as this Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication, and polygamy, we declare that we believe, that one man should have one wife, and one woman but one husband, except in case of death, when neither is at liberty to marry again. The statement did little to stem rumor and gossip but it reassured church members. All the discordant elements of the Kirtland era fermented to a head in the fall and winter of 1837. William E. McClellan believed the presidency to a great extent were absolved in temporal things. Although his observations may have been colored by bitterness, he wrote in 1872 that the presidency and leading men, about fifteen couples, hired expensive carriages and drove to Cleveland to show big. McClellan said some became intoxicated and smashed things up generally before coming home the next day still under the influence, but no confessions were ever required or made. If McClellan's picture was accurate, this event further eroded Joseph's standing among the people. Joseph had spent much of the year absent from Kirtland, finding with each return that the situation was worse. Inflated real estate prices, failure of the bank, and disillusionment with Joseph's leadership brought on a crisis. David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and W. W. Phelps spoke against Joseph. They organized a rival church with David Whitmer as president and intended to use the temple. They say they will have it if it is by the shedding of blood, wrote Hebzebeer Richards. Six of the twelve apostles rebelled. In a meeting in the temple in December 1837, Joseph and Sidney Rigdon led one faction of the church and Oliver Cowdery and the Whitmers led another. Brigham Young declared Joseph was still a prophet and in favor with God. On the morning of December 22, a mob of dissenters hounded Brigham Young out of Kirtland in return for his support of Joseph. The halcyon days that Mary Fielding described as a quiet, comfortable waiting upon God in his house were over. As the storm gathered, Eliza Snow reflected. For C. R. C. In yonder eastern land, in Kirtland City, a promiscuous band, where wheat and tares to such a height had grown that saints could scarce from hypocrites be known. Caroline Crosby heard that her neighbors were leaving the church, we had taken sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God as friends. But they came out badly against the prophet. Hebzebeer Richards's letters illuminated those volatile months. I care not how soon I am away from this place she wrote. I have been wading in a sea of tribulation ever since I came here. The people have been tempest toast, and at times the waves have well nigh overwhelmed us. A leader in the anti-Mormon faction, Grandison Newell, formally charged Joseph with fraud. At ten o'clock in the evening on January 12, 1838, Joseph and Sidney Rigdon left Kirtland on the fastest horses they could find. Emma, now thirty-three, packed her wagon knowing whatever she left behind would become common plunder. She made a place for Julia, six, and Joseph, five, an eighteen-month-old Frederick among the scanty provisions. Emma left Kirtland in much the same way as she had arrived, pregnant, and in the dead of winter. Zion in Missouri lay eight hundred miles away. Behind her in Kirtland, Hebzebeer Richards woke at one o'clock in the morning to see the eerie light of burning buildings flickering on the walls. The printing office went up in flames the temple stood badly scorched. I am not pained at the thought of leaving Kirtland, mused Hepzibah, 
for I have never felt at home here. I believe there are good people in Kirtland but it is not a good place to make Mormons. Strife in Missouri 1838-1839, Joseph's departure from Kirtland signaled an end to the Mormon efforts to build up a settlement in Ohio, and most of the members prepared to follow him to Missouri, hoping in vain to receive fair prices for their property. Apparently, Emma and Joseph received nothing for their home. Emma traveled with the Rigdon family 60 miles south to Norton, Ohio, arriving only 36 hours after Joseph and Sydney, a remarkable achievement considering that the men rode without baggage. Four days after Joseph fled Kirtland, they left on the second leg of their journey to far west. Missouri. Armed mobs followed them for 200 miles. Often Joseph and Sidney lay in the back of the wagon, hidden by hanging blankets. Twice their pursuers ate in the same roadhouse, unaware of their quarry. One night as Emma settled her family in a hostelry, she heard men's voices through the thin walls. Their pursuers were staying the night in the same house, bragging about their plans to catch Joseph and Sidney. Late that evening several men barged into the room but failed to recognize the Smith and Rigdon families. In Dublin, Indiana, Joseph tried unsuccessfully to find work cutting cordwood and sawing logs. Brigham and his family had arrived there a month earlier. He contacted a local church member who had been trying to sell his tavern stand. This man soon received a generous offer that Brigham said was the hand of the Lord to deliver President Joseph Smith from his present necessity. The man gave the prophet $300, enough money to continue on for more than two months. The Smith family resumed their travels toward Quincy, Illinois, where Brigham would catch up with them. At five years of age, young Joseph remembered the trek as half lark and half terror. When the trail changed from dirt to rough log corduroy, Riding in the pitching wagon tired the passengers more than walking. Young Joseph recalled stepping over the rigid poles, holding tightly to his mother's hand, the dog, Major, bounding beside them. By February they had reached Quincy, Illinois, on the banks of the Mississippi, and were dismayed to find the ice dangerous to cross because it had broken up, then frozen over. Brigham Young remembered pulling the teams through an abandoned flatboat onto the ice stringing out both wagons and teams to distribute the weight. Joseph's horse, Charlie, broke through at every step for several rods. A few days into Missouri the wagons came to the banks of the Salt River. The old ice had sunk and a foot of new ice had frozen over the top. Brigham said, by plunging our wagons two and a half, or three feet into the water at the edge, we could gain the solid ice. The men balanced a canoe over open water from shore to ice. Emma, six months pregnant, walked gingerly through the unsteady canoe, crossed the ice, and repeated the process on the far bank. 120 miles east of far west a group of exuberant saints met the travelers with fresh teams, a carriage, and money. Eight miles from town, a brass band met them with an enthusiastic salute. Emma must have smiled. It was exactly the kind of gesture Joseph loved. In far west. Missouri, Lucinda Morgan Harris and her husband George welcomed Emma and Joseph into their home. Lucinda Harris was three years older than Emma, a pretty woman with fair hair and blue eyes. She had once been married to a prominent mason named William Morgan whose disappearance in western New York was highly publicized at the time Emma and Joseph lived there. By the time Joseph brought Emma to Far West he had become close friends with Lucinda and her second husband and had often stayed in their home while in Missouri. Two months later Joseph and Emma moved into their own house on the town square inches far west. She set up a leech in her yard by piling ashes from the hearth into a perforated hollow log and pouring water over them. The resulting pungent liquid contained lye, which Emma mixed with waste fat to make soap. While they planted their garden, Joseph stood in the hand-turned furrows and reflected on the luxury of town life in Ohio. All we had to do back in Kirtland was put out the fire and call the dog but settling is a different thing. Thinking the surrounding woods harbored peace, Emma answered, I prefer settling. On June 2, 1838, Emma's gave birth to another son. This one would have his father's blue eyes and light hair. According to tradition, Emma teased that he was born in a hailstorm and named the child Alexander Hale Smith. Lucinda Morgan Harris probably cared for Emma as Joseph left two days after the birth for a small Mormon settlement 25 miles from far west named Adam on Diarman. Joseph designated Adam on Diarman and Davis County as the settling place for the Kirtland Saints, and they soon streamed into the area. Far West, in Caldwell County, had 1500 people, 
and the Mormons spilled over into Davis, Ray, and Carroll counties when they purchased land contiguous to one another. This settlement pattern afforded a natural power block. Joseph planned a great city and taught that the Mormons would have a temple and become a mighty people. The ragged saints quickly grasped the concept of future glory and announced to their neighbors with enthusiasm that this was the land of their inheritance and would be theirs forever. The Missourians were angered to see the land taken up. Some began to say that the country was not big enough to hold them both. The Mormons would have to go. Both Mormons and Missourians made rash charges. Riders harassed Mormon outposts, and the saints turned inward in mutual defense. While the tensions fermented between the two groups, serious conflict appeared between Joseph and some of the other church leaders. Before Joseph's arrival, two of the Whitmer brothers, David and John, and William W. Phelps had sold their property in Jackson County contrary to Joseph's orders. On March 10 the church court in Missouri excommunicated them. Complaints against Oliver Cowdery for vexatious lawsuits falsely insinuating that Joseph Smith was guilty of adultery selling his lands in Jackson County, leaving his calling for the sake of filthy lucre, and turning to the practice of law led to his excommunication on April 12, 1838. Lyman Johnson soon followed. When Sidney Rigdon rode into Far West and learned that these former church leaders still lived among the saints, he exploded with anger. Two weeks after Emma's gave birth to Alexander, Sidney Rigdon harangued the church members over their laxity in allowing excommunicated leaders to remain in the area. Eventually 83 Mormons signed an ultimatum giving the dissenters three days to get out of Far West. While Oliver Cowdery, the Whitmers, and Lyman Johnson rode to Liberty for legal aid, their families were thrown into the street and their belongings strewn about by the Mormons. Oliver was stunned and blamed Rigdon for influencing Joseph to become an enemy. Oliver had lived in Emma's home and she, in turn, had received warm hospitality from the Whitmer and Johnson families. She could only have been saddened by this brutal treatment. Emboldened by Joseph's tolerance of such actions, Sampson Avard and Jared Carter soon organized a secret society of male members. Called the Sons of Dan, they quickly shortened the name to Danites. They were bound together by oaths and secret signs and signals, and sworn to uphold the church and each other to the point of death. These men encouraged each other to a harsh militarism that would haunt the church for another 40 years. On the 4th of July the Mormons celebrated with a public show of military strength and invited their neighbors to watch. A brass band marched to the central square inches far west. Behind the band came the infantry, then the church leaders, followed by women and children. Emma most likely among them. A cavalry brought up the rear. Mormon determination showed in every step. The Missourians watched in a confusion of anger puzzlement, and mockery. Sidney Rigdon gave the oration, beginning with the text, better, far better, to sleep with the dead than be oppressed with the living. He built his patriotic ideas carefully at first, then frenzy overcame him. We are wearied of being smitten, he cried to the impoverished Mormons, and tired of being trampled upon. But from this day and hour, we will suffer it no more. And that mob that comes on us to disturb us, it shall be between us and them a war of extermination. The Mormons stood rapt, gone was the reference to the other cheek. We will follow them till the last drop of their blood is spilled or else they will have to exterminate us, for we will carry the seat of war to their own houses and their own families. We this day then proclaim ourselves free, with a purpose and a determination that never can be broken, no never, no never, no never, Sidney's rhetoric brought an amen. That reverberated like thunder, Joseph himself shouted Hosanna and the crowd broke out in wild cheering. Publication of the speech enraged the Missouri press, which then heaped abuse on the Mormons. William Page, Peniston, colonel of the Davis County Militia and candidate for the state legislature, picked up the gauntlet and initiated a free-for-all at the Gallatin polling place on election day. The fight lasted only a few minutes. The Mormons voted and left but exaggerated rumors of the altercation flew to both Joseph and the Missouri authorities. Roving mobs soon hit isolated Mormon settlements. Hiram Smith reported that they frequently took men, women, and children prisoners, whipping them and lacerating their bodies with hickory scythes and tying them to trees, and depriving them of food until they were compelled to gnaw the bark from the trees. The Missourians perfected a technique for pulling down houses. One or two lariats snaked out in the night and looped around a cabin ridge pole. Horses leaned into the rope sand, with a sharp crack, the roof swung free, 
leaving an open shell. If the mob worked quietly enough, the cracking roof was the first sign of attack to a sleeping family. Few Mormons dared to rebuild but gathered what they could carry and left. Armed men approaching an isolated cabin were a fearful sight, but when they came in shapeless blanket coats with their faces blackened with charcoal, they could rape women and kill children and not be identified in court. After the Missourians laid siege to it, the Mormons abandoned a wit and traveled to far west without provisions. The crowded town offered no habitations or houses to shelter them, and they were huddled together, some in tents and others under blankets with almost no supplies. Lyman White, a bold and loyal supporter of the church, wolfed down a piece of Emma's bread. Why, Sister Emma, he said, with a chunk of cornbread like this in my hand, I could go out of doors and stand at the corner of the house in the northwest wind and eat myself into a sweat. The experiences of Emma's two sisters-in-law brought the seriousness of the situation home to her and the Smith family. Mary Bailey, Samuel's wife, was forced to leave her home with a four-day-old baby and her small children beside her in an open lumber wagon. An eleven-year-old boy drove them the thirty miles to Far West. Lucy said when Mary arrived she was entirely speechless and stiff with the cold. I continued to employ every means that lay in my power for her recovery, and in this I was much assisted by Emma. The family soon learned that Don Carlos's wife, Agnes Coolbrith, had fared no better. While her husband was on a mission in Virginia a mob turned her out of her house on October 17. She waded the waist-deep Grand River with a babe in arms and a two-and-a-half-year-old child, then walked through three inches of snow to find Lyman White's house at eleven o'clock at night. White, furious that a mob would treat a woman so, stormed into the headquarters of the Mormon-controlled militia and demanded. How long must we suffer this violence? He was told to arm the Mormons and disperse the mobs around Adamondi Armen. On October 18, Lyman White and David Patton marched at the head of 40 men to retaliate by raiding farms, burning houses, and carrying off food. Emma's and Joseph's home in Far West became the clearinghouse for defense against the mobs. To Emma's door came rumors and accounts of burnings, plunderings, killings, and brutality. A young drummer boy, Arthur Malikin, had been shot in both legs and was carried to Emma to nurse back to health. Arthur would later marry Joseph's youngest sister, Lucy. Word spread throughout Missouri that the Mormons were armed and would fight back. A Captain Bogard led a militia group that engaged 70 Mormon men led by David Patton. The battle left Patton mortally wounded, two other Mormons dead, and one Missourian killed. Patton's wife rushed to see him before he died. A few days later Violet Kimball and her daughter Helen visited Patton's widow. Feban. Helen recalled that a bowie knife hung from her belt and a cauldron of water boiled on the stove. Mrs. Patton carried a dipper, intending, she said, to fight if any of the demons came there. On October 27, 1838, two days after the battle at Crooked River, Governor Lilburn W. Boggs issued an order to Major General John B. Clark that repeated Sidney Rigdon's rhetoric of less than four months earlier. It read in part, Your orders are, therefore, to hasten your operations. The Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state. Armed with an open license to hunt, the mobs roamed through the Mormon counties. Three days after the extermination order, the mob ravaged a little settlement called Juan's Mill, where fifteen or twenty families had settled along Shoal Creek. Several companies of Missouri militia converged upon the mill on October 30, 1838, at four o'clock in the afternoon. Some people ran to the woods, others fled to the blacksmith's shop. The militia shot through the cracks in the logs and picked off the crouching Mormons, including young boys, at will. William Huntington stumbled onto the tragedy. When he asked for directions to Juan's mill he was told that it was three miles beyond hell, and if I would go on I should get into hell before night. When some men threatened to tie him to a tree to chaw bark, Huntington took the advice whispered by a woman and left quickly, as she knew their intentions was to kill all Mormons who were not out of the county that day. Emma heard of outrages at Juan's Mill as the survivors straggled into Far West numb with shock and fear. The same day that the Juan's Mill massacre erupted, scouts reported that an army was marching toward Far West. Two thousand armed men milled in the flat, bent on killing the Mormons who spent a sleepless night. The Mormons barricaded the town with logs and hefted wagons and carts on top. Men tested guns and ammunition while the women packed, ready to leave if the flight was allowed. Joseph estimated they were outnumbered five to one. Rather than take up arms, 
some Mormon men quietly disappeared. They were regarded as cowards, but they believed they had preached moderation and could not make themselves heard. The next day 1500 reinforcements arrived for the Missouri troops. Besieged and outnumbered, Joseph decided to surrender. Toward evening, October 31st, Emma kissed him goodbye, then he, Sidney Rigdon, and Parley Page. Pratt walked out with a flag of truce. They were immediately surrounded and taken prisoner. The mob now had its pawns. A court-martial deliberated through the evening. Its decision, handed to Brigadier General Alexander W. Donifan, read, Sir, you will take Joseph Smith and the other prisoners into the public square of Far West and shoot them at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Samuel D. Lucas Major General Commanding Donifan told Joseph of the order, and rumor flashed it to Emma, who had only to look out her window to see the place Lucas designated. In an act of insubordination for which he was never called to task, Donifan refused to execute the command. In a terse note to his superior officer, he stated, It is cold-blooded murder. I will not obey your order. My brigade shall march for liberty tomorrow at eight o'clock and if you execute these men, I will hold you responsible before an earthly tribunal, so help me God. The men of Far West gave up their arms as part of the negotiations, then troops from the Missourians camp ran wild in the town. They drove Emma and the children into the street and pillaged the house. Had they known who the victims were, they might well have raped Emma as a means of insulting Joseph. Several cases of ravishment at Far West were reported. On Friday, November 2nd, a cold rain poured down as the militia marched Joseph and the other prisoners to the town square inches far west to prepare to take them to jail. In independence, the officers allowed Joseph to enter his house with a guard. Julia, Joseph, and Frederick grasped his legs and held to his clothing, afraid to let him out of their sight. Joyful to see him alive, desperately afraid to see him leave, Emma lost her composure and sobbed along with the children. The guard allowed no moment for private parting and forced Joseph into the street. Young Joseph still clung to his father's leg. Father, he cried, is the mob going to kill you? Emma watched the guard slam the child away with the side of his sword. You little brat, go back. You will see your father no more. Parley Page, Pratt and Hiram Smith bade their wives farewell under the same conditions. Mary Fielding Smith would soon give birth to her first child. A guard told her she need never think that she would see Hiram alive again. Joseph and the other prisoners soon sat in the wagon surrounded by guards. Joseph, Sr., and Lucy embraced each of the prisoners in silence, hands clutched through the wagon cover. Joseph's anguished God bless you, mother, came muffled through the canvas. Then the wagon rumbled off. Joseph was in General Moses Wilson's care during the march toward independence. He protected Joseph from lynching but soon learned he had an unusual man in his charge. I carried him into my house a prisoner in chains, and in less than two hours my wife loved him better than she did me, Wilson reported. Joseph later asked him to return the horse and saddle that Bogard had confiscated and that Wilson now owned. Wilson retaliated against his remarkable prisoner by keeping the horse. The prisoners arrived at Independence, Missouri, on Sunday, November 4. Joseph wrote to Emma that same day, My dear and beloved companion, of my bosom, in tribulation, and affliction, she read, L would inform you that I am well and that we are all of us in good spirits as regards our own fate. In a light-hearted attempt to ease Emma's fears he related their entry into the town with a touch of humor. We have been protected by the Jackson County boys, in the most genteel manner, and arrived here in the midst of a splendid parade. Emma learned something of the conditions under which Joseph wrote, even though his account had to be restrained. I can only pray for deliverance and take everything as it comes, with patience and fortitude. The letter also informed her that the men were lodged in a house instead of a jail. If we are permitted to stay any time here, we have obtained a promise that we may have our families brought to us. I want you to stay where you are until you hear from me again, I may send for you to bring you to me. His attempts to present a cheerful picture soon gave way to anxiety for Emma and the children. Conduct all matters as your circumstances and necessities require. May God give you wisdom and prudence and sobriety which I have every reason to believe you will. Those little children are subjects of my meditation continually, tell them that Father is yet alive, God grant that he may see them again. Joseph expressed his hope that Emma would not have to leave the area and be far there away. Oh, Emma for God's sake do not forsake me nor the truth but remember me, he entreated. If I do not meet you again, 
in this life may God grant that we may meet in heaven, I cannot express my feelings, my heart is full, farewell O oh my kind and affectionate Emma, I am yours forever. The comfort of the house in independence was short-lived. The prisoners were soon taken to the jail in Richmond where Emma's answer to Joseph's letter reached him. Her reassuring letter is no longer extant but it brought a rush of emotion from Joseph. I received your letter which I read over and over again, it was a sweet morsel to me. O oh God grant that I may have the privilege of seeing once more my lovely family, in the enjoyment, of the sweets of liberty to press them to my bosom and kiss their lovely cheeks would fill my heart with unspeakable gratitude. Joseph described the conditions under which they were being held, we are prisoners in chains, and under strong guards for Christ's sake and for no other causes brother Robeson is chained next to me. He has a true heart and a firm mind, brother White is next, bro, Rigdon, next, Hiram next, Polly next, Amaza, next, and thus, we are bound together in chains, as well as the cords of everlasting love. Mindful of the situation in which the children had last seen him, Joseph wrote, Tell the children that I am alive and trust I shall come and see them before long. Comfort their hearts all you can, and try to be comforted yourself. Tell little Joseph he must be a good boy, further loves him with a perfect love, he is the eldest and must not hurt those that are smaller than him but comfort them. Tell little Frederick, further loves him with all his heart, he is a lovely boy. Julia is a lovely little girl, I love her also, she is a promising child, tell her, further wants her to remember him and be a good girl. Little Alexander is on my mind continually. Oh, my affectionate Emma, I want you to remember that I am a true and faithful friend to you, and the children, forever. My heart is entwined around yours forever and ever. Oh, may God bless you all. Joseph asked her to visit him and bring the children if she could. In far west. Emma gathered what supplies were available for the coming winter and prepared to leave on a moment's notice, should the opportunity arise to see Joseph. Jeremiah Willie had stopped by Emma's house to see and comfort Joseph's wife in distress. She promptly enlisted his services to carry messages to Joseph. On November 30 Joseph and five of his fellow prisoners entered the Liberty Jail. Twenty-five miles to the west of Richmond in Clay County. Five other men arrested at the same time as Joseph remained in the Richmond jail. Emma heard of the move from Joseph, my dear companion, I take this opportunity to inform you that we arrived in liberty and committed to jail this evening. But we are all in good spirits. Captain Bogard will hand you this line. My respects to all. Remain where you are at present. Immediately after receiving this letter Emma took young Joseph and Sidney Rigdon's wife Phoebe to the prison to see Joseph. They found the men locked in a dungeon with dirt floors. A low ceiling rested on thick stone walls. The temperature inside was cold as the outside. When the prisoners built a fire the smoke choked them, for there was no chimney. Rough guards allowed the three visitors inside and the hinges creaked when the heavy door swung shut behind them. Emma, young Joseph, and Phoebe spent the night in the damp, half-lit cellar with Joseph and his companions but had to leave the following day. Emma returned soon. On December 20 she entered the cell again. This time she spent two days confined with Joseph along with the wives of Caleb Baldwin and Reynolds Cahoon. As the year ended, she returned to Far West. Emma had probably left her children home with friends during this last visit, but she entered her house to find that it had been sacked. A trunk stood open with its contents strewn about, a gold ring gone and a sealed letter opened, a roll of linen cloth, some valuable buttons, a piece of cashmere, and a number of prized books were missing. Hiram reported that Emma had been robbed of all she had. John Lowe Butler's journal records that William McClellan and another man went into brother Joseph's house and commenced searching over his things and sister Emma asked him why he done so. McClellan's answer was, because I can. Butler stated. He took all his jewelry out of Joseph's box and took a lot of his cloths and in fact, plundered the house and took the things off. Emma received word from Joseph that they suffered from the cold and he asked for quilts and bedding. John Butler recorded, My wife was up there when the word came, and she said that sister Emma cried and said that they had taken all of her bedcloths except one quilt and blanket and what could she do? So my wife with some other sisters said, Send him them and we will see that you shall have something to cover you and your children. My wife then went home and got some bedcloths and took them over to her. Emma pressed charges with the help of James Mulholland, Joseph's clerk, but apparently nothing was returned. The following month Emma went again to Liberty Jail, 
taking Mary Fielding to see Hiram. Mary had been bedridden since the premature birth of her son on November 13. Her sister Mercy, who cared for her, nursed the new baby, and watched over Hiram's five children by Jerusha or Barden, also had her own eight-month-old baby. Emma saw that Mary, still weak and ill, was loaded into a wagon bed with the two small babies tucked in beside her. Young Joseph found a warm place among the blankets. Mercy accompanied Emma to help care for Mary, and the women set out on the forty-mile trip. The bitter cold weather made them suffer much. They arrived at Liberty Jail January 21, 1839. The bleakness of the prison faded away for Joseph, who had his son and wife again, and for Hiram, who could see Mary's firstborn son. Kayla Baldwin, Alexander McRae, Sidney Rigdon, and Lyman White shared the cramped quarters with Joseph and Hiram, but no one slept that night. Instead, they had a spiritual feast that six-year-old Joseph would remember always. The six-foot, six-inch Alexander McRae, who could not stand upright in the low-ceilinged room, forgot the stiffness in his shoulders when the familiar words of the massacre at River Raisin rang out, probably hoping the guards eavesdropped. The visiting Erastus Snow launched a mischievous parody to the tune of Hunters of Kentucky and called it Moz of Missouri. Before the night was over Joseph had decided to give his son a blessing, perhaps because Hiram blessed his new son. Joseph laid his hands on young Joseph's head and pronounced on the boy all the blessings to which he himself was heir through his progenitors. In later years young Joseph would not remember the content of the blessing only that it had occurred. No one in the jail cell with Joseph ever recorded having witnessed the event. Neither Joseph nor Hiram mentioned it in his journal, but apparently it was a tender father's blessing, loving and personal. Joseph would bless this son again in ways that had more public implications. The harsh grating sound of the door closing between Emma and Joseph probably remained in her thoughts long after her departure. But Emma left with hope this time. Sheriff Samuel Hadley, who was in charge of the jail, told her, all the authorities are waiting for us for you to get out of the state and the prisoners will be let out. There is no reason for detaining them other than the unreasonable orders given. The sheriff knew that Joseph would go to Emma as soon as he was released and would risk harm or re-arrest. If Emma were in another state, Missouri law could not touch him. She returned to Far West to prepare to leave it again. Pressure from the mobs steadily increased. If you forsake your Mormon prophet we will become your brothers and will fight for you and we will protect you but if you will not, why we will fall upon you. It was that simple in the eyes of many Missourians, but most Mormons stuck to their faith. As Nathan Knight trudged out of Far West, he tallied the worth of his losses, one cow shot, forty dollars, one horse taken and spoiled, eighty, wearing apparel, forty-six, bedding sixty, one ox, seven, one gun, ten, umbrella, razor, bake oven, seven. 77, for being shot through lungs and finger, 5,000, for being compelled to leave Missouri, 1,000. In conference with Joseph and the others, Brigham Young made the decision to move the Mormons east, back through Missouri and across the Mississippi River to Illinois. Emma was in Far West for only about 10 days after she left Liberty Jail. The Elder Smiths packed a wagon, then unpacked again, because Emma wanted the wagon. Lucy said. Emma filled the wagon with supplies and her four children, but one item remained. While Joseph was imprisoned, his scribe, James Mulholland, had stayed in Emma's home and kept Joseph's papers. When the local men became unruly, Mulholland gave the papers to his sister-in-law, thinking a woman might escape search. Immediately on taking possession of the papers, and Scott related, I made two cotton bags of sufficient size to contain them sewing a band around the top ends of sufficient length to button around my waist, and I carried those papers on my person in the daytime, when the mob was round, and slept with them under my pillow at night. I gave them to Sister Emma Smith. On the evening of her departure for commerce, the following morning, February 7, 1839, Emma and her children left far west with a group headed by Stephen Markham. A friend drove her team and cared for her horses. One afternoon Emma stopped at a log farmhouse. Young Joseph recalled that a yelping pack of dogs met them at the gate, but the farmer and his wife made Emma and the children comfortable. A great fire warmed one end of the double log home and the family slept safely on the floor. The Mississippi had frozen over before Emma arrived. Fearful of the thin ice, she separated the two horses put Charlie on her wagon and trailed Jim behind, then walked apart with two-and-a-half-year-old Frederick, 
and eight-month-old Alexander in her arms. She had Julia hold tightly to her skirt on one side, positioned young Joseph on the other, and, with the heavy bags of Joseph's papers fastened securely to her waist, Emma walked across the frozen river to safety. Of this trek she later wrote, No one but God knows the reflections of my mind and the feelings of my heart when I left our house and home, and almost all of everything that we possessed excepting our little children, and took my journey out of the state of Missouri, leaving Joseph shut up in that lonesome prison. But the reflection is more than human nature ought to bear, and if God does not record our sufferings and avenge our wrongs on them that are guilty, I shall be sadly mistaken. Sanctuary in a Swamp, 1839-1841 Emma walked up the east bank of the Mississippi and into the outskirts of a small town named Quincy on February 15, 1839. She was now 34. One year earlier she had crossed the ice in the opposite direction with Joseph and Brigham Young on their way to Missouri. But Zion now lay in shambles. A week after Emma left far west the elder Smiths joined Brigham Young's company and soon arrived in Quincy. They were joined by other saints throughout the winter. The citizens of Quincy responded to the Mormons' needs with extraordinary compassion. Sarah Kinsley Cleveland and her husband John took Emma and her children into their home three miles from town. Every other shelter available filled with refugees. On March 9, 1839, Emma wrote to Joseph, I shall not attempt to write my feelings altogether, for the situation in which you are, the walls, bars, and bolts, rolling rivers, running streams, rising hills, sinking valleys and spreading prairies that separate us, and the cruel injustice that first cast you into prison and still holds you there, with many other considerations, places my feelings far beyond description. She credited the direct interposition of divine mercy in helping her endure the scenes of suffering that I have passed through but I still live and am yet willing to suffer more if it is the will of kind heaven, that I should for your sake. Emma told Joseph with maternal pride that little Alexander was one of the finest little fellows you ever saw in your life and was learning to walk by pushing a chair around the Cleveland house. She expressed appreciation for the help that the Quincy people offered. Then, embarrassed at her handwriting, she explained that hard work stiffened her hands, and her heart convulsed with intense anxiety over his welfare. She closed her letter with I am ever yours affectionately. Joseph and his companions in jail acknowledged. We received some letters last evening, one from Emma, one from Don C. Smith, and one from Bishop Partridge, all breathing a kind and consoling spirit they were to our souls as the gentle air is refreshing. Emma's and Joseph's correspondence reveals that her love, affection, and loyalty helped sustain him through those winter months, yet he worried. Do you think that my being cast into prison renders me less worthy of your friendship? He asked, then answered himself, no. I do not think so. In the meantime, the guards heaped verbal abuse and foul language on the men confined in the cell until Joseph finally stood one night and in the name of God rebuked them to silence. He prayed in despair and the response was, My son, peace be unto thy soul, thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment. With spring came new hope. And Joseph directed Emma to speak to the church in his behalf on March 21st. I have sent an epistle to the church directed to you because I wanted you to have the first reading of it. I want all the church to make out a bill of damages and apply to the United States court as soon as possible. However they will find out what can be done themselves. You expressed my feelings concerning the order and I believe that there is a way to get redress for such things. He also expressed concern for Emma. I very well know your toils and sympathize with you, he told her. If God will spare my life once more to have the privilege of taking care of you I will ease your care and endeavor to comfort your heart. Tell me all you can and even if old Major the dog is alive yet and what those little prattlers say that cling around your neck, he requested. Do you tell them that I am in prison that their lives might be saved? Emma heard rumors that Joseph might be set free. Whenever she could persuade someone to go to the wharf and make inquiry, she did. One day in April, Dimmock Huntington rode three miles into town at Emma's request. He lounged around the boat landing while the Quincy ferry docked about eight o'clock in the morning. A disheveled traveler leaned against the side rail with his head turned away. Ragged pants were tucked inside old boots full of holes. He wore a blue cloak with a collar turned up to hide his face, and a wide-brimmed black hat drooped down over his unkempt beard. His skin was pale and his body wasted. Dimmock approached the ferry as the man guardedly raised his head. My God! Huntington exclaimed. Brother Joseph, 
is that you? Alarmed, Joseph hushed Dimmick and immediately asked about Emma and the children. Huntington explained that they were several miles away and asked if he did not want to find his parents first. Impatient at any delay, Joseph insisted, take me to my family as quick as you can. Dimmock located a second horse and Joseph slouched in the saddle to avoid detection as they negotiated the back streets of town. Joseph did not realize that Mormons could hold their heads up in Quincy. As they approached the Cleveland house Dimmock hung back, suspecting that a reunion worth observing might be at hand. Emma's glanced through the door at the stranger stopping at the yard and recognized him before he had time to dismount. She ran through the door and was in Joseph's arms before he was halfway to the front gate. Joseph explained that the Missourians had decided to set some of the men free and found a most unusual way to do it. During a move to another prison, the sheriff told the astonished prisoners, I'll take a good drink of grog and go to bed, and you may do as you have a mind to. Three guards slaked their thirst with whiskey and honey while a fourth saddled their horses for the Mormons. Joseph and Hiram and the others rode off before the guards could change their minds. Eight after five months they were finally free. Soon after Joseph's arrival Wandle Mace of Quincy heard him speak for the first time. Mace watched him carefully and observed that even after six months in prison he was a fine-looking man, tall and well-proportioned, strong and active, light complexion, blue eyes, and light hair and very little beard. He had a free and easy manner, not the least affectation, yet bold and independent, and very interesting and eloquent in speech. Before long Mace and his family requested baptism into the church. During the next month Joseph turned his attention to finding a permanent settlement for his people. While most of the Mormons from Missouri had gone to the ferry crossing at Quincy, a small group traveled farther north where they discovered some old military barracks at Montrose, Iowa. On the west side of the river, they found Isaac Gilland, the owner, across the river at a settlement called Commerce. Gilland offered to sell the Mormons his interests on both sides, but his deeds of conveyance were shaky at best. The church authorities believed they had purchased the lands outright, when in fact no clear titles existed to any land parcels in that area. Gilland watched the eager Mormons begin again that spring of 1839 and made his own prophecy of doom. The saints would continue to buy out the settlers and build up their area until they again acquire a sufficient quantity of honeycomb to induce the surrounding people to rob them again, at which time they will no doubt have to renounce their religion, or submit to a repetition of similar acts of violence, and outrage as have already been. Oblivious to Glenn's forecast, Emma and Joseph moved from Quincy to Commerce. 50 miles north on the east bank of the Mississippi. Joseph soon changed the name to Norvu, a name that he said meant the city beautiful. The town site lay on the peninsula of a horseshoe bend in the river. High bluffs ran along the east side of the area, while the peninsula itself was low and fiat. The soil was so wet from springs that a man could hardly walk on it and teams found it impossible. But despite these drawbacks the location offered exclusive access to the river. Norvu could become an important terminus for river traffic. Though it was a swamp, it was a spectacular site for the building of a city. On May 9, 1839, Emma moved her family into a small two-story log house which they called the homestead. It overlooked the Mississippi to the south. The single lower room had a fireplace in the west end, a staircase led to a second room above. Drinking water came from a well in the yard. Joseph, Sr., and Lucy Smith moved into a summer kitchen connected to the main building by a shared roof, while several small outbuildings scattered near the house provided shelter for other families. In a letter, Emma and Joseph told Sarah and John Cleveland that they had chosen a lot for them across the street from their own. Joseph also set aside the lot next to Cleveland's for Lucinda and George Harris. Soon after Emma moved, she purchased a cow from a nearby farmer. Mr. Hibbard taught young Joseph a principle of human nature he would remember all his life. Emma assigned her son to milk the cow, but halfway through, the cow would bolt for the Hibbard place leaving the boy fuming. The wily old cow had learned she could outmaneuver a boy with a bucket between his legs. Young Joseph frequently appeared at the Hibbard farm to get his cow and the old man and the boy became acquainted. The farmer, who appeared to be hard of hearing, was called Deaf Hibbard. Joseph's troubles with his cow probably made him laugh. One day Hibbard called Joseph to him and asked in a low voice, Is there anyone near? No, Mr. Hibbard, Joseph shouted loudly back. I can hear you very well, Joseph. 
Hibbard said. When there is no one near you needn't speak so loud to me. When somebody is about, then speak loud. The man then explained that his wife was a perpetual scold but that he turned a deaf ear to her storming. Joseph realized that Hibbard had been shamming for many years, but he never forgot to yell when others were present or to speak quietly when they were alone. It was an enlightening experience about hearing only what one wanted to hear. In the midst of the house building, plowing, and planting, many fell ill with the meanest of all diseases. The Mormons called it the ague, but it was malaria. The swamps harbored the Anopheles mosquito. The unsuspecting Mormons walked into the situation with their resistance already weakened by their miseries of the past winter. Oliver Huntington's mother became the third fatality in Nauvoo. The rest of the family were too sick to work. We were a pitiful set and none to pity us but God and his prophet, Brother Joseph seeing that we still grew worse, told William that we would all die if we stayed there, and that he must take the team and bring us down to his own house. So. He took us all into his own family. Joseph also found a child named Jane and brought her home as his wife Emma was a good nurse. Elizabeth Ann Whitney described her family as all sick with ague, chills and fever, and we were only just barely able to crawl around and wait upon each other. Under these trying circumstances my ninth child was born. Joseph, upon visiting us and seeing our change of circumstances, urged us at once to come and share his accommodations. We went to live in the Prophet Joseph's yard in a small cottage. The sick filled every bed in Emma's house and spilled over on to makeshift bed trolls outside. She and Joseph moved into a tent in the yard. When they could free themselves from nursing duties in their own home, they would ride on horseback, from place to place visiting the sick, anointing with oil, and lay hands on them and heal them and relieve their wants. Young Joseph carried water to the sick until he caught the disease himself. When he became impatient waiting for his mother to come to his bed, he crawled out of it and immediately fainted. Em replaced her child in bed and explained that he was not the only one sick, that she would come to him when she could. The unseen plague seemed to have no identifiable cause. People blamed the night air, vapors from putrid vegetable and animal matter, grief, fear, unripe fruit and intense thought. No amount of human compassion seemed to stay the disease. Some believed the powers of Satan were at work to destroy the people. By July 22 Joseph himself was down with malaria. Emma included him in her daily rounds and gave direction to others who were well enough to help her. Young Benjamin F. Johnson assisted with Joseph's care and served Emma's thin gruel of meal and water to the sick. Wendell Mace converted a coffee grinder into a portable mill that worked so well a ten-year-old boy could grind a bushel of wheat in an hour for Emma. While malaria was no laughing matter, a grim sense of humor enabled many Mormons to bear it with some grace. One sufferer, Charles Lowell Walker, wrote an ode to the ache that makes up in color for what it lacks in medical terms. Dear sufferer, it is for your sake I give the description of a shake, you first feel cold and very queer, and then you shake, oh dear, oh dear, next, fever burns with glowing heat and you are parched from head to feet. All those that shake say this is true and so does CLW. In August some members of the Quorum of the Twelve began leaving for missions to England. John Taylor and Wilford Woodruff answered Joseph's missionary call first. Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball left in September but were so sick that others had to boost them into the wagon. As it pulled away Heber commented to Brigham, this is pretty tough but let us rise and give them a cheer. They swayed to their feet, waved their hats, and yelled, hurrah, hurrah, hurrah for Israel. Their two sick wives leaned against the door and watched as long as they were able. In spite of the sickness Joseph sent a group of men back to far west for the Mormon printing press. The press and all the type had been buried for safekeeping and was now brought to Nauvoo, where the only place for it was an underground room with a stream of water flowing through it. Joseph assigned his brother Don Carlos and Mercy Fielding's husband, Robert B. Thompson, to help Ebenezer Robinson publish a newspaper, The Times and Seasons and print missionary pamphlets. When the cool fall air killed the mosquitoes, the malaria gradually decreased, and Emma turned her attention to bringing some order to her house. She took in two young girls, Julia and Savila Durfee, to work for her, Julia as seamstress and teacher, Savila as maid. Emma's kitchen duties were probably similar to the other women. They dried fruits and vegetables and cured meat. They wrapped rock-hard maple sugar loaves and hung them from rafters in the smokehouses. 
then hammered off small pieces as needed. Most of the milk was made into cheese which drained from cloth bags or perforated buckets hung from tree limbs or rafters. Kitchen utensils were simple homemade wooden cutting boards, rolling pins, spoons, and dough boxes. Emma might have beaten eggs with a whisk made of birch twigs tied together. A ringer and a washboard always stood nearby. For clothing to be very clean, the white things were boiled with homemade soap, making washed air day-long affair. Cook stoves were available, but few Mormons could afford the price. Instead, Emma made ash cakes in her fireplace by adding salt to sifted cornmeal mixed with boiling water. The ubiquitous cornmeal appeared in hasty pudding, corn dodgers, and corn bread sweetened with maple sugar or honey. It also made the dessert. While Emma became adept at making variations on the basic menu derived from cornmeal, her family still found the daily fare monotonous. On one occasion Haram's son John came with young Joseph to dinner. With a boy on each side, Joseph examined the food laid out on the table, then prayed, Lord, we thank thee for this Johnny cake, and ask thee to send us something better, Amen. The cornbread was cut and served, but before they could finish it a man at the door asked for Joseph. I have brought you some flour and a ham, he said. Joseph took the proffered gifts blessed the man for bringing them, then turned to Emma with a sly and mischievous grin. I knew the Lord would answer my prayer. While Emma became absorbed in her domestic responsibilities Joseph's desire to make somebody pay for the outrages in Missouri prompted him to go to Washington to seek compensation. Sidney Rigdon and three other men went with him. Just outside of Springfield, Illinois, Joseph's party met a company of seven wagons traveling from Canada to Nauvoo led by William Law a new convert to the church. Fate would twist the lives of Law, Emma, and Joseph together before their association ended. Emma first met William Law in Nauvoo when he handed her a letter from Joseph. He was a tall, well-built man with a pleasant manner. He found Emma's household full of sickness in spite of the High Council's resolution on October 20 that was also published in the Times and Seasons, that Joseph Smith, June and his family be exempt from receiving in future such crowds of visitors as have formerly thronged his house. Emma described her situation in a letter to Joseph. Someone had brought Orson Hyde and his wife, Nancy Marinda Johnson, to Emma the day Joseph left. She said they both had a ravaging disease. The next day James Mulholland's wife brought her sick husband to Emma, hoping her expert nursing would save his life. Emma nursed him for five weeks, then wrote to Joseph. His spirit left its suffering tenement for a better mansion than he had here. Emma's own children were also sick, Frederick's fever broke shortly after his father left, then young Joseph started with what Emma termed the chill fever. He suffered through two bouts of it, then lost a great deal of blood from a nosebleed. His slow recovery kept Emma worried. Joseph wrote, I shall be filled with constant anxiety about you and the children until I hear from you and in a particular manner little Frederick. It was so painful to leave him sick. Unable to restrain himself from offering instruction, Joseph went on, I hope you will watch over those tender offspring in a manner that is becoming a mother and a saint and try to cultivate their minds and learn them to read and be sober do not let them be exposed to the weather to take cold and try to get all the rest you can it will be a long and lonesome time during my absence from you and nothing but a sense of humanity could have urged me on to so great a sacrifice. A small prick of conscience may have reminded Joseph that this was not a good time to leave Emma alone. She was pregnant again. When Emma wrote to Joseph in December she told him, business does not go on quite as well since you left as when you were here. Much business remains unattended to, in consequence of it, though Hiram has put Robert B. Thompson, in his office, yet he has done nothing towards adjusting the business as yet, nor do I think he will. Carlos requests me to have you inform us, what became of the letter, which Mr. John Page Green, sent Ebenezer Robinson containing the names of a number of subscribers. Emma did not neglect to relay the concerns of Joseph's friends to him, there is manifested, far great anxiety for you in this place, that you may be prospered in the mission whereunto you are sent. Needing to be frugal with her candles and lamp oil, she closed with reluctance, as the night is fast approaching, I must reserve my better feeling until I have a better opportunity to express them, yours affectionately, Emma Smith. When Joseph reached Washington, he presented his case in person to Martin Van Buren. The president read the letter Joseph gave him, looked up, and remarked, What can I do? If I do anything I shall come in contact with the whole state of Missouri. 
The president insisted, your cause is just, but I can do nothing for you. Van Buren's dismissal of the Mormon claims angered Joseph, whose outspoken accusations against the state of Missouri activated the fury of its governor, Lilburn Boggs. Not content to have the Mormons out of Missouri, Boggs began an active campaign to have Joseph arrested and brought back for trial. Joseph and Sidney Rigdon brought new clothes from the East for their families. Joseph had three new suits, Sidney had four, and each one had clothing for their wives and children. Armin Babbitt, a lawyer who would eventually alienate both Joseph and Emma as well as Brigham Young, accused Joseph of extravagance. He probably expected Joseph and Emma to set an example of the gracious poverty worthy of poorly paid clerics. In reality, Emma had faced her losses with remarkable grace, and Joseph's gifts to his family were undoubtedly in recognition of their personal sacrifices. Still, some Mormons looked on their own poverty with remarkable humor and cheerfulness. The unmarried Abigail Pitkin wrote to a sister in Ohio, with chairs were blessed with only two Missouri claims. The remaining few, for old Missouri's wicked clan are cupboard kept, and warming pan. We have a heifer very small at present gives no milk at all, and fowls which throng our door but lack of corn will keep them poor, poor things, they'll have to make up meat when we have nothing else to eat. In dress and manners, we appear much as we did when you were here. Our names we keep but rather would exchange for better if we could we've many friends and many foes, many wants and many woes but still, I am content to be a Mormon, not a Pharisee. While the citizens of Norvu built up the city, Brigham Young, in England, incurred Joseph's displeasure. The incident involved Emma's responsibility to collect hymns, a prerogative of hers that Joseph guarded closely. Rather than ship books to England, Brigham and the other missionaries planned to publish the Book of Mormon and a hymnal that probably included Emma's selections as well as songs Joseph and the Twelve had chosen. On October 27, 1839, Five weeks after Brigham and others left for England, the High Council met and voted, that Sister Emma Smith select and publish a hymn book for the use of the church, and that Brigham Young be informed of this action and he does not publish the hymns taken by him from commerce. Unfortunately, the instructions never reached Brigham and he wrote to his wife Marianne in June 1840, we are printing three thousand copies of a hymn book 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon. I have now got through with the hymn book. I have had pretty much the whole of it to do myself. So, it has made my labor so hard that it seems as though it would be imposable for me ever to regain my health. Brigham then instructed Marianne to tell Brother Joseph Smith that I send as much love to him and Emma and family as I can get carried across the water. When Brigham wrote to his wife again in November, he had received a letter from Joseph. The tone distressed him, in Brother Joseph's letter he sent to the Twelve he said he had some things against them, according to what I could learn from the letter it was because we did not write to him upon the subject of printing the hymn book all I have to say about the matter as to myself is I have done all that I could to do good and promote the cause that we are in. Brigham was not aware that other church members had printed hymnals. David White Rogers, chairmaker of some means published a hymnal in New York in 1838 and plagiarized the preface from Emma's 1835 collection. 49 of 89 songs came from her hymnal. The same conference authorizing Emma to make a new selection of hymns also resolved that D.W. Rogers's hymn book be utterly discarded by the church. In the spring of 1841 Thomas Grover accused Rogers of several areas of misconduct, among them, compiling a hymn book and selling it as the one compiled by Sister Emma Smith. After many observations and explanations, it was resolved, that D. W. Rogers be forgiven, and the hand of fellowship be continued towards him. Another man, Benjamin C. Ellsworth, published a hymnal a year after Rogers. He lifted Emma's preface and used 66 hymns from her collection plus all but one of the remaining 40 from the Rogers book adding only seven to make 112 in all. He apparently escaped condemnation. Brigham and the Twelve survived the controversy generated over their hymnal relatively unscathed. Still thoughtful of Emma, he sent a copy of the hymn book published in England to her and checked on its safe arrival through another letter to Mary and the following January. Emma's expanded collection would come off the press in 1841, printed by Ebenezer Robinson. Emma often sang as she worked and surely some of the songs her family heard were in her collection. A young man named William Holmes Walker heard her sing the first time. He visited the Smith home in Norvu. I arrived at his Joseph's house about nine o'clock, just as his family was singing, before the accustomed evening prayer. His wife Emma, 
leading in the singing. I thought I had never heard such sweet, heavenly music before. When William's mother died the following year, he, his younger brother Lauren, and his sisters, Lucy and Catherine, would find a home with Emma and Joseph. Lucy Walker was then 15 and a half. Later in her autobiographical sketch she recalled Emma's and Joseph's kindness. The prophet and his wife introduced us as their sons and daughters. Every privilege was accorded us in the home. Every pleasure within reach was ours. When Lucy's eight-year-old sister Lydia became stricken with brain fever, Joseph told the boys to drive down to the Mississippi River then took her in his arms and baptized her. When Lydia was brought in, Sister Emma, noble woman that she was, helped change her clothing. And all that loving hearts and willing hands could do, was done. In spite of the best efforts of both Emma and Joseph, the girl died a few days after. Here let me say, Lucy wrote, that our own father and mother could scarcely have manifested greater solicitude for her recovery than did the prophet and his wife. Emma. They accompanied us to her last resting place beside her mother. The rest of the Walker children, with the exception of the baby, came to Emma's crowded home where she mothered them all for nearly two more years. William Walker married in November 1843 and brought his bride to live at Emma's for six months until he took the five youngest of the Walker children to live with him and his new wife. Taking in children in times of need was already an established pattern for Emma. In the spring of 1840, she gave a home to two of Edward and Lydia Partridge's daughters. Bishop Edward Partridge died on May 27, 1840. Lydia kept the small children with her, but Emma opened the first permanent daughter Emily, 16, and Eliza, 20, when she invited them to live with her. We did not work for wages but were provided with the necessities of life, Emily remembered. Joseph and Emma were very kind to us. They were almost like a father and mother and I loved Emma and the children. These sisters would remain in the Smith household for the next three years until circumstances unexpected by them all forced a separation. During the spring Joseph constructed a large room on the back of the homestead. A great fireplace in the north end allowed the extension to be used as a kitchen and the two original rooms became sleeping quarters. A special retreat lay hidden under the house, part way down the steps leading to the cellar. Joseph cut the timbers bearing the steps then hinged the stairs so a couple of them could be lifted forward. This gave entry to a small vaulted room with a dry brick floor and bricked walls large enough for two people to occupy either sitting or lying down. Ventilation came from spaces around the stairs. On June 14, 1840, another son was born to Emma and Joseph. They named him Don Carlos after his strapping uncle, probably one of several midwives who practiced in Norvu attended Emma in this birth. These women carried their medical instruments in small black baby satchels. They used scalpels, needles, scissors, tweezers, saw blades, a small hammer, a spool of heavy thread, a few obstetrical instruments, plus a package of scorched cloths which had been oven sterilized. Tradition states that Joseph blessed these women and set them apart as midwives. Evidence suggests that Emma occasionally helped at births. During these months Emma faced the challenges of domestic life. Her growing children sometimes displayed a streak of independence, a rightful inheritance in that family. Once Julia watched one of Sidney Rigdon's small daughters get what she wanted by banging her head on the floor and kicking the furniture. Julia decided to try the same approach. Don't you go lazy Rigdon on me. Emma scolded, and picked her child up from the floor. Another case involved Alexander and his older brother, Joseph. In the middle of a quarrel between the two the younger child bit the older. When Emma learned of the incident she calmly examined the teeth marks on Joseph's arm, rolled up Alexander's sleeve, and bit him in the same place. Emma taught Julia to sew and cook, and to read for there were no schools in Norvu for the first year or so. Emma later gave Julia the responsibility for teaching the boys their letters. From both their parents, the children learned generosity. One morning as Emma prepared breakfast the family heard a hesitant knock. Young Joseph answered the door. A black man named Jack stood waiting to see the Mormon leader. When invited in, he said he preferred to wait until the meal was over. Jack had lost one arm just below the elbow when a cannon discharged prematurely during a 4th of July celebration. The illness and fever that followed kept the man from working, and he had used up all his savings. Now he stood before the Smith store and explained that he could not get work because he looked so shabby. Joseph brought out a handsome buckskin suit that was his pride and gave it to the black man, 
who soon found a position on a steamer. Long before the suit wore out, he pressed payment for it on Joseph, who refused to accept it. The suit had been a gift. Emma's household remained lively with a constant flow of visitors while Norvu swelled with a steady number of converts filtering into the area. By far the largest group were immigrants from England who began to arrive in the city as converts of the Twelve. The first organized company sailed from Liverpool on June 6, 1840. Their experiences would be repeated in various forms until 4,700 of them eventually represented a third of the population of Norvu. Two of these converts. Jane and John Mullen, could not afford to come together. Jane remained in England while John sailed to the United States, found work and saved enough to bring his family over. Four months after he left, Jane gave birth to her third baby, who died at ten months of age. Eventually she docked in New Orleans with her two surviving children and four dollars in her purse. She worked for a riverboat captain to secure passage up the Mississippi River to Norvu where she was told her husband was dead. Emma took in Jane and her family for two weeks. Early one morning as Jane walked down the street to do a day's washing she met her husband face to face. The story of his death had been a rumor. The couple rented a house and began a new life. At this time Emma's concern for her husband's safety had resurfaced. Governor Lilburn Boggs of Missouri had sent a message to the governor of Illinois, Thomas Garlin, requesting the return of Joseph, Sidney Rigdon, Parley Page, Pratt, and others as fugitives from justice. When Carlin did not comply, Boggs sent his own men to Illinois to arrest Joseph. Joseph had been in and out of hiding several days. His father's health worsened throughout the summer of 1840. When the old patriarch began to vomit blood, Lucy sent for her children. After blessing each one, Joseph Smith, Sr., died on September 14, 1840. For Emma the loss was great, as he had been a father to her in the years since her estrangement from Isaac Hale. The family buried their father on September 15. Joseph made himself inconspicuous at the funeral for he had had word that the Missourians were looking for him. He went into hiding later that same day and managed to keep clear of the Missouri officials long enough to discourage them. Not long after his father's death Joseph reorganized the presidency of the church, realigning the priesthood powers. Hiram Smith became patriarch in place of his father, William Law took Hiram's place in the first presidency along with Joseph and Sidney Rigdon. At the same time Joseph became sole trustee and trust for the church, a decision that affected Emma. Joseph and other church leaders had bought several large tracts of land, and while it was clear that these men were purchasing land on which members of the church could dwell, they pledged their personal credit to do so. Soon Joseph, with the encouragement and consent of others in the church hierarchy, would transfer smaller pieces of land to Emma and the children. Joseph's private business and the affairs of the church were becoming intertwined, and Emma often assisted him in buying and selling land. Eventually the intermingling of church and private land would provide controversy strong enough to alienate Emma from some of her long-time friends. The year of Joseph, Sr.'s death, John Cook Bennett arrived in Norvu, joined the church and found a temporary place to live in Emma's home, about five feet nine inches tall, a handsome man with graying dark hair and black eyes, he was broad-shouldered, with a trim waist and hips. His face was rather thin, his mouth tight-lipped, and his manner ingratiating and smoothly polite. He had an air about him that annoyed Emma, and young Joseph recalled that she disliked him from the very first. Although Bennett made much of his abilities as a physician when he came to Norvu, Emma distrusted him enough to refuse to take his prescribed medicine during an illness. He lost further influence with her when he pulled young Joseph's tooth with a turnkey and the boy bled severely before a solution made of saltpeter on leather shavings finally checked the bleeding. Bennett had better luck with the community as a whole when he offered the suffering Mormons quinine for their malaria. After he had found another place to live, he still took many of his meals at Emma's house. Young Joseph recalled that his mother would set a loaf of her bread in front of the fire until the end was toasted brown then cut off a thin slice and replace the loaf. Thus, she prepared Bennett's supper of toasted bread and milk, just as he liked it. He expounded on a new food just coming into vogue, claiming that the love apple or tomato, had beneficial medicinal qualities. Bennett seemed to know something about almost everything. This impressed Joseph, who needed an urbane representative for the church. 
he hoped to have Norvu chartered under the state of Illinois. Bennett offered to guide the proposed documents through the legislature and did his job well by developing sympathy for the Mormons through graphic descriptions of the Missouri persecutions. The charters passed without so much as a complete reading giving the elected officers of the city broad powers. The city council could pass any ordinance not conflicting with the federal or state constitutions. The council could also act as the municipal court and could organize a militia that answered exclusively to the mayor. The mayor held a position of supreme power, for he formulated laws as a member of the city council, interpreted laws as a member of the court, and enforced them through the militia known as the Norvu Legion. Triumphant from his session with the Illinois Legislature, which passed the charters on December 16, 1840, John C. Bennett returned to Norvu in time to be elected the city's first mayor on February 1 of the new year. Few saints knew Bennett. That he secured such a high office so rapidly suggests that Joseph trusted him implicitly and had spoken on his behalf. Bennett wasted no time setting up an efficient military organization, complete with officers, ranks, and military drills, which attracted almost every able-bodied man in Norvu. Governor Thomas Carlin commissioned Joseph Lieutenant General of the Legion, and Joseph immediately made John C. Bennett second in command with the rank of Major General. Joseph wore a blue coat, gold-colored epaulets, high black boots, and a sweeping hat topped with ostrich feathers. He carried an impressive sword. Only John C. Bennett outshone him, resplendent in gold braid, buttons, and tassels. Emma and the wives of other distinguished officers often accompanied their companions on parade. One woman later wrote of Emma's fondness for horses and said she could manage them well in riding or driving. Many can recall seeing her mounted on horseback beside her husband in military parade and a grander couple could nowhere be found. She always dressed becomingly, and a riding costume showed off her shapely figure to the best advantage. The Mormons saw in the Legion strength and power that had been denied them earlier when they faced roving mobs. The Legion drilled regularly. Even the children, young Joseph included, marched behind the men. The boys brandished wooden swords and carried an impressive banner that announced, Our fathers we respect, our mothers we'll protect. They regarded the hated Missourians with much bravado from the safe side of the river. The Legion inspired boys games in the meadow near the river. They had mock guns, wooden bowie knives, and wild imaginations. Sometimes they were horse thieves, at other times explorers, pioneers, river pirates, or hunters. When young Joseph joined the group the game became Mormons and Missourians and the play was sometimes rough. He described the games to his mother with much enthusiasm. Emma listened with concern because ideas of revenge and violence were becoming real to her boys. She reasoned with her son, forbade that particular game, and repeatedly watched reason fail. Finally, willow in hand, Emma marched young Joseph to a secluded spot and applied firmer reason in a lower place. She had to take him to the same place two more nights, then he played with Frederick and remained in her sight. Joseph planned two large buildings for Norvu, a temple and a hotel. He wanted the Norvu temple to be the most splendid building on the Mississippi. On a hill overlooking the city, workers dug the foundation and on April 6, the 11th anniversary of the founding of the church, they laid the cornerstone with appropriate ceremony. This provided the Norvu Legion with its first opportunity for an impressive review. At 7.30 in the morning artillery fire announced the arrival of Brigadier Generals William Law and Don Carlos Smith in front of their cohorts. As a grown woman, Samuel Smith's daughter Mary wrote, I have heard Aunt Emma say that Don Carlos was the handsomest man she ever saw, that when in uniform and on horseback that he was magnificent and Aunt Emma was not given to undue laudations. Half an hour after Don Carlos's entry, Major General John C. Bennett was conducted to his post while the cannon fired. At 9.30 Lieutenant General Joseph Smith appeared on the grounds with his guard, staff, and field officers. Emma rode side saddle on her horse Charlie and, with a group of women, presented a silk American flag to Joseph. The cannon fired again. At noon the procession squared up on the temple site for Sidney Rigdon's oration. It reminded every man and woman present of the trials and hardships encountered on the long road from the organization of the church at the Whitmer farm to the present ceremonies. The military band marched on the field, then combined with a choir, and music rang through the half-completed streets of the Mormon city.
The day ended with Emma and the women serving a turkey dinner to the honored guests and officers. One guest watched the proceedings with increasing apprehension and anger. Whatever he saw or interpreted that day, Thomas C. Sharp, editor of the Warsaw Signal, went away a determined enemy of Joseph and the Mormons. Within three years Sharp would launch a concerted attack against the Mormons, using polygamy as his focal point. Unknown to Sharp at this time, Joseph Smith had already begun the practice of plural marriage in Nauvoo, just the evening before he had secretly married Louisa Beeman. A New Order of Marriage, 1841-1842, on the evening of April 5, 184, Joseph Bates Noble crossed the river from Montrose, Iowa, and met Joseph Smith under an elm tree. 26-year-old Louisa Beeman, dressed in a man's hat and coat, stood at Joseph's side, with Joseph telling him the words of the ceremony. Noble married his wife's sister to the Mormon prophet. The previous fall Joseph had approached Noble, a close friend, confiding in him the principle of celestial marriage. He said that God had revealed the doctrine to him in Kirtland but that an angel of the Lord had now appeared to him, commanding that he introduce this new order of marriage. That Joseph began teaching plural marriage in Nauvoo to Noble, who was not a member of the ranking councils of the church, is not surprising since Hiram Smith and Sidney Rigdon had expressed their distaste for Joseph's involvements in Kirtland, and the Twelve were still in England on their missions. Joseph swore noble to secrecy, saying, I have placed my life in your hands, therefore do not in an evil hour betray me to my enemies. Apostrophe. Similar statements would accompany Joseph's instructions to others indicating that he recognized plural marriage would bring upheaval to his people and perhaps result in his own death. Joseph kept his relationship with Louisa Beeman secret from all but a select few. He also kept it secret from Emma. His earlier attempts to begin the practice in Kirtland had presented severe trauma for Emma, and Joseph knew that she would not willingly share him with another woman. Early in that summer of 1841, however, Joseph publicly tested the water for this new order of marriage. Emma sat in a Sunday morning service in the grove of trees used as a meeting place and listened to Joseph preach the restoration of all things as they were in the times of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Suppose we send one of our elders to Turkey or India where they practice polygamy and he would say to them, Your laws are not good, you should put away your plural wives, what would they do to him? They would ask Elder, Is there not a land of Zion? a place where the saints should gather to? The elder should not lie to him. He shall say, Yes, brother, there is a land of Zion where saints of God are required to gather to the laws in Zion are such that you can bring your wives and enjoy them here as well as there. The elder shall say to that brother. One church member, Joseph Lee Robinson, heard the speech and later recorded it in his journal, adding, this was to me the first intimation that I ever received that polygamy would ever be practiced or lawful with his people. His brother Ebenezer later wrote of Don Carlos Smith's reaction, any man who will teach and practice the doctrine of spiritual wifery will go to hell, don't care if it is my brother Joseph. Joseph Robinson said the prophet went home to dinner but several of the first women of the church collected at the prophet's house with his wife, saying, oh Mr. Smith, you have done it now. It will never do. Why it is all but blasphemy. You must take back what you have said today. It is outrageous. It would ruin us as a people. Helen Mark Kimball, Violet's and Heber's daughter, later identified several of the women, including her mother and Emma, who were so persuasive. I will have to take that saying back and leave it as though there had been nothing said. Joseph acquiesced, interrupted his dinner and returned to the grove to address the congregation again in the afternoon. Minimizing his morning message, he told them the time for plural wives was in the future and admonished his listeners not to be concerned. He promised them that the Lord would help them to understand the purpose and do his will if they were faithful, but the future would be for the general membership. Not only had Joseph already taken plural wives, but over the next few months he would initiate the practice among a handful of his most trusted followers. The confrontation with Joseph over his sermon in the grove opened old issues for Emma. They certainly must have had conversations about plural marriage in Kirtland, but there is no record of how he might have alleviated Emma's fears that the problem would resurface, or if he explained to her a theological structure that would allow men more than one wife. Whatever he said to her, Emma's love for Joseph, together with her own pious upbringing, 
left no room for such a doctrine. Throughout her childhood Emma heard the conservative Methodist theology as it was preached by her uncle Nathaniel, but she accepted Joseph as her prophet as well as her husband and embraced an unorthodox religious belief as she did so. After the difficulties in Kirtland, she had faith that God had led Joseph in the paths that took them to Missouri and finally to Illinois. Emma had apparently believed that the issue of other wives was closed and hoped that it lay forever at rest. With quiet confidence, she had proceeded to remake her life in Nauvoo. Observers and writers have speculated about Joseph's motivation for initiating a practice that violated local laws and went against the prevailing Christian teachings of his time postulating that he was either a brilliant impostor or that he suffered from some mental disorder. Many concluded that the practice of polygamy stemmed from his own insatiable sexual drive, fueled by a quest for power. In an effort to defuse that charge somewhat, others have intimated that Emma was frigid and unresponsive, implying that if Joseph had a problem it must have been Emma's fault. Intimate details of their married life will remain unknown. For Emma and Joseph were no more likely to reveal their personal intimacies than anyone else, but some aspects of their marital relationship may be worth considering. In 1841 she and Joseph had been married 14 years and she had given birth to seven children and would bear two more in the next three years. From many sources, one can conclude that Emma experienced considerable discomfort which ranged from fainting spells to severe nausea during her pregnancies. These symptoms sometimes lasted throughout her pregnancies, rather than diminishing, as other women's often do. But, as her mother-in-law indicated, Emma was not one to pamper herself or complain and at times pushed herself to exhaustion. If Joseph found her unattractive or less desirable in the advanced stages of pregnancy, his own writings give no hint of it. He frequently referred to her as my affectionate Emma an endearment that he used almost exclusively with her, even though he often stated his love for many of his friends and supporters. The majority of faithful Mormons would give little consideration to Joseph's own physical drives or to other charges. With an almost compulsive emphasis on unquestioning loyalty to the priesthood authority as the cardinal virtue, they would maintain simply that God commanded plural marriage through the prophet Joseph Smith. If Joseph knew prior to 1840 that the restoration of all things, particularly plurality of wives, included marriage that would continue past death, there is no record that he included the concept in his conversations. He signed his early personal letters to Emma, your affectionate husband until death, O oh may the blessings of God rest upon you is the prayer of your husband until death, or your husband until death. Not until 1842 would his letters hint of marriage for eternity, saying, yours in haste, your affectionate husband until death through all eternity, and forevermore. While Joseph was in Philadelphia early in 1840, Parley Page Pratt recalled one of the earliest known accounts of Joseph's teaching eternal marriage. He said Joseph talked about the idea of eternal family organization, and the eternal union of the sexes. Until this time Pratt had believed close affections to be something from which the heart must be entirely weaned before one was prepared for heaven. It was from Joseph that I learned that the wife of my bosom might be secured to me for time and all eternity, while the result of our endless union would be an offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven, or the sands of the seashore. Pratt added one last significant remark, Joseph Smith had barely touched a single key had merely lifted a corner of the veil and given me a single glance into eternity. When Brigham and others of the Twelve returned to Nauvoo from England in July 1841, Joseph began immediately to teach them the new doctrine of marriage. Only this time he brought the concept of plural marriage together with eternal marriage into what would become known as celestial or patriarchal marriage. The combination did not bring forth the same euphoria that Pratt had experienced a year and a half earlier. In looking back on the occasion, Brigham Young said, It was the first time in my life that I had desired the grave, and I could hardly get over it for a long time. Herber C. Kimball begged Joseph to remove the requirement or he would leave the church, and John Taylor indicated that the Twelve seemed to put off as far as we could, what might be termed the evil day when they would take plural wives. Despite the reaction, Joseph was so relieved not to carry the burden alone that he reportedly clapped his hands and danced like a child. Joseph explained the doctrine to some of the Twelve together, presumably the three above mentioned, and Willard Richards, George A. Smith and Orson Pratt. 
he encouraged them not to delay in putting their new knowledge into practice. From July 1841 to April 1842 Joseph and the Twelve began educating themselves and various women to the acceptance of the plural wife doctrine. Joseph Lee Robinson commented, it could not be expected that they could enter into this new order of things without difficulty and some severe trials for it is calculated in its nature to severely try the women, to nearly tear their heart strings out of them, and also it must severely try the men as well. From 1841 until his death Joseph would continue to take more plural wives. 20th century historians disagree on the number. Andrew Jensen documented 27 from statements and affidavits of the women themselves or from witnesses to the marriages. Fawn Brody later added other sources to total 48. Stanley S. Ivins claimed 84. None of these writers attempted to assess whether these were connubial wives, sealed to Joseph only for eternity or linked merely by name. Emma would eventually know about some of Joseph's plural wives. Her knowledge of seven can be documented conclusively, and some evidence hints that she may have known of others. Persistent oral and family traditions insist that Joseph furthered children by at least four of his plural wives. Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner's comments illustrate the secrecy surrounding the birth of these children. As late as 1905 she commented, I knew he had three children. They told me, I think two of them are living today but they are not known as his children as they go by other names. Demographic studies of Norvu suggest that babies appeared as members of the household who were not born to the family perhaps indicating that children born in plurality were absorbed into trusted families. Josephine R. Fisher signed an affidavit in 1915 stating that, on her deathbed, her mother told her she was Joseph's child but admonished her to keep it secret. Most of the women who later stated that they were wives of Joseph steadfastly refused either to confirm or deny whether they had given birth to his children. How did Joseph determine who his plural wives would be? How did he and other men approach the women? What was the women's reaction to these unusual proposals? How did Emma finally come to her knowledge that Joseph both taught and practiced a new order of marriage? and what was her reaction both to the principal and to the women she encountered as his wives. The answers to these questions unfold over the next three years. It was one thing for Joseph to announce to the men that they were now to marry additional women, but it was another for those men to tell their wives. He told some of these men to keep plural marriages a secret from their first wives. For example, Mary Ann Young had retired to bed when men's voices outside the house awakened her. Joseph was explaining plural marriage to Brigham who objected, but Joseph argued that it was a test of faith, and the more wives Brigham took, the greater would be his glory in heaven. Overhearing this and knowing Brigham had never faltered in his loyalty to his prophet, Marianne lay back on the bed, sick at heart. She eventually accepted plural marriage, but how she came to her decision is unknown. Emma's friend Violet Kimball came about her knowledge of plural marriage in a different manner. Heber Kimball had honored Joseph's charge to keep the doctrine from his wife but appeared troubled. Helen said her mother began praying to know what was causing so much anxiety in Heber. The plan of celestial marriage was made known to her in a vision. She told him she knew about his dilemma and that he should obey. Kimball took Sarah Peak Noon, an English woman with two children, as his first plural wife. Initial reaction of those who left accounts almost universally described shock, horror, disbelief or general emotional confusion, followed by a period of inner turmoil lasting from several days to several months. People prayed and fasted, hoping for enlightenment, and often reported a compelling personal experience that brought them to accept plural marriage as a true principle. Violet Kimball described Parley Pratt's conversion in an 1843 letter to Heber. J has taught him some principles and told him his privilege, and even appointed one for him. I dare not tell you who it is. You would be astonished and I guess some tried. Sister Pratt has been raging against these things, she told me herself that the devil had been in her until within a few days past, she said the Lord had shown her it was all right they are so engaged I fear they will run to fast. In closing Violet told her husband to burn the letter, suggesting one reason so few contemporary documents concerning plural marriage are extant. No record exists of Joseph teaching the full theological backdrop for plural marriage before coming to Norvu, and two years would pass before he attempted to explain it to Emma. He would do it then only after she had confirmed her suspicions about him and had confronted him. Emma's friends learned from their husbands that Joseph had received a revelation outlining a new order of marriage 
but Emma came to it piecemeal over a number of years through circumstances that hurt and shocked her. Emma knew Joseph as no other mortal did, seeing him as both prophet and husband. In February 1843 Joseph told a visitor a prophet was a prophet only when he was acting as such. That same day he recorded in his journal, I went out with my little Frederick, to exercise myself by sliding on the ice. George Q. Cannon, a contemporary of Emma, and Joseph, wrote, Prophets must, like other men, eat drink and wear apparel. They have the physical necessities and the affections and enjoyments which are common to other men. And it is this petty human fact which leaves him without honor in his own country. Joseph Lee Robinson quoted Joseph as saying that God had revealed unto him that any man that ever committed adultery could never be raised to the highest exaltation in the celestial glory and that he felt anxious with regard to himself. Robinson went on to say that Joseph inquired of the Lord, that the Lord told him that he Joseph had never committed adultery. Why should Emma not question some of Joseph's actions when he questioned them himself? If Robinson's statement is true, it may indicate, as one writer suggests, Joseph's reluctance to leave behind the old monogamous system of marriage, or it may mean that he had some difficulty with the new standard he was teaching. After Joseph converted the twelve to plural marriage, another problem arose. It still remained for married men to ask women to marry them. Would a prospective wife accept the teachings with understanding? Would she reject them out of hand and make public accusations? Or would she quietly decline but remain silent out of loyalty? When Joseph approached Hiram Kimball's wife, Sarah Melissa Granger, early in 1842, Sarah said, I asked him to teach it to someone else. He looked at me reprovingly saying I will not cease to pray for you. Sarah learned that Joseph also wanted Rachel Ivins for a wife and forewarned her friend, who refused to meet with him. Both women remained in the church and kept their own counsel. In the few cases that did become public knowledge, the women's reputations were defamed by church leaders and family members alike. Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner indicated that Joseph had first commented in 1831 that she would one day become his wife. Joseph approached her again in 1834 but, afraid of the unusual arrangement, she married Adam Leitner on August 11, 1835. Early in 1842 Joseph again reminded her that he had been commanded to take her as a wife. By this time, Mary Elizabeth said. She had been dreaming for a number of years that she was his wife. She commented to Joseph, however, well, don't you think it was an angel of the devil that told you these things? No, it was an angel of God, Joseph reassured her. The angel came to me three times between the year 1834 and 1842 and said I was to obey that principle or he would slay me. Mary Elizabeth said Joseph told her that the last time the angel had come with a drawn sword and threatened his life. Joseph said I was his before I came here, and all the devils in hell should never get me from him. This extraordinarily powerful psychological and theological argument placed her in a contest between good and evil. Joseph held out one final argument that carried much weight in the eyes of those people who intended to live their lives by the word of God in order to inherit his kingdom. He offered salvation to Mary Elizabeth if she would accept his proposal. All that God gives me I shall take with me for I have that authority and that power conferred upon me. Mary Elizabeth said she would not be married to him until she too had a witness. If God told you that why does he not tell me? You shall have a witness, Joseph promised. Then he asked Mary Elizabeth if she was going to be a traitor. I shall never tell a mortal I had such a talk from a married man, she replied. Mary Elizabeth, who had been in Emma's home often and had taught painting to Julia, was mindful of another complication. She asked if Emma knew about her. Joseph neatly sidestepped the issue with an incomplete answer, Emma thinks the world of you. After making Joseph's proposal the subject of prayer, Mary Elizabeth said an angel passed silently through her room and at the window one night. After telling Joseph of the experience, she asked him why, if it was an angel of light, it did not speak to her. You covered your face, he told her, and for this reason the angel was insulted. Will it ever come again? Joseph thought for a moment, then said, Number. Not the same one, but if you are faithful you shall see greater things than that. He then predicted three signs that would take place in her family. Every word came true, she wrote. Brigham Young officiated at her marriage to Joseph. The next three years would prove to be a most difficult time, not only for Emma, 
but also for the small group to whom Joseph taught the new order. Most converts came into the church with a strong religious background and regarded immorality with abhorrence. Joseph's teachings for the exaltation of his people required a change in their cultural behavior as well as a religious conversion. New revelation was now the basis for their religion and Joseph insisted that the revelations that he received from God were absolute and he expected them to be obeyed. Unaware that Joseph was teaching the twelve and others the principles of plural marriage, Emma dealt with other problems. Death stalked the Smith family. The summer heat brought mosquitoes and with them the fever and chills of malaria. Don Carlos Smith caught the disease and died on August 7, 1841. His partner, Robert Thompson, Mercy Fielding's husband, followed him in death a fortnight later. In September Emma's 14-month-old baby, Don Carlos, suffered also from malaria and died on the 15th. This was Emma's fourth child to die and was perhaps the most difficult death, for her own health was delicate, she expected another baby in the winter. Hiram Smith's second son, who had lost his own mother in Kirtland, died of malaria or typhoid. Thirteen days after his little cousin Don Carlos, Emma's sister-in-law, Mary Bailey Smith, and her infant daughter died on January 25, 1842. By April Samuel remarried and Lee Vera Clark became stepmother to his four children. Lucy Mac Smith, crippled with arthritis, has become extremely ill. Most of that winter her daughters Sophronia and Lucy helped Emma care for her. The Hale family also lost members during this period. Emma's father had died January 11, 1839. His tombstone bore the inscription, The Body of Isaac Hale. The hunter, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of their lettering and gilding, lies here, food for worms, yet the work itself shall not be lost, and it will appear once more in a new and beautiful edition, corrected and amended. Isaac Swill left the farm to his son Alva with the stipulation that he maintain his mother in a kind comfortable and proper manner during her life. Elizabeth Hale died three years later, on February 16, 1842. Isaac Hales was stipulated that, after paying each brother twenty dollars, Alva was also to pay his sisters such sums as would be right and proper. Emma seems to be included without discrimination on Isaac's part. Throughout these months of sorrow Emma also took on additional responsibilities. She and Joseph had particular interest in three of the building projects in Norvu. The temple was planned for the spiritual rejuvenation of the saints, the anticipated Norvu House Hotel, across the street to the east from the old homestead, would help provide income and accommodations for visitors, and Joseph's red brick store, which would be the setting for many events in Emma's life, neared completion at the end of 1841. The upstairs rooms would soon become a central meeting place, the nerve center of Norvu. The two-story building was somewhat spacious for a country store. Joseph commented, with the main room ten feet high. An English artisan painted the counters to look like marble and grained the pillars with a feather to resemble fine mahogany and maple. A door from this room opened to a small hall with steps to the upper floor, a cellar on the left, and a private room on the right. The stairs led to a large open room and Joseph's private office. A south window overlooked the river, offering a retreat from the bustle of the street in front. The store stood on the corner of Granger and Water Streets, through the lot to the west from the homestead house where Emma and Joseph lived. In the middle of December Emma and Joseph unpacked thirteen wagon loads of goods. The shelves bulged with a wide variety of items that tempted the frugal citizens. Most of the supplies had been ordered by Joseph's representatives on the east coast and sent to the shipping head at St. Louis. Emma had power of attorney. Joseph wrote Edward Hunter in Pennsylvania, Your message is delivered to Mrs. Smith and she will be glad to have returns on her letter of attorney, as speedily as circumstances will permit, according to the understanding thereof. P.S. You will endeavor to have the money on your letter of attorney from Mrs. Smith, ready to furnish a supply of goods early in the spring. On January 5, 1842, Joseph opened the red brick store. He stood behind the counter selling goods, dispensing supplies, bantering with his friends, and enjoying his position at the head of his mercantile establishment, but he took in very little cash. His easy-going manner with his followers made it difficult to demand payment when the saints were destitute. The store's daybook began to fill with I.O. use. Joseph sat in council with either the city government or the church officials almost every evening in rooms above the store. His history for Saturday, January 22, 
indicated that he spent the day very busy in appraising tithing property. The following Saturday he again spent the day much engaged with the tithings. By Monday, January 31st, he called Emma to assist with the tithing appraisals. Much of this tithing was not in cash but in kind. Emma learned to evaluate acreage, city lots, and goods of various kinds in order to give the donor proper credit. Perhaps Emma overworked herself, for on February 6, 1842, she gave birth to a son who did not survive. Only five months had passed between the death of her baby, Don Carlos, and this child. Emma buried her infant in the middle of winter, undoubtedly with her reserves drained. As Joseph watched Emma grieve, he no doubt recalled that the Murdoch twins had eased her sorrow eleven years earlier. He talked with Anna and William Sintyre about their three-month-old twin girls. He wanted to borrow a baby. The Sentires agreed to let Joseph take one of the twins during the day for Emma to nurse if he would bring her home in the evening. This Joseph did punctually every day. His attachment to the child became as strong as Emma's. Few people could tell the twins apart, but Joseph always recognized the one named Mary. One time Anna McIntyre found Joseph trotting the baby on his knee because he did not want to return a fussy baby to its mother. When Emma regained her health, she no longer kept the baby regularly but continued to drop in to see her. When the child died at age two, both Emma and Joseph grieved with her parents. The Norvu years became a time for implementing doctrine. Sometimes Emma worked with Joseph in the office while he translated, revised, and read letters in the evening. Although many revelations seemed to come forth spontaneously, others seemed to have come piecemeal, building line upon line, precept upon precept. Many revelations of the latter kind culminated in the Mormon temple ordinances, including baptism for the dead, an extension of the concept that baptism is necessary and, therefore, should be available by proxy to the dead. Sometime in 1841 Emma was baptized in the Mississippi River in behalf of her father, and a year later for her mother, her sister Phoebe, her uncle Reuben Hale, her aunt Esther Hale and her great-aunt Eunice Caddy. Other temple ordinances were washings and anointings, celestial marriage or sealing for eternity, the endowment, and a higher ordinance sometimes referred to as the second anointing. Emma would eventually participate in all of these ordinances. It becomes important, then, to know something of these practices that Joseph gradually introduced. On March 15, 1842, Joseph began an association with Masonry. The Illinois Grand Master Mason presided over the installation of a Masonic Lodge in Norvu and inducted Joseph on site. The following day, Joseph's history says, I was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. Just over six weeks later, on May 4, he began the endowment ceremony, an ordinance of religious instruction committing the recipient to God and the church. Washings and anointings and a partial endowment took place in the Kirtland Temple, but at that time they were exclusively for men. Joseph would introduce the full endowment ceremony first to nine men in May 1842 and then, a year later, to Emma and a few other women, mostly first wives of the male group. By June 1844 Joseph would admit over 65 men and women into the endowment council or anointed quorum. Some scholars have suggested that Joseph drew heavily from Freemasonry for the endowment, while others argue that he recognized ancient temple rites in the Masonic order and restored them to a more perfect form. Both views may have validity. Evidence of temple rites throughout Jewish, Christian, and Muslim cultures may point to a common origin. Some American Indian religious ceremonies possess remarkable similarities to Mormon temple rites. Whether they came from a common source or developed independently will continue to be a point of debate. Many who received their endowments were aware of the close parallels to Masonry, and their writings reflect Joseph's attitude. Herbert C. Kimball wrote Parley Page Pratt. There was near 200 been made Masons here. All of the 12 apostles have become members except Horson Brat. There is a similarity of priesthood in Masonry. Brother Joseph said Masonry was taken from priesthood but has become degenerated. But many things are perfect. Joseph Fielding, Mary's brother, wrote in his journal, may have joined the Masonic institution. This seems to have been a stepping stone for preparation for something else. The true origin of Masonry Joseph recognized that women did not participate in traditional American Masonry. An unorthodox French Masonry included orders for women and filtered into America. In one type, the leading woman was referred to as the elect lady, 
a title by which Emma had been known since 1830 and by which she would become increasingly identified. This is also a biblical term. Over the next few months Joseph organized the women into a select society as the first step toward introducing them to higher ordinances. His communications to the women would contain references to masonry. He would speak of being good masons, ancient orders, keys, tokens, examination, order of the priesthood, degrees, secrets, candidates, lodges, signs, and rules, in preparation for an endowment for both men and women. In describing her early endowment, Lucy M. Smith, married to Joseph's cousin, George A., revealed the intermingling of masonry with it. The party who anointed me in Emma's bedroom poured oil on my head and blessed me. I had different clothing on from what I wore when I went to the house first. This anointing was for the purpose of initiating me in the endowments. The Order of Rebecca is a side degree of masonry for I think I had one or two degrees of it in that lodge. There was no curtain separating the ladies from the gentlemen. Afterwards we promised not to reveal our endowments, or tell what it was. Endowments would be given in Emma's house and in the Masonic lodge room, but eventually they would take place in the temple. Building it took priority over all work projects. In search of iniquity, spring to summer 1842, the women of Norvu looked for ways to help build the temple. Sarah Melissa Granger had converted to Mormonism with her family in New York. She married Hiram Kimball, Heber C. Kimball's non-Mormon cousin, shortly after her arrival in Norvu. A plasterer and storekeeper by trade, he also had large land holdings in the city. As a well-to-do new bride, Sarah wanted to help build the temple. According to her own account, she and a friend, probably Margaret A. Cook, met in the Kimball living room and discussed ways to assist the temple project. These women recognized that some women had time but little means, others had money but little time. Sarah concluded to combine their efforts in a ladies' society. Several women met in her home and decided to organize formally, delegating Sarah Kimball to ask Eliza Arsno to write a constitution and bylaws. Eliza obliged, but when the women took their efforts to the Prophet for approval, Joseph said, I am glad to have the opportunity of organizing the women, as a part of the priesthood belongs to them. He read the documents Eliza had written and pronounced them the best he had ever seen, but, this is not what you want. Tell the sisters their offering is accepted of the Lord, and he has something better for them than a written constitution. He asked the women to meet with him and several men of the church the following Thursday in the Masonic Lodge room on the second story of the red brick store. Then he stated, I will organize the sisters under the priesthood after a pattern of the priesthood. On March 17, 1842, one day after Joseph rose to the sublime degree in masonry, Emma entered the lodge room with nineteen other women. Joseph, John Taylor, and Willard Richards were also present. The first order of business was to signify by vote if all were satisfied with the character and reputation of each woman present. When the vote was positive, Emma introduced seven additional names, bringing the official membership to twenty-seven. Joseph proposed that the sisters elect a president and two councillors and said he would ordain them to preside over the society, and let them preside just as the presidency preside over the church, if any officers are wanted to carry out the design of the institution let them be appointed and set apart, as deacons, teachers, and etc. among us. Elizabeth Ann Whitney moved that Emma be president. The support was unanimous. Emma then chose Elizabeth Ann and Sarah Cleveland, her friend from Quincy days, as counselors. Eliza Arsno would be secretary and Elvira Cowles treasurer. Joseph read the elect lady revelation, explaining that Emma was called an elect lady because she was elected to preside. He explained that Emma was ordained at the time the revelation was given to expound the scriptures to all. Then John Taylor ordained Sarah Cleveland and Elizabeth Ann Whitney as Emma's counselors, then laid his hands on the head of Emma Smith and blessed her, and confirmed upon her all the blessings which have been conferred on her, that she might be a mother in Israel and look to the wants of the needy, and be a pattern of virtue and possess all the qualifications necessary for her to stand and preside and dignify her office to teach the females those principles requisite for their future usefulness. The women chose the name for their new organization, but not without a challenge from Joseph and John Taylor. Sarah Cleveland moved to name it the Female Relief Society. Taylor suggested the word benevolent instead of relief. Sarah changed her mind and seconded Taylor's amendment and the motion passed unanimously. Emma asked for further discussion on the point, 
Then the newly elected president engaged her husband in a dignified debate. She argued for the word relief over benevolent, explaining, the popularity of the word benevolent is one great objection, no person can think of a word as associated with public institutions, without thinking of the Washingtonian Benevolent Society which is one of the most corrupt institutions of the day. I do not wish to have it called after other societies in the world. I have no objection to the word relief, he said and suggested that they deliberate candidly all alternatives. Sarah Cleveland changed her mind again and spoke in favor of relief. Eliza Snow agreed with Emma, but only after Joseph had softened his stand. One objection to the word relief is that the idea associated with it suggests some great calamity, that we intend appropriating on some extraordinary occasions instead of meeting the common occurrences. We are going to do something extraordinary. Emma challenged. When a boat is stuck in the rapids with a multitude of Mormons on board, we shall consider that a loud call for relief. We expect extraordinary occasions and pressing calls. Taylor finally conceded, your arguments are so potent I cannot stand before them, I shall have to give way. Joseph capitulated, and the women named their own organization the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo. Joseph presented them with a five dollar gold piece, Emma donated one dollar to the society. Sarah Cleveland 12 cents, Elizabeth Ann Whitney 50 cents, and Sarah Kimball, who had thought of the idea of a society in the first place, matched Emma's dollar, and John Taylor gave $3. The treasury of the First Relief Society stood at $10.62. Emma and Joseph together outlined the purposes of the society, which were to provoke the brethren to good works to save the elders the trouble of rebuking to look after the wants of the poor to do good to deal frankly with each other, and to correct the morals of the community. There would be no arguments about doing good and caring for the poor, but women dealing frankly with each other and correcting the morals of the community would become explosive issues in the city of Nauvoo. A week later Emma called the second meeting of the Relief Society to order in the lodge room and offered the invocation. Membership had increased by 42 additional members. Emma addressed the women, measures to promote union in the society must be carefully attended to. Every member should be held in full fellowship divesting themselves of every jealousy and ill feeling toward each other. We will bring our conduct into respectability here and everywhere else, I rejoice in the prospects before me. She invited those wishing to join the society to do so. When Violet Kimball asked for a restatement of the purposes of the institution, Emma said, no one need feel delicate in reference to inquiries about this society. There is nothing private. Its objects are purely benevolent. Emma organized the women to seat to the poor. An employment committee sought work for women who needed it and supervised the purchase of goods rather than giving outright donations to the poor. Emma reported that a young woman, Clarissa Marvel, was accused of telling scandalous falsehoods on the character of President Joseph Smith without the least provocation, and asked that they would in wisdom, adopt some plan to bring her to repentance. She continued, I'll presume that most of you know more about Clarissa Marvel than I. There must have been silent consternation among a few in the group who were privy to the teaching of celestial marriage. Joseph's plural wife Louisa Beeman sat in the meeting as did Sarah Peak Noon and Violet Kimball. Did Emma knew that her husband had approached some women and asked them to become his plural wives. Agnes Coolbreath Smith, Don Carlos's widow, came to the accused girl's defense, apparently unaware that gossip linked her own name to Joseph's. Clarissa Marvel lived with me nearly a year and I saw nothing amiss of her, she reported. The women discussed the issue and agreed that someone should talk with Clarissa Marvel but nobody wanted to do it. One Hannah Markham was given the task but she objected on the grounds that she was unacquainted with the circumstances. Emma acknowledged that the girl had no parents and needed friends, but we intend to look into the morals of each other and watch over each other. All proceedings that regard difficulties should be kept among the members. None can object to telling the good, Emma went on, but withhold the evil. Given human nature, Emma was demanding an impossible commitment from her members. But gossip cannot be dismissed as a feminine predilection. Men also circulated tales. Gossip served both women and men as a means of transmitting information. Informal verbal accounts spread information for people who were barred from planning the course of the community either because they were women or because they had disagreed with their leaders. 
The inclination to gossip became even stronger when leaders were expected to be examples of piety. Undoubtedly word spread that the society was investigating Clarissa Marvel. The third meeting opened with the house full to overflowing. Joseph was in front with Emma and Rose to speak. He talked briefly about the society's organization and observed that none should be received into the society but those who were worthy. He advised, the society should grow by degrees, it should commence with a few individuals, thus have a select society of the virtuous and those who will walk circumspectly. The society should move according to the ancient priesthood. I will make of this society a kingdom of priests as in Enoch's day, as in Paul's day. Joseph also commented on the women's zeal to purge out iniquity, but added that sometimes your zeal is not according to knowledge. Emma proceeded with business after Joseph left the meeting, the case of Clarissa Marvel was still pending. As previous interviews with the girl seemed to prove her innocent, Sarah Cleveland moved that Elizabeth Durfee and Elizabeth Allard should investigate whoever had reported her. Unknown to Emma, Joseph had already taught these older women the principles of plural marriage. Sometimes referred to as mothers in Israel, they assisted Joseph by contacting women, explaining the new order of marriage to them, and occasionally delivering marriage proposals. Thus Mrs. Durfee was uncomfortably caught between her role as Joseph's emissary and her assignment to investigate Clarissa Marvel. She objected. Emma encouraged, we are going to learn new things, our way is straight. We want none in this society but those who could and would walk straight. Within three days Clarissa Marvel marked an X next to her name on the following statement, This is to certify that I never have at any time or place, seen or heard anything improper or unvirtuous in the conduct or conversation of either President Smith or Mrs. Agnes Smith. I also certify that I never have reported anything derogatory to the characters of either of them. Apparently, Emma took responsibility for closing the issue for she told the women that the disagreeable business of searching out those who were iniquitous seemed to fall on her. Emma obviously did not know that her widowed sister-in-law, Agnes Coolbreath Smith, has become a plural wife of Joseph. Mormon women found spiritual satisfaction in the gatherings. At the close of one meeting Emma, Sarah Cleveland, and Elizabeth Whitney laid their hands on the head of Elizabeth Durfee, who was ill and blessed her. The next week Mrs. Durfee said she never realized more benefit through any administration, that she was healed, and thought the sisters has more faith than the brethren. This meeting became a prototype for Relief Society testimony meetings at which the women stood one by one to express individual feelings and spiritual experiences. Sarah Cleveland commented, as the Prophet had given us liberty to improve the gifts of the Gospel in our meetings she desired to speak in the gift of tongues which she did in a powerful manner, and a second woman interpreted. Eliza Snow's minutes pronounced the meeting interesting. During the ensuing week someone apparently questioned the propriety of women blessing the sick and speaking in tongues. Joseph addressed the subject on April 28, saying there was some little thing circulating in this society, that some persons were not going right and laying hands on the sick. If the sisters should have faith to heal the sick let all hold their tongues, and let everything roll on. Who knows the mind of God? Respecting the females, laying on hands there could be no devils in it if God gave his sanction by healing, that there would be no more sin in any female laying hands on the sick than in wetting the face with water. Elizabeth Ann Whitney wrote in 1878 that she and several other women were ordained and set apart under the hand of Joseph Smith the prophet to administer to the sick and comfort the sorrowful. Concerning speaking in tongues, Joseph cautioned, if any have a matter to reveal, let it be in your own tongue. Do not indulge too much in the gift of tongues. I lay this down for a rule that if anything is taught by this gift of tongues, it is not to be received for doctrine. Emma and the other women listened as Joseph spoke of delivering the keys to this society. The Relief Society was to receive instruction through the order which God has established. And I now turn the key to you in the name of God and this society shall rejoice and knowledge and intelligence shall low down from this time. Years later, as George A. Smith compiled a history of the church, he changed Joseph's words from I now turn the key to you to I turn the key in your behalf. From that time it would appear an error in church publications. Whatever Joseph's intent. 
His words were ambiguous concerning the women's relationship to priesthood authority and the issue would be questioned in the future. Before adjourning the meeting Emma read a document that Joseph and the church leaders had prepared for the Relief Society in March. It stated that some men were approaching women to deceive and debauch the innocent saying they had authority from Joseph or other church leaders. We have been informed that some unprincipled men have been guilty of such crimes, we do not mention their names, not knowing but what there may be some among you who are not sufficiently skilled in masonry as to keep a secret. Let this epistle be had as a private matter in your society, and then we shall learn whether you are good masons. We are your humble servants in the bonds of the new and everlasting covenant. Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith. Heber C. Kimball, Willard Richards, Vincent Knight, and Brigham Young signed their names. One of the unprincipled men whom Joseph declined to name was John C. Bennett. By the spring of 1842 Bennett's political power in Norvu was almost as great as Joseph's. In 18 months, he had become Major General of the Norvu Legion, President of the Agriculture and Manufacturing Association, Chancellor of the proposed University in Norvu, Mayor of the City, and de facto counselor to Joseph as Sidney Rigdon was too ill to function. Bennett had learned of plural marriage, maybe from Joseph himself, and plunged in with alacrity. But, unhampered by any moral or theological framework, Bennett approached women with his own rationale, where there was no accuser, there was no sin, pregnancy would be taken care of with an abortion. When refused, Bennett stated he came with Joseph's approval. He and his friends called their system of seduction spiritual wifery a term that had been used in the early establishment of plural marriage. The city rocked with tales that connected Joseph with Bennett's scandals, and Emma undoubtedly heard the rumors. In mid-April Joseph had asked Sidney Rigdon's 19-year-old daughter Nancy to become his plural wife. Bennett had his own eye on the girl and forewarned her, so she refused Joseph. The following day Joseph dictated a letter to her with Willard Richards acting as scribe. It read in part, Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof, if we pursue the path that leads to it, and this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. That which is wrong under one circumstance, may be, and often is, right under another. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is, although we may not see the reason thereof till long after the events transpire. Nancy Rigdon showed the letter to her father. Rigdon immediately sent for Joseph, who reportedly denied everything until Sidney thrust the letter in his face. George W. Robinson, Nancy's brother-in-law, claimed he witnessed the encounter and said Joseph admitted that he had spoken with Nancy but that he had only been testing her virtue. Hiram Smith discovered that Bennett had a wife and children in Ohio. When Joseph accosted Bennett, he acknowledged his guilt and begged Joseph's forgiveness. In a dramatic act of false contrition, Bennett swallowed sufficient poison to make himself sick enough for sympathy but not sick enough to die. Joseph and the others forestalled further action. The break between Joseph and Bennett came on May 7, 1842. Politician Stephen A. Douglas visited Norvu, and Joseph called out the Legion for mock maneuvers. Emma and several other women observed on horseback. Joseph suspected Bennett had plans to kill him with an accidental shot and accused him of such. On May 17, Bennett resigned as mayor. The church leaders excommunicated him on May 25. Brigham Young told him he was charged with seducing young women, and leading young men into difficulty. Hiram Smith said Bennett wept like a child and begged like a culprit for forgiveness and promised before God and angels to mend his life. He also pleaded for mercy to spare him from the paper, for his mother's sake. Public notice of the excommunication was never made. Bennett acknowledged the Relief Society's role in his downfall when he predicted that its actions would be the means of a mob forthcoming. Undaunted by Bennett's remarks, Emma announced that she could not be afraid of mobs and called on the women to send out a circular exposing Bennett's character. She challenged them to write convincing statements. Bennett had correctly assessed the power of the organization but he underestimated Joseph's influence with it. Shortly after Bennett left Norvu in late May or early June he attacked Joseph and the church in the newspapers and published a defamatory book. His accounts provided titillating reading for some and encouraged prejudice toward the Mormons but others saw through his pious cover. Thomas Ford commented, Bennett was probably the greatest scamp in the western country. He was everywhere accounted the same debauched, unprincipled, 
and profligate character. While John C. Bennett would continue to embarrass and frustrate the Mormons for some time, one last monument to him remained in Nauvoo. He and his comrades had built a house of ill repute near the grove where the Mormons congregated for meetings. A large sign announced its purpose. One Mormon observed, We could not get to meeting without passing this house and looking right at it, and one or two thousand people would go past it on a Sabbath and they didn't feel very good seeing that house there with great big letters facing them. The city council eventually put the building on rollers and pitched the house, furnishings and all into a deep gully behind it. The demand for secrecy coupled with the need to warn others of unauthorized practices such as Bennett's led Joseph and the Twelve to develop a system of evasion. By employing code words the practitioners of a new and everlasting covenant of marriage, as taught by Joseph, felt they could publicly deny one thing and privately live by another, and do it with a clear conscience. In an 1869 letter George A. Smith noted, anyone who will read carefully the denials, as they are termed will see clearly that they denounce adultery, fornication, brutal lust and the teaching of plurality of wives by those who were not commanded to do so, eschewing clearly that it was understood that such commandment would be given to others. An 1886 article in the Deseret News detailed specific code words and the rationale for their use. When assailed by their enemies and accused of practicing things which were really not countenanced in the church, they were justified in denying those imputations and at the same time avoiding the avowal of such doctrine as were not yet intended for the world. Examples were, polygamy, in the ordinary and Asiatic sense of the term, never was and is not now a tenet of the Latter-day Saints. That which Joseph and Hiram denounced was altogether different to the order of celestial marriage including a plurality of wives. Joseph and Hiram were consistent in their action against the false doctrines of polygamy and spiritual wifeism instigated by the devil and advocated by men who did not comprehend sound doctrine nor the purity of the celestial marriage which God revealed for the holiest of purposes. Denial of polygamy in the Asiatic sense perhaps meant that theirs was a spiritual requirement rather than a cultural practice. Other acceptable terms synonymous with plurality of wives were, the true and divine order, eternal marriage, and the holy order of celestial marriage. Phrases such as live up to your privileges new and everlasting covenant, and we may have different views of things also referred to plural marriage. Speaking before non-Mormons, newspaper reporters, and the uninitiated, the leaders supported plural marriage under the very noses of the suspicious. Perhaps the most confusing of the code words was spiritual wifery. Joseph and the Twelve used the term, and a few women who were plural wives later referred to themselves as spiritual wives but through Bennett's use the term came into disrepute. Emma, who had not yet been taught the doctrine, seemed oblivious to the code words. During this time the Relief Society continued to meet. At the April 28th meeting Joseph counseled the women, and not incidentally his wife, how to treat her husband. Let this society teach how to act towards husbands, to treat them with mildness and affection. When a man is born down with troubles, when he is perplexed, if he can meet a smile, not an argument, if he can meet with mildness it will calm down his soul and soothe his feelings. When the mind is going to despair it needs a solace. If there was a pointed message for Emma, within twenty-four hours she forgot about mildness and long-suffering. Someone apparently told her about Joseph's involvement in plural marriage. On April 29, 1842, the day after the Relief Society meeting, Joseph's history reads, a conspiracy against the peace of my family was made manifest, and it gave me some trouble to counteract the design of certain base individuals, and restore peace. The Lord makes manifest to me many things, which it is not wisdom for me to make public. The confrontation between Joseph and Emma was serious. It may have been the reason the Relief Society did not meet the following week, and two weeks after the incident, Joseph was present but the minutes do not mention Emma's name. Joseph did not elaborate on the process by which he re-established his peace with Emma, but a clue lies in the recollections of a then 54-year-old spinster, Vienna Jacques, whose name had been linked with Joseph's by gossip in Kirtland. Many years later Joseph Smith III interviewed her when she was over 90. She recalled the subject of spiritual wifery was discussed at a Relief Society meeting when Emma was not present. Miss Jack claimed she did not believe it was being taught as doctrine and said she went to Emma against the protests of some of the women in the group. She told me she had asked her husband, the prophet, 
about the stories which were being circulated among the women concerning such a doctrine being taught, and that he had told her to tell the sisters of the society that if any man, no matter who he was, undertook to talk such stuff to them in their houses, just to order him out at once, and if he did not go immediately, to take the tongs or the broom and drive him out, for the whole idea was absolutely false and the doctrine an evil and unlawful thing. A week later Elizabeth Ann Whitney spoke to the society, saying she was burdened in mind in thinking of existing evils in the church, was desirous that this society become more obedient to the gospel in keeping all the commandments, exhorted the members to humility and watchfulness, and affirmed that the gifts and blessings of the gospel are ours, if the women are found faithful and pure before God. Emma followed her counsellor's train of thought but addressed the situation at hand. From her remarks it appears that Joseph had deflected her anger by explaining that he had neither sanctioned nor participated in Bennett's spiritual wife doctrine. Eliza Snow's minutes state, Mrs. President, said this day was an evil day, that there is as much evil in this as in any other place, said she would that this society were pure before God that she was afraid that under existing circumstances the sisters were not careful enough to expose iniquity. The time had been when charity had covered a multitude of sins, but now it is necessary that sin should be exposed. Emma said that heinous sins were among us, that much of this iniquity was practiced by some in authority, pretending to be sanctioned by prayers. Joseph Smith, Mrs. President, continued by exhorting all who had erred to repent and forsake their sins said that Satan's forces were against this church, that every saint should be at the post. The speech must have confused those women already initiated into plural marriage. If some in authority who said they were sanctioned and encouraged by Joseph were not, where did that leave a virtuous woman who had accepted one of the twelve when he assured her, he came with Joseph's command and approval? Emma's blunt comments made the men's arguments suspect. Her statements became a stumbling block to the spread of polygamy because women not wishing to enter the principle could now quote the prophet's wife. Councillors Sarah Cleveland and Elizabeth Ann Whitney called the regular meeting to order on May 26. The house was full to overflowing. Emma was late to stall for time. Elizabeth Ann began a speech thanking the women for their donations. Finally, Emma and Joseph entered together. Emma found a seat. Joseph immediately took the floor and Eliza carefully recorded his speech. He read the fourteenth chapter of Ezekiel and emphasized that the people should stand firm on their own faith. Then he said, There is another error which opens a door for the adversary to enter, as females possess refined feelings and sensitiveness, they are also subject to an overmuch zeal which must ever prove dangerous, and cause them to be rigid in a religious capacity. You should be armed with mercy notwithstanding the iniquity among us. Put a double watch over the tongue. You should chasten and reprove and keep it all in silence, not even mention them again. He addressed Emma directly. One request to the President and Society, that you search yourselves. The tongue is an unruly member, hold your tongues about things of no moment. A little tale will set the world on fire. At this time the truth on the guilty should not be told openly, strange as this may seem. Yet this is policy. We must use precaution in bringing sinners to justice lest in exposing these heinous sins, we draw the indignation of a Gentile world upon us and to their imagination justly, too. It is necessary to hold an influence in the world and thus spare ourselves an extermination. Joseph contradicted his previous charge that the women watch over the morals of the community. Emma was doing her job too well. She rose as Joseph ended his remarks and clarified one or two statements that may have sounded ambiguous. All idle rumors and idle talk must be laid aside yet sin must not be covered, especially those sins which are against the law of God, and the laws of the country, Emma stated, all who walk disorderly must reform, and any of you knowing of heinous sins against the law of God, and refuse to expose them, becomes the offender, I want none in this society who have violated the laws of virtue. She adjourned the meeting until the following day, as the business was not finished. The next day the women assembled in the grove near the temple site. Membership had grown to over 600. As usual the meeting opened with singing. Emma offered the invocation, accepted the names of almost 200 new members, then addressed the large congregation. She emphasized that the group should remain united in their efforts to assist the needy. In behalf of the society Emma had hired a poor man to plough and fence the lot of an elderly brother and remarked that donations toward the man's wages could be made in provisions, clothing, 
and furniture. At that point Elizabeth Thann's husband, Newell K. Whitney, and Joseph arrived. Whitney complimented the women on the lofty purposes of the society. Then he said, In the beginning God created man male and female and bestowed upon man certain blessings peculiar to a man of God of which women partook, so that without the female all things cannot be restored to the earth, it takes all to restore the priesthood. God has many precious things to bestow even to our astonishment if we are faithful. I say again I rejoice in the prospect of what lays before. The bishop continued, if we are striving to do right, although we may err in judgment many times, yet we are justified in the sight of God if we do the best we can. It is our privilege to stand in an attitude to get testimony for ourselves, it is as much our privilege as that of the ancient saints. If we understand all things we shall not be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of God. Whitney added, Far be it from me to harbor iniquity and outbreaking sins. We may have different views of things, still there is some criterion which all may come to, and by bringing our minds and wills into subjection to the law of the Lord, may come to unity. I tell you, there are blessings before to be conferred as soon as our hearts are prepared to receive them. Apparently satisfied, Joseph did not speak, and the women adjourned. Undoubtedly the speech diffused some of the consternation caused by Emma's emphasis on virtue by assuring those women who had accepted the principle of plurality of wives that it was yet taught, supported, and considered a commandment by the leaders of the church and it presaged the coming endowment. On June 9 the women assembled in the grove. Joseph addressed them, it is no matter how fast the society increases if all are virtuous. He no longer seemed disturbed by the rapid growth of the organization, which now had 800 women, but he did lay down rules for admittance to ensure new members would be of good report. This was not the small select society wherein he could teach the female part of the endowment ceremony. He had thus concluded to begin the endowment for women in a separate setting. The Relief Society meetings continued throughout the summer of 1842. Emma missed a meeting on July 7 but presided over the proceedings on July 14. She found that business from the previous meeting had been deferred, Mrs. President not being present. A sister Brown had been the object of scandalous tales spread by an unnamed woman of the society. A discussion of her case continued into the next meeting. Emma called for a vote on whether or not she should be admitted to the society. When the vote was in the affirmative, Emma's gave permission to trace down the source of the rumors. She told the women, we can govern this generation in one way if not another, if not by the mighty arm of power we can do it by faith and prayer. In summary, God knows we have a work to do in this place, we have got to watch and pray and be careful not to excite feelings, not make enemies of one another. When one woman moved to extend a vote of thanks to Emma, she declined, saying, I do not want the thanks but the prayers of the society. The Relief Society disbanded at the coming of winter with 1100 women on their rolls. A few sought membership for social acceptance rather than purely benevolent and charitable motives but others flocked to the meetings for additional reasons. The organization gave them a focus for their religious energy and spiritual communion. In Relief Society they expressed their opinions and became a part of the official church movement. Women healed the sick, and Joseph gave his approval. They seemed to understand that their organization was parallel in structure with the priesthood. In addition, the organization reached out to the poor in Norvi with extraordinary effectiveness. Under Emma's leadership, it formed a successful labor market. Motherless children found homes, a bushel of wheat donated weekly went to feed a needy family, two widows with young children had money to pay for their schooling, elderly women's gardens were plowed, shoes appeared in poor homes, and a family without bedding received blankets. When a group of widows came with a complaint that some heads of families were not paying them for their labors, the problem was solved through the Relief Society. Individuals donated funds at every meeting. The amounts came in as small as six cents and as large as $71. Emma herself donated $14 in June. Once the Treasury gained $143 in a single meeting, these funds were amplified by material donations. Emma handled compassionate service in Norvu as if it were an extraordinary occasion and special call. In only six months' time the Relief Society had become a very important part of the social fabric of Norvu and the original benevolent purposes of the society never lacked attention. Another reason for the large membership was that the women had never had their own judiciary body. Although they were not totally at ease with the search for iniquity, 
Emma had a reputation for fairness and for not indulging in idle gossip. When she opened meetings to a discussion of the actions of other women, she stated she was uncomfortable in having to pursue the issue to its conclusion. But while the women probably trusted Emma to be fair, rumors flooded Norvu, and no one could be sure that slander would not swoop down upon her. It was better to be at the meetings. Significantly, Emma was an effective president. When she organized a committee, accepted an assignment, or learned of someone's plight, she led by example or directed the women in dealing with the problem. The women had loved her for her generosity and compassion, they now respected her leadership. An acquaintance wrote of her, Sister Emma was benevolent and hospitable, she drew around her a large circle of friends, who were like good comrades. She was motherly in her nature to young people always had a houseful to entertain or be entertained. She was very high-spirited and the brethren and sisters paid her great respect. Emma was a great solace to her husband in all his persecutions and the severe ordeals through which he passed, she was always ready to encourage and comfort him, devoted to his interests, and was constantly by him whenever it was possible. She was a queen in her home, so to speak, and beloved by the people, who were many of them indebted to her for favors and kindnesses. The women's organization was important to Emma, but during its first six months other events occurred that caused Joseph to rely on her for his own safety. While this brought them closer together, the issue of polygamy was far from settled and Emma soon had to confront it head on. A to the fugitive, June, September 1842, clouds had moved in on the sun in Norvu on June 29, 1842, pouring first heavy rain then hailed that beat upon the side of the house Eliza Snow shared with Sarah Cleveland. Inside Eliza mused over unusual events as she began her Norvu journal. She needed to make note of that day, for she had just become Joseph Smith's plural wife. This is a day of much interest to my feelings. Reflecting on past occurrences, a variety of thoughts have presented themselves to my mind with regard to events which have chased each other in rapid succession in the scenery of human life. As an individual, I have not passed altogether unnoticed by change, in reference to present circumstances and future prospects. Eliza's words discreetly hinted at her marriage which the need for secrecy would not allow her to describe. She went on, while I am contemplating the present state of society, the powers of darkness, and the prejudices of the human mind which stand arrayed like an impregnable barrier against the work of God I will not fear. I will put my trust in him who is mighty to save rejoicing in his goodness and determined to live by every word that proceedeth out of his mouth. Eliza had been living with Sarah Cleveland since her parents moved 50 miles east to Walnut Grove. The 1842 city and county tax records place Sarah's husband, John Cleveland, several blocks away. No date is known for Sarah Cleveland's own marriage to Joseph, but she stood as witness to Eliza's while Brigham Young performed the ceremony. This and her living apart from John Cleveland suggest she was probably already married to Joseph. Almost certainly, Emma was not aware that both her secretary and her counselor in the Relief Society had become Joseph's plural wives. Sarah and Eliza knew that Emma regarded them with respect and affection, while women who became Joseph's wives were able to accept the principle of plural marriage as revelation from God. They still had to grapple silently and alone with their betrayal of Emma. To live as a secret wife to a friend's husband demanded evasion, subterfuge, and deception. For these sincerely devout and faithful women, their duplicity regarding Emma must have prompted guilt and anxiety. Eliza contemplated Emma's reaction if she found her out, as evidenced by a poem she addressed to President Joseph Smith and his lady, President S. Emma Smith and published six weeks after her marriage, referring to phrenology to identify her own confused feelings, the first verse asked that malice would bring no pain. She depicted an angel observing things passing and wrote, he'd be apartment to conclude, from the medley of things, we've got into a jumble of late, a deep intricate puzzle, a tangle of strings, that no possible scheme can make straight. Tell me, what will it be, and oh, where will it end? Say if you have permission to tell. Is there any fixed point into which prospects tend? Does a focus belong to Belmau, from the midst of confusion can harmony flow? Or can peace from distraction come forth? From out of corruption, integrity grow? Or can vice unto virtue give birth? Will the righteous come forth with their garments unstained? With their hearts unpolluted with sin? Oh, yes, Zion, thy honor will be sustained, and the glory of God ushered in. Frustration, doubt and confusion are evident here, 
but the last verse became a justification for her own involvement. Another source of confusion and threat came into Emma's and Joseph's life from Missouri this same spring. Porter Rockwell, whom one writer described as a strange member for any church, was rough, often uncouth, and erratic. His devotion to Joseph tied him to the church through the wilderness beckoned with excitement. He had belonged to the Denite band in Missouri and sometimes served as Joseph's bodyguard. Oddly enough for someone of rough and tumble reputation, he was short and small-boned. His face had small, almost feminine features with magnetic blue eyes. He wore his long brown hair in two braids. Rockwell had been in Missouri during the early part of May 1842 and had returned to Nauvoo on Saturday. May 14. The following morning, in the Sunday service of the community, Joseph announced that ex-governor Lilburn Boggs of Missouri had been shot and seriously wounded. Boggs has made a number of enemies but none were stronger or more bitter than the Mormons. Thus the Missourians, who suspected the Mormons, and Joseph Smith in particular, of being responsible for the attack, renewed their efforts to arrest Joseph. Talk of extradition was everywhere in Nauvoo. The week after Frederick's sixth birthday, the child announced to all the house at breakfast that he had a dream and the Missourians had got their heads knocked off. In addition, John C. Bennett's exposes and emotional rhetoric fueled anti-Mormon feelings in Illinois. Joseph wrote Illinois Governor Thomas Carlin a letter responding to Bennett's accusations and alerting the governor to the Missouri threats, determined to help Joseph. Emma took Eliza R. Snow and Amanda Barnes Smith with her to Quincy to see Carlin in July. Amanda Smith had lost her first husband and son at the Juan's Mill Massacre, while another son had had his hip shot away. Emma probably invited her to describe the Missouri mobs. Thomas Carlin greeted the women cordially and listened to Emma plead Joseph's case. With assurance and self-confidence, she explained that she did not ask for Joseph's safety alone but observed that if Joseph's freedom was endangered by unlawful arrests and attempts were made on his life while incarcerated in Missouri, then hundreds of Mormon lives were equally threatened. Emma assured him that Joseph had not participated in the attempted assassination of Governor Boggs. When Carlin said he would not advise Joseph to trust himself to Missouri, Emma challenged him to protect Joseph by invoking the laws of Illinois and secured his statement that he would use full legal means to protect the Mormons. Of the meeting Eliza commented in her journal, it remains for time and circumstance to prove the sincerity of his professions. The day after Emma and Eliza returned from Quincy, Joseph wrote to thank Carlin for his friendly treatment of Emma. I shall consider myself and our citizens secure from harm, he wrote. We look to you for protection in the event of any violence being used towards us. Soon after Emma's visit with Governor Carlin, her nephew Lorenzo Wasson wrote to her and Joseph from Philadelphia where he served a mission. He had come to Nauvoo the spring before and Joseph had baptized him three days after the organization of the Relief Society. Now Wasson wrote that John C. Bennett's accounts were circulating in that city. If I can be of any service in this Bennett affair I am ready, he offered. I heard you give J.C. Bennett a tremendous flagellation last summer for practicing iniquity under the base pretense of authority from the heads of the church. There are many things I can inform you of, if necessary in relation to Bennett and his prostitutes. Joseph asked Emma to write to Lorenzo and request a statement of all he knew about Bennett. Meanwhile Lilburn Boggs in Missouri accused Joseph Smith and Porter Rockwell of assault. The new Missouri governor, Thomas Reynolds, sent a requisition to Governor Thomas Carlin, who in turn issued warrants charging Porter Rockwell with the shooting and Joseph as accessory. A deputy sheriff arrested the two men but left them in Nauvoo in care of the marshal while he went to confer with Governor Carlin. When the deputy returned two days later, Joseph and Porter were gone. The sheriff threatened Emma with unspecified legal consequences if her husband did not return. Joseph hid at his uncle John Smith's home across the river and sent word for Emma, Hiram, William Law and several others to meet him that night on an island. Emma waited until dark to slip out of the house, walk past the red brick store and find her way down to the river. The group pushed silently off from shore in a skiff. A few minutes later they met Joseph and a friend, who approached from the opposite bank. Pulling the two skiffs together so they could talk easily, they discussed a rumor that the governor of Iowa had also issued a warrant for Joseph's arrest and decided that Joseph should go up the Mississippi from Nauvoo to Edward Sayers's home. A faithful Mormon, Sayers farmed north of Nauvoo, reassured that her husband would be safe, 
M returned to Norvu with the others. The next day she consulted with William Law, then sent a messenger to a lawyer named Powers in Kokuk, Iowa, to learn if the Iowa governor had a warrant for Joseph's and Porter's arrest. William Walker, who boarded with the Smiths, crossed the river from Norvu with Joseph's horse as a decoy, while Joseph remained on the east side of the river. The following day, August 13, Joseph sent for Emma again. Emma prepared to leave but thoughtfully attended to a last-minute detail. She knew that Sarah Cleveland was moving to her lot along the river about four blocks to the east of the Smiths, leaving Eliza Snow without a home. Emma sent for Eliza, having already offered her a place in her own house a day earlier. Eliza wrote in her journal, My former expectations were frustrated, but the Lord has opened the path to my feet and I feel disposed to acknowledge his hand in all things. This sudden, unexpected change in my location, I trust is for good, it seemed to come in answer to my petitions to God to direct me in the path of duty according to his will. Eliza's father, Oliver Snow, who had become disenchanted with Joseph and the church over polygamy, perhaps specifically over Eliza's marriage to Joseph, was in Norvu on business and had apparently asked her to return to Walnut Grove with him. But on the same day that Emma sent for Eliza he commented with a father's perception, Eliza cannot leave our prophet. Emma had to be cautious. Four men kept watch around the city for Joseph. They paid close attention to Emma's whereabouts. As a ruse, she walked over to Mrs. Durfee's while Joseph's private secretary, William Clayton, and Lauren Walker took her carriage, drove past the sheriff and continued down river. They circled back across the prairie, picked up Emma, and drove up river with the sheriff none the wiser. A short distance from the Sayers farm, Clayton and Walker stopped the carriage and let Emma out. They returned to Norvu while Emma walked through thick woods to the farmhouse. I was in good spirits, Joseph remembered, and was much rejoiced to meet my dear wife once more. Emma stayed the night with Joseph. They spent the next morning talking and reading over his history. We both felt in good spirits and very cheerful, Joseph said. In the afternoon Emma waited while Joseph wrote a letter to Wilson Law, Major General of the Legion, instructing him what to do if the city was attacked or Joseph was taken prisoner. After dinner Emma left with Erastus H. Darby and William Clayton who had returned to escort her home. They planned to walk to Norvu but the rain-soaked ground had turned to mud so they took a skiff down river. A fierce wind forced the craft between the islands in the river and with effort they finally landed on the opposite bank where Clayton procured another boat to take Emma across. The wind abated, but before they were halfway across it gusted again. Emma had another dangerous ride but landed safely. Emma came home to good news. The lawyer from Kokuk met her and said that the governor of Iowa had not issued a writ against Joseph. Two days later, August 16th, Erastus Darby brought a letter from Joseph. My dear Emma, I embrace this opportunity to express to you some of my feelings this morning. First of all I take the liberty to tender you my sincere thanks for the two interesting and consoling visits that you have made me during my almost exiled situation. Tongue cannot express the gratitude of my heart, for the warm and true-hearted friendship you have manifested in these things towards me. Apparently Emma and Joseph had discussed the possibility of her going to see Governor Carlin again. He asked her not to go but added, you may write to him whatever you see proper. Joseph told her that several friends had advised him to leave and perhaps go north to the Pinewoods, a Mormon settlement in Wisconsin where lumber was cut to be shipped to Norvu. If I go to the Pine Country, you shall go along with me, and the children, and if you and the children go not with me. I don't go. It is for your sakes, therefore, that I will do such a thing. I will go with you, then, in the same carriage, and on horseback from time to time as occasion may require, for I am not willing to trust you in the hands of those who cannot feel the same interest for you that I feel. He ordered his horse, gear, clothing, trunks, writing materials, and household furnishings to be loaded on a boat. We will wend our way like larks up the Mississippi until the towering mountains and rocks shall remind us of the places of our nativity, and shall look like safety and home, and then we will bid defiance to the world. Joseph signed it, yours in haste, your affectionate husband until death, through all eternity, forevermore. This plan may have represented more wishful thinking than reality. Surely the Smith family belongings could not be loaded on a riverboat without observation, 
and the sheriff would have followed the baggage. After he wrote to Emma, Joseph composed a sentimental essay which named his trusted associates and thanked them for their faithfulness. In it he paid Emma tribute, with what unspeakable delight, and what transports of joy swelled my bosom, when I took by the hand, on that night, my beloved Emma, she that was my wife, even the wife of my youth and the choice of my heart. Many were the reverberations of my mind when I contemplated for a moment the many scenes we had been called to pass through. He recognized fatigues and the toils, the sorrows and sufferings, and the joys and consolations, from time to time, which had strewed our paths and crowned our board. Oh what a commingling of thought filled my mind for the moment, again she is here, even in the seventh trouble, undaunted, firm, and unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma. Emma's home in Norvu became the way station for communications about church, business, and legal matters. Emma assumed much responsibility for Joseph's welfare. She answered his letter about fleeing to the pine woods the same day that Joseph wrote it and she received it. Dear husband, I am ready to go with you if you are obliged to leave, and Hiram says he will go with me. I shall make the best arrangements I can and be as well prepared as possible but still I feel good confidence that you can be protected without leaving this country. There are more ways than one to take care of you, and I believe that you can still direct in your business concerns if we are all of us prudent in the matter. If it was pleasant weather I should contrive to see you this evening, but I dare not run too much of a risk, on account of so many going to see you. General Adams sends the propositions concerning his land, two dollars an acre, payments as follows, assumption of mortgage say about fourteen hundred, interest included, taxes due, supposed about thirty dollars, town property one thousand dollars, balance, money payable in one, two, three or four years, brother Darby will tell you all the information we have on hand, I think we will have news from Quincy as soon as tomorrow, yours affectionately forever, Emma Smith, passion of power that cannot be tolerated. He went on to explain that he judged Joseph neither guilty nor innocent but that he simply abided by the requirements of his office to see that justice be done. Joseph's interpretation was that Illinois gave unto Norvu her charters, ceding unto us our vested rights, which she has no power or right to take from us. All the power there was in Illinois, she gave to Norvu, and any man that says to the contrary is a fool. Writs of habeas corpus issued by the Norvu court would often bring Joseph back to Norvu from other jurisdictions and would result in the charges against him being dismissed. The Mormons ignored the governor's warnings, sure that the legal system of Illinois was not effective and offered no protection against the Missouri writs. Joseph's experiences in Kirtland and Missouri would not let him trust any system except one that he controlled. On August 29th Joseph surprised his followers at a conference in Norvu, when he walked up to the stand and greeted them. Rumor had him placed from Washington to Europe but his presence in Norvu delighted both his friends and his enemies. Joseph believed the extradition efforts were prompted by Satan and not by the regular procedures of law. He publicly defied the sheriff when he announced in the Relief Society meeting two days later that he believed that my Heavenly Father has decreed that the Missourians shall not get me into their power. In effect he challenged the authorities to prove his prophetic announcement false. Emma spearheaded a petition to send to Governor Carlin and approximately a thousand women signed it through the Relief Society, admitting that in ordinary cases it would be more consistent with the delicacy of the female character to be silent. The women asked for protection from the Missouri mobs. The petition affirmed their belief in Joseph as a man of integrity, honesty, truth and patriotism and requested that he not be extradited to Missouri. Joseph appeared with Emma at the August 31st meeting of the Society. I shall triumph over my enemies. He told the women, I have begun to triumph over them at home and I shall do it abroad, although I do wrong, I do not the wrongs that I am charged with doing. The wrong that I do is through the frailty of human nature like other men. No man lives without fault. I would to God that you would be wise, I now counsel you, if you know anything, hold your tongues, and the least harm will be done. Within three days the sheriff was after Joseph again. Around one o'clock Emma served dinner to the family, her own four children. Eliza, the Partridge sisters, assorted Walker children, Joseph, and perhaps others, armed with requisitions from Iowa and Illinois, 
the sheriff and two deputies surreptitiously maneuvered their horses along the riverbank until they stood below the unfinished foundations of the Norvu house. They walked quietly to the Smith's house and were in the building before an alarm could be given. They stumbled onto John Boynton, who was visiting the Smiths. While the sheriff asked for Joseph, Boynton stalled him with evasive answers. Joseph ran out of the back door of the large kitchen room, slipped through the high rows of corn in his garden, and hid in Newell and Elizabeth Whitney's apartment over the brick store. Emma confronted the officers when they wanted to search the house. I have no objection if you have the proper authority, she told them. The sheriff said he did not but was going to search the premises anyway. Having delayed long enough for Joseph to get away, Emma asked Emma Huntington to show him through the house. After sundown another deputy approached the house and asked for Joseph. Emma spoke to him at the door. Eliza listened from inside. Emma asked again about a search warrant. Irascible at Joseph's disappearance, the deputy stated, My will is good enough. Surely you could not object to telling me what you want with Mr. Smith, Emma commented. King growled back, There will be time enough to tell that afterward. Emma faced the man down and he rejoined his friends at Amos Davis's tavern. Joseph went into hiding again this time with the Edward Hunter family. Joseph's followers were tireless in their efforts to clear his name. William Marks, president of the Ecclesiastical Association of Several Congregations in Norvu termed a stake by the Mormons, published his support of Joseph in August 1842 in the Times and Seasons. Marks attacked John C. Bennett, I believe him to be a vile and wicked adulterous man, who pays no regard to the principles of truth or righteousness. Joseph had not taught the doctrine of plural marriages to Marx. Truthfully, Marx said he knew of no order in the church which admits to a plurality of wives and did not believe that Joseph Smith ever taught such a doctrine. The Times and Seasons reprinted the statement on marriage from the Doctrine and Covenants, inasmuch as this Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication, and polygamy, we declare that we believe, that one man should have one wife, and one woman, but one husband except in case of death, when neither is at liberty to marry again. The article ended with a signed declaration from some of the leading men of the community stating, We know of no other rule or system of marriage than the one published from the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, and we give this certificate to show that Dr. J. C. Bennett's secret wife system is a creature of his own makers we know of no such society in this place nor never did. Out of twelve men who lent their name to the document, Newell K. Whitney and John Taylor had already taken other wives. A similar statement carrying the names of 19 Relief Society members followed. Emma's name headed the list. Two others, Eliza Snow and Sarah Cleveland, were plural wives of Joseph, as was Elizabeth Ann Whitney's daughter. A fourth woman, Leonora Taylor, knew her husband also practiced plural marriage. Years later Eliza Snow was asked how she could have signed such a statement. She replied that they were putting down John C. Bennett's spiritual wifery. At the time the Sisters of the Relief Society signed our article, I was married to the Prophet. We made no allusion to any other system of marriage than Bennett's. His was prostitution, and it was truly A.I.'s and he succeeded in pandering his course on the credulity of the unsuspecting by making them believe that he was thus authorized by the prophet. In those articles there is no reference to divine plural marriage. We aim to put down its opposite. John Taylor would echo the same sentiments in defense of the signed statement in the Deseret News, May 20, 1886. So with that spiritual wife doctrine which lustful men attempted to promulgate at that period, Joseph the prophet was just as much opposed to that false doctrine as any one could be. It was a counterfeit. Then Taylor employed code words to argue. The true and divine order is another thing. While friends worked in Joseph's behalf, he hid at Hunter's home. Emma made him a very interesting visit on September 9, 1842, at 10 o'clock at night. After talking with friends, Joseph went home with Emma. Proud parents, they stood looking a moment at their sleeping children. Then Joseph blessed them before he returned in the night to his quarters with the Hunter family.